Welcome on that back and welcome back to the return the return of the sparkling tuning cup number 41 our once bi-weekly now weekly open tournament here on the cranky ducklings i'm of course your host live vip and with me i am joined by the lovely people in the chat by my lovely plushies and these amazing players as well welcome everyone to the return of our tournaments Bienvenidos, bienvenidos. We have been on a bit of a hiatus when it comes to our events. Events like Sparkling Tuning Cup, Grand Platypus Open, the Tenacious Turtle Tussle, and many others have been on hiatus. As we took a bit of a break um, in the new year, basically leading into 2024, we took a bit of a break. We focused on IEM Canavita, we focused on other events, and now we have returned with some weekly duckling action. So weekly tuna action, I should say. Quack, puppy, quack. And here we go. We have... A returning player that we're going to be introducing but first in the top right hand corner we have our red protoss representing Psy Storm gaming it is Mindel VK and spawning in the bottom left hand corner we have his opponents we have the American Zerg player the blue Zerg representing Machuino Esports it is Star Killer Oh my, and if you are in the know, then you know Starkiller. He used to be the most active player in all of StarCraft. He would play... Oh my god, as we're going for a bit of a, bit of a cheese. <laughs> as we are sending our drone across the map for our proxy hatch here, I imagine, to block the natural base. It was a hatch first. It was a 15 hatch opener here, so very early hatchery. Going to be leading into, I imagine, the drone dipping into the natural base and throwing down the hatchery to block and deny the expansion to disrupt the opener of Mindle VK. Drone comes in, hatchery gets thrown down, and the Nexus is going to be quite heavily delayed. Here we go again. This is not a cheese. This is a way to, again, disrupt the opener. We are responding with a forge on the low ground. Very big reaction here at a star killer. As we could even try and go for a counter cannon rush. Remember, this was a hatch first. No spawning pool. We're going hatch, hatch into gas into a delayed spawning pool, which means, yeah, the cannon rush would be a really good response. Very smart play here out of Mindle VK. The spawning pool is heavily delayed it is so late for star killer by the time he gets links by the time he gets queens this base may be denied forge is about to finish star killer he comes in he does get eyes on the forge and that should be a bit of a tell as to what's going on but the hatchery finishes up the pylon is done gateways cannon sorry are on the way boys are being pulled but it may just be too little too late we have three cannons in production we do have some good service area here from behind we go straight for the pylon Oh, sorry, we go straight for the probe. Yeah, we go for the cannons instead. Again, three cannons in production. Uh, two of them are taking some damage here. Looks like we can deny one of those cannons. Uh, but the others are going to finish. Oh, do we do cancel in time? Just in time, we get the cancel off. But the other cannons, they finish up. Drones are going down. And we have controlled the natural base. Two cannons are done. And middle VK. Oh, the hatchery finishes. Ooh, that feels like a bit of a misstep there by Starkiller, but yeah, the hatchery is going to be killed. That's going to be 300 middles down the drain. Starkiller expanding elsewhere, but this is not the best start from our Zerg. Hatchery goes down. We do have six links. We have six links on the way across the map, and these things, they could deal some counter damage. Or they could end up killing a couple of workers. They need to. They do need to here as the natural base is going to be getting killed. Star Killer, he cannot keep it up and running. The cannons, they go to town, they bring it down. Adept Shades into the main. We get a couple of worker kills. Lings, they do slip into the main base of Mindle VK at the same time. Boys are being pulled. A lot of lost mining time. Bit of miscontrol there by Mindle VK. Ah, but the Zelt's going ham, and we're cleaning up these Lings, and we don't really kill any probes whatsoever. Oh, we get one. We get one probe. Sorry, two probes in the main. Two workers go down, but that is not enough damage. And middle can expand from here. Star Killer is in a really rough position. As he is still on a one base economy, just now finishing up his natural at the almost four minute mark. Oh boy. And uh, the game has been quite chaotic here. Again, I think it was very smart for Middle VK to recognize that there was no spawning pool, that it was delayed to go for the cannon rush the way that he did. And what is the plan for Star Killer? How do we bounce back from here? As Link Speed does kick in, we do catch one of those Adepts. Not bad. Oh, did I say one? That was a third Adept going down. Oh my god. 
more damage than I would have assumed. But again, good damage, good damage nonetheless. Oracle pops out for middle VK. Zooming across the map. Behind this, we're getting into Void Ray production. The Oracle can harass, can more importantly, scout. Ah, uh, the tuna. Beautiful. <laughs> more importantly, it can scout our opponent here. We dip into the main. We have a queen in position. We have a spore on the way, but it's not ready yet, which means we can get some drone kills. We get one, we get two. Not quite a third. We do get two drones. Not bad here by Mindle. And again, Starkill, he's just stuck droning, stuck resaturating his bases. Not like this. Void Ray coming back around. Oracle gets another two drones at the third base. Oh, no, no! But does overextend. Big pig off as Middle VK bleeds out an Oracle. Pretty expensive loss there by Mindle. He does get four drones in total with that Oracle, which is okay, but still less than ideal. A Star Killer is going to be supply blocked. And again, in this position, I'm feeling like we have to go for an all in. It is going to be a lair first from Star Killer. Uh, from here, we can maybe go for a Nida Space all in. Uh, but. Again, aggression needs to be on the table here. A longer macro game is not going to be possible. It's going to be so difficult to really, uh, to really develop here for Star Killer. Meanwhile, Mindel he's freely expanding, taking his third. I mean, I say freely. This the probe is going to be going down just barely. Up, oh, up. Oh. Does fall. Behind this, we're just building ourselves up. Twilight counts as only. We're going for Glaive Adepts. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. We started Glaives. We cancel it. So we're going for Charge instead. I was going to say that I was not really expecting Glaives with plus one. This makes more sense. It's going to be Charge Lots here from Mindel. That is going to be his take of choice. I mean, honestly, from his position, he could have done anything. Could have gone into Double Stargate, Void Ray, Charge Lots, Sky Toss. Rush into Carriers. A lot was on the table. Star Killer with the lair is going for some Hydras. And he gets scouted. Big catch there by Middle VK as he does confirm the Hydra Den. I'm sure he's happy that he's going into Zealots. Into a Temple Archives, into a Robotics facility. From here, we can work towards Colossus production or even Storm. Or both. Pick your poison. Both are gonna be available here for Mindel. Cannons are still up and running in between the bases as well. Ah. <laughs> they're still there. They're still operational. Oracle going to be catching us. Going to be delaying some mining. Catching a drone. And this Hydra production has commenced. And there it is. I was curious if we were going to go for the bay first into Colossus, but no, we're rushing into Storm, and with that, Storm works well against all things Zerg that we currently are working with. Ling Hydra. That's all we have. No Roach Warren, no Baneliness, no Infestation Vid for Hive Tech. It's just straight up Ling Hydra from Starkiller, and that just melts against Splash Damage. It melts against Storm. So I worry. I worry for Starkiller. Um, he may try to catch Mindle a little bit off guard. It's possible that he could try to hit a timing off of a lower drone count. Cannons are finally depowered. We can go for our fourth base. That fourth is now on the way. But again, this is going to be a rough road to recover here for Star Killer. It is going to be a rough road. That's Mindo, he's going for a gateway explosion. So he's from the side of the Protoss. We have a choice here to make. We could take a fourth base and just turtle up and head towards Colossus and just max out and work on a death ball of an army. I'm assuming that's not going to be on the table here just because of this gateway explosion. We're investing into additional gateways. It feels like we do want to push on three bases. Otherwise, we would have started a fourth by now. The fourth would be on the way instead. You can see us just fortifying ourselves. Lurker Den is on the way. Infestation. We are working towards Hive Tech, towards a higher form of tech. But ah, uh, the cells, they get in. No shot. They get across the map. They get into Mineral Line. And just like that, 14 workers go down. And we have to push in. 
Star Killer, he is committed. Is all in at this point, down to 41 workers. Here come the storms. Oh, a big storm here on the Hydra's. Another massive storm as well, and the Hydra army melts. Oh, good. Do we have one more storm available? Do we need another storm? That's the question as we are bleeding out Hydra's. We're down to five. And that is not going to be enough. Middle VK, he has held. It was a tight hold merely because the Zelta are across the map. And they killed the mineral line. They killed the base itself. And now they get into the natural. These Zelts, oh, they even pick off reinforcements. Expensive losses here. More Hydra's going down. Oh, as we pick up even two more. How many in total? That was 28 dead Hydras. More Hydras than there even were Zealots. Did fall. And that was it. That was the moment for Starkiller. Was that push? It was a weird push because we were hitting before Lurkers, right? Lurker then just finished after the push had failed. Unfortunate timing there for Starkiller. And now Mindel, he's running away with this. He has plenty of High Temple of a Storm. He's got Immortals, he's got Archons. He's working on two more Forges for 333. For triple upgrade production. Fourth base on the way. Again, one of two roads can be walked here for Middle VK. Either we just double down and push, or we chill out and extend that lead. And we are chilling. Get investing in upgrades, in tech, in bases. Mindle knows he doesn't have to rush things. They can take things slow and steady. And he can be secure. Meanwhile, as he's turtling up and teching up, we do see Starkiller getting into his Lurkers. I mean, the Hive is about to finish up. We can get into Lurker production. Is there a way to bounce back in this game? There is. If Minovik gives Starkiller too much time, then we can hit critical mass of Lurkers. That is true. That is true. But the problem is that because we're down in economy, because we're still only on three bases, it's going to take a long time to actually get to a critical mass of Lurker production. Lurkers are here. They are revealed. Oh, the storm's on the lurkers. We dive on top of them. There's no support here. And you can see lurkers on their own are quite vulnerable. Oh, the spine shots. The High Templar. No. One goes down. One High Templar. One another does fall. Big pick. Also, again, the lack of detection is really hurting. And we have to retreat, but we killed the third. Another lurker is revealed. High Templar, they pull back. GG gets called. It's just too much. And Middle VK will take game number one after a very successful cannon rush. GG. GG, well played. And I should also emphasize it wasn't just like a cannon rush opener. Remember, the forge and the cannons were a response to the build of Starkiller. And it worked beautifully for Middle VK. It was able to capitalize on Star Killer, able to smell and uh, sniff out the weakness in Star Killer's build and take advantage of him in the end. Was able to take advantage, was able to shut him down. So again, clearly Mindel, he has been in that position before and he has his response well rehearsed. And now we're getting into game number two. And what I will say is that Starkiller just had a really, really rough start. Because Starkiller did open up the way that he did, because he went for a hatchery into a proxy hatch, into a gas, into a pool, he was punished. And from the get-go, from the start of the game, he fell behind. After the cannons finished, that was kind of it. And it was Starkiller clawing his way back in, trying to recover from that moment. I'm sure this time he'll have a much cleaner start and a much more stable opener i would hope at least and here we go spawning in the bottom right hand corner of hard lead we have our red protoss player representing Psy storm gaming leading the series one to zero it is mindel vk and spawning in the top left hand corner we have his opponent we have the American Zerg player representing Macharino Esports. Ooh, going for another 15 hatch opener. It is Starkiller. Now, I was about to go into a bit of a tangent earlier, and I was rudely interrupted by the hatch block of Starkiller. But uh, I did want to briefly go over Starkiller himself, because if you are a newer viewer, a newer fan of StarCraft, maybe a newer viewer of online events, 
then Starkiller would not be familiar to you. But if you've been around for a couple of years, then you should be very familiar with Starkiller. I was saying earlier, he was the most active player in StarCraft in every single online event back in the day. He would be there and he even got a special prize. Um, he got a special notoriety and, and he got uh, credit for it back in the day because he had competed in so many OSC events. And if you remember, OSC Esports, they are partnered with basically every online event out there organized and hosted by many different organizations but OSC they are they tied all together and Starkiller was the most active player I think this was back in 2019 this was 2019 maybe 2020 era of Starcraft basically 2018 19 and 20 that was when Starkiller was really at his peak was playing in everything I'm talking about like the pizza pie by weeklies OSC melees uh the OSC community opens like events like that just non-stop play every single day at all times of the day that's what starkiller was known for and then he retired essentially then he essentially retired back in the day you know he stepped away i say back in the day this was maybe back in 2021 ish uh that was around the time when starkiller he he stepped away from competing focused more for uh, focus more on his studies on his career on his irl commitments and recently has come back after a long break just you know indulging in starcraft when he can and i do love to see him return i i appreciate that he is here he notoriously was a very aggressive player very aggressive very in your face as we saw in game number one we'll see how he adapts in this series though in modern day in modern starcraft 15 15 opener from star killer into a third base we do see middle vk opening up aggressively himself twilight council twilight council opener with this, we can go into a Glaive Adept build. We could even go into Dark Templar. Gases for the time being. We have not pulled out. Keep an eye on the gases. Again, both are viable. Overlord Scout comes in. Starkiller does confront the Twilight Council. He sees. He knows. Coming in with two Overlords. Catching Middle VK off guard. One Overlord is going to be going down. Oof. Big supply block there for Starkiller. And we can see we have not pulled out a gas, so it is not a Glaive Adepts. It is going to be a Dark Shrine instead. DT opener here out of Middle VK. And this should be in the mind of Starkiller. Okay, oh, as he will get a kill on the Stalker. Nicely done. Stalker goes down. But again, we do have eyes on the tech, so we should be getting ready. We should be throwing down an earlier Roach Warren. We should be throwing down Spore Crawlers. There it is. Roach Warren on the way. The lair is an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this lair is usually avoided. We avoid the lair so we can have the gas we need to actually produce roaches to defend, to get to drone up to get into a longer game. The fact that we are going into a lair tells me that our plan here is to go roaches into fast roach speed into a counter attack after we defend. At least that's my interpretation of it. We'll see if that's the plan here for Starkill, but a very aggressive follow up. Uh, very risky move. We'll see if it pays off. As the Roach Warren is now done. We have six Roaches on the way already. This also does mean that we don't have to make Spore Crawlers because we gain access to an Overseer. Overseers are going to be on the way. There it is, Roach Speed being researched. Giga fast Roach Speed here from Starkiller. We joined up to 41. Two base saturation. Archon's on the way. Interesting. Okay, so because Minovik got scouted, he isn't even trying with DTs. He's going straight into the Archon drop. I mean, which is unfortunate because DTs could have dealt damage. They get no Spore Crawlers. Archon does come in. We do scout the lair. We confirm it's already done. And the roaches are amassing. We focus on the first queen. Oh, very low queen count here from Starkiller. Only three queens. Oh, we are getting damage done. Three drones go down. And more importantly, we get eyes on the tech. We get eyes on the researching roach ward. Minivik fully aware of what's going on. 
And behind this, on two bases, what do we do? We start up in border production, we go for a, bat a massive gateway explosion, we go up to six gateways. Where's the throw? There is no throw. This is a two base all in from Middle VK. And I think he wants to absorb the attack of Star Killer. Things are about to get wild because Star Killer is also going for a two base all in. Again, because of the early lair, that was the tell that it was going to be hyper aggressive. And we haven't drawn the third base whatsoever. Star Killer, he's going for his own two base all in. So is Middle BK. Whose two base all in is stronger? That is the question. I think whoever attacks is at a deficit. But we'll see. We shall see as Star Killer is the first to move out. He's checking for a third base. It does confirm there is none. Does head into the natural. Stalker goes out. We're going for the pylon as well. Force feels not looking too bad, but we're going for the Cybercore. Cybercore barely does survive. DTs get warped in. No detection. We could have chased this down. But Middle VK does survive, and Starkiller, he's droning. Oh boy, this is dangerous. So Star Killer now he realizes that his two base all in isn't going to work. It's not going to work, not against Middle VK. So now he's droning. He's deviating away from the all in. As he's droning, now Middle, now he can embrace his own all in, his own push. Charge is about to finish. Gateways are done. Looks like Middle is expanding. He's taking a third base, but I believe he should be pushing with this army. We're just waiting for charge to finish up. Waiting for reinforcements, and we should be moving out. There we go again. This push is quite committed. Spotted by the Overlord. A Star Killer preparing back at home. Can we hold? Can we survive? Cloud's going to be thrown down. Not quite connecting. Not yet. It's Mindel again. He just shuffles his army around. Pushing on four Biles. They do graze those Immortals, but good force fields. Yeah, we catch a couple of Ravages, we catch the Queens. Zelda and Kalashi on the Roaches. Force Fields once again just slicing up the army of Starkiller. Boys are being pulled, they have to be on the beam. They're being pulled into Archons, not like this. The drones, they get annihilated. The Immortals, they're breaking through. And the Roach Ravager army, it's melting here before Mindle VK. GG gets called, it's just too much. And Mindle VK snowballs out of control, taking the series 2 to 0. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations to Mindle VK for taking the series in the end. Again, game one had a really good response, really good reaction to the proxy hatch of Starkiller. Here in game number two, his DT Archon opener didn't do too much, but that two base all in follow up worked wonders. And again, it was important that he scattered his opponent. He saw what Starkiller was doing, he saw the fast lair, he saw the fast roach speed, he knew that Starkiller was planning on being aggressive with roaches. So he didn't expand and embrace the two base play himself, a stronger two base play, immortal based. An immortal based two base all in against Roach Ravager made. I mean, <laughs> that was ideal for middle VK. Beautifully done. GG, well played. Congratulations. With that, middle VK does advance on. My condolences to Star Killer as he has uh, been eliminated from the tournament. And it is a. I mean, the event is a. Uh, is a single elimination bracket, so one life is all you do have. All you do have available here, and he will be eliminated here, will be knocked out. But we have plenty of other matches that are ongoing, and let's figure out what the hell is going on. Exclamation mark B. Exclamation mark B in the chat if you guys want to have a look at the back of yourselves. As we are going to be catching up. Here we go from the top here. Let's quickly just... There. Ah, oh, wait, we're good. Bam. Okay. What updates do we have? We do have Roselia versus Yu. That is currently still ongoing in the first round. We have Howard taking down Hatzel 2-0, advancing on against Nice uh, in another matchup. I'm unfamiliar with Howard. I'm unfamiliar. I'm not really too sure what their main race is or where they're from. So I am excited. I'm excited to find that out as they are facing off in the round of 16. Likewise, a couple of round of 16 matches have concluded. Nick Rack T2O's Cot. 
Cot is a Zerg player from Hong Kong. So a very big win there for Nick Rack does comfortably make his way into the quarterfinals. We have Mino VK taking down Starkiller 2-0 as we just casted, also making it to the quarterfinals. We have Art 2 owing Medic Jr. Unfamiliar with Medic Jr., but a big win there for Art as he does advance on into the next round where he's facing off against Azura in a PvP. Unfortunately, Mio Micah didn't show up. I was very tempted. I saw the bracket. I was like, yo, Mio Micah versus Azura. That looks spicy. That looks really juicy. I want that series. Unfortunately, as we see there, he didn't show up. So I avoided that series in the end. We saw that Mio Micah was still MIA, and unfortunately, he didn't show up. So Azura does get the walkover, and now his mid series against Art in that PvP. And yeah, we still have plenty of other matches still underway. We have Nikic versus Control, which honestly looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> I would love to cast Nikic versus Control. I don't know where they are though. Um, I think they're still mid series, uh, uh, but I believe they're not on the America server. Will they play on EU? No shot. Control playing from Korea wouldn't, but maybe Nikic has. Good ping to Asia. I'm checking. I'm hopping regions. And I'm going to be checking what control is up to. Uh, no, they're not. Not on Asia. Are they on Europe? No shot. Potentially. But Nikic versus Control. Control the Korean Terran. Nikic, the Zerg player from Belarus. They are currently mid series. We have Rostock versus Demi. A ZVP currently ongoing as well. And again, Geralt is still waiting for the winner uh, of Roselia and Yu. He's waiting for his next opponent in the upper portion of the bracket. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to switch servers and I'm being denied. Uh... There we go. Uh, but yeah, I'm not too sure where control is. Uh, so I guess they might still be mid series. Not too sure. Uh, regardless, they're currently mid series, and I guess we're going to be going on a short break. We still have to wait for a series to open up for us. I would love to cast Mindle VK versus either Nice or Howard in the next round. I'd love to find out what happened with Nikic and Control and follow that to its conclusion as well. That would be amazing. That would be beautiful. Uh, but I guess we're going to be going on a short break here. Looks like we're going to be going on a short break. Um, and when we return, we'll have our next series. We'll have our next series. Another big thing about this event, as we have returned, I should go over quickly, is that there are some Cranky Duckling events that will not be returning. Unfortunately, uh, there are some events that will not quite be taking place. Uh, specifically, specifically, those events are Grand Platypus Open and the Tenacious Turtle Tussle. Um, Sign-ups and participation for those events was quite low. It was quite low on those events, unfortunately, and because of that, uh, oh, I don't know. We, there isn't. It doesn't seem like there's quite the interest from the player base to compete in GPO and, T and Tenacious Turtle Tussle too much. So we are going to be avoiding it. We are going to be or putting it on hiatus for now and investing in some of our more successful events. Uh, successful events such as the Sparkling Tuna Cup, and we can see a pretty good turnout already in our first rendition of this event of the year. So, because of that Grand Platypus Open and the Tenacious Turtle Tussle, they're on hiatus. Sparkling Tuna Cup is coming back as a weekly, not a bi weekly. You know, we do have some excess funds uh, that we otherwise would have spent elsewhere um, on those other tournaments. So, we are going to be going. We 
they are going to be uh, going for weeklies here instead. It's going to be great. It's going to be beautiful. It's great to see uh, STC coming back as a weekly. On top of that, we also have raffles. We also have a random raffle that we're going to be hosting later on tonight uh, that we are going to be featuring here before the finals before the grand finals bam you can see it here the five dollar random participation raffle we will be having this uh for this event we're going to be having this for the sparkling tunic cup so we do have that here uh whenever you do oh uh, whenever we get to those finals so that's going to be basically five usd to any player any player that participated that competed today Mia Micah is not eligible he is not eligible because he checked in but he didn't compete he uh, was walkover so you have to compete in your matches to be eligible for the 5 USD and we'll be hosting that random raffle later on in the tournament so look forward to that as well just another way to kind of uh, incentivize participation and give some love and give us give some support to the players out there until then though we're going to be going on that short break when we return we'll be back with some more StarCraft action. See you soon.
welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that lovely brutal OST. I apologize for the downtime, but we have returned with our next series with a fresh best of three. We are still in the round of 16, but the winner of this series will advance on to face off against an opponent that is already lying in wait, Demi. The Indian Zerg player, he did take down Rostock, the Ukrainian Protoss, 2-1. to one, And he's waiting in the round of 8. But who will he face? We're here to find out. A spawning in the top left-hand corner of Psy Delta. We have the blue Protoss player representing Psy Storm Gaming. It is Geralt. From the land of Bologna. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, we have the Australian Protoss player. The yellow Protoss representing Team Hyper 1. It is you. Of course, Geralt, he's on that grind set. We were casting Geralt last night, uh, what, 10 hours ago? 11 hours ago, we were live. We were casting Geralt earlier uh, in the finals versus Cristiano. In the grand, it was 10 hours ago, in the grand finals of the Logic Games, a best of five against Cristiano. It went all the way to the ace match, and in the end, Cristiano barely came out on top, three to two. I recommend checking out the VODs, I recommend watching the events because the Logic Games was an amazing tournament, especially if you're a fan of PvPs. <laughs> but uh, outside of that, uh, Geralt, you know, it's a brand new day, you know, he's, west he's rested, he's recuperated, and can he make another finals run? Can he redeem himself and not just take the finals, make the finals, but also take the entire tournament? As Christiana is not here for this week's Sparkling Tuna Cup, Geralt has a good opportunity here to make a deeper and even deeper run. For now, it's going to be a two-gate opener out of Geralt. We do see you going for a gate expand. Very bold move. So this was a single gas opener. So it was a gate cyber expand here instead of the safer max packs opener of a Stargate before Nexus. So very greedy from you. Very greedy stuff. And it's going to be on Geralt to punish this. It's going to be on Geralt to try to punish you here for the greed. I mean, I say that going for a gate expand is not unheard of. It's quite common on site Delta. But this variation specifically is a little bit greedier than we're pretty used to. That we are used to. So we'll see how Geralt responds. For now, double stalker. Going to be two stalkers on the way. It looks like Geralt is just going to be expanding. It looks like he will just expand from here, take his natural base. We just see you going straight for that Stargate as a follow-up. With the Stargate, you gain access to Oracles and Void Rays. You can harass with your Oracles. You can defend with your Void Rays. You can mix and match. And make this work. As Geralt will be going for his Nexus on location. We can see you. he's scouting. He's checking for proxies. The chances of a proxy is quite high, so you he's confirming. Meanwhile, Geralt takes his expansion on the low ground. Will be taking his natural base. As we did mention, he's just going to be playing behind economically. Look at catch up. Stalkers have arrived. They go straight for the they go straight for the shield battery. Oh, shield battery under fire. Boys are being pulled. You trying to hold on to it? Do you have another shield battery on the way? And with that second shield battery, you is going to be able to hold on. Does ever extend a little bit, though. As you's attention is elsewhere, it's across the map. Two more adepts have arrived. And we will actually sit by the army here. The wall off was not possible at the natural base. Geralt, he gets into the main, and he's going for some probe damage. Workers are going down. Probes are being pulled, and Geralt, he's having his way with you. Four workers fall. At the same time, Stalker is still laying a siege upon that shield battery. And we're not done. The adepts have only just started getting six probes. Going on to seven. Oh, can we get it though? Oh, ooh, barely not. Seven workers go down. We do we got a pilot into the main. I didn't even notice. A pilot into the main base. Adepts they get walked in, but they do get found out. Phew. You, he does shut this down. Oh, shut it down, but Stalkers, they break into the natural. Geralt just with hyper-aggression pulling you apart. Takes down the shield battery. And will take down those probes as well. Recalls, but doesn't get away with that Stalker. Geralt having a little bit too much fun there. <laughs> but again, even though Geralt, he opened up with a later expansion. Looking at the damage dealt, he has killed 11 probes. And he has more than made up for his deficit. More than made up for, those, for that late expansion. And now you has to play catch up. 
Yu has to play a catch up here. He's going for Blink as a follow up. He's taking his natural base. He has his Void Rage to help defend. That is true, but we are stuck at home. And Geralt is even faster on the draw with his own Blink. Now, Geralt, he's working with three gateways for the time being. From here, we can expand and take a third. Or we can double down and throw down a fourth gateway in a robo. Speaking of, there's that robo on the way. Do we delay the third even further? Do we avoid the third base? As Yu is going up to four gateways. So a very safe follow-up here out of Yu. Goes up to four gateways. We'll be slowly expanding and taking another expansion, another nexus. But I don't see a third from Geralt, and we should be seeing a third from Geralt. Oh boy. The longer this goes on, the more I'm feeling that Geralt may just commit. Whose nation is moving out. And here comes that probe. Okay, he's expanding. Thankfully, we are expanding. We do take the third base. Let's go. Faster than that of use. I'm a little bit surprised. There we go. It has been thrown down. So both players working on their third bases. Ooh, a depth state gets shut down here towards the left-hand side on top of the tuna. No. They get shut down on the tuna. Ooh, as Geralt is going to be spicing it up, and this is not a bad move here. We have a Dark Shrine on the way from our blue Protoss player. I'm concerned because we have no form of detection from you. It's going to be a kill on the shield battery. You trying to push on four, trying to punch this army. He does get a couple of stalkers. Again, you he has the greater the greater production. He's on for the, he is on those four gateways. And does punish Gerald quite a bit, but what do we see here? We see no forge, no robo. There is a stargate, which means there is an opportunity here to actually make an oracle and get a revelation. We can get detection up and running soon TM. But uh, we're going to have to be real quick to react there. Really quick to respond. Damage is going to be done. Stalker is moving out towards the left-hand side. Here comes that hallucination, which means we can blink into the main base. Oh, and we can get some... We can even disrupt the production. Pylon's looking exposed. And he's going for it. You, out of position. He's at the third base. Geralt are blinking into the main does dive on that pylon. We depower some of the gateways. We threaten the main. And from here we will retreat. It's only a light amount of pressure. We have a robo in production. At the natural, sorry, in the main base. Is on the way. Dark Shrine, I believe, was not scouted. But DTs are waddling in again. That Robo, it may just be too little too late. The DTs, they go ham! And probes are going down. Oh, one after the other. Again, no mining whatsoever here at the third base. And we have another DT waddling into the natural. Good wall off here by you, but this is, this is becoming a bit much already. We shouldn't get a kill on the Nexus. There we go. We have an Oracle and an Observer on the way. Yeah, Stalkers, they come in. They shut down the shield battery. They're going for the Nexus. And can they get a kill? It's going to be close. It's going to be very close here as the Nexus. A couple more swipes and it will go down. We do get the Revelation. And it barely survives. Whew. That was like two more swipes. And it would have died. You barely does hold on to it. And he still has an overwhelming army, by the way. That's a lot of Zealots. Geralt. He's missing a warp in. He's supply blocked. No shot. Big supply block here for Geralt. I was wondering. He has 700 minerals. Where is that money being spent? In On pylons. Now is not the time for supply block. And you, he does push in. Good force fields here from Geralt. Buying time. There's our wave of reinforcements on the way. Overcharge is popped. But the Archon is out of range. The Archon goes down. Big pick off. Cannons are finishing up. Zealots are trickling in. Gerald, can we survive? It looks like with the help of the overcharge, we will be able to hold on. Yeah, we blink on top of the army. Yuhi gets punished in the retreat. 
again, like the stars align there for you to deal damage, but you can see how hard he gets shut down. Once the supply block was broken, Geralt, he can warp in reinforcements. Moves out. Charge now on the way for Geralt. And this base is still very vulnerable, very low. Oh, he wants it. <laughs> he wants it, man. He wants it. Once the Nexus, once that base, Immortal does come in. Well, at the same time, though, we do have a big Zealot counter attack. Bold move here by you. Going for a massive Zealot run by. Revelation is thrown down. DT is still going ham, though, on those Zealots. GG gets called as we have broken the third base, and Geralt will take game number one. GG. GG, well played. Again, a bold move um, for Geralt to go for the Dark Templar, and they almost ended the game. They almost did straight up end the game there. Thankfully, Yu was able to minimize his losses, minimize his damage. Despite that, it was still a big win and a big kind of point in the, uh, or something, a big advantage for Geralt that he did have. The supply block almost killed him though. <laughs> Let's be real. The supply block was brutal for Geralt and you had a good chance for a counter attack, but that was his one and only chance to break Geralt then and there. Barely wasn't able to, and Geralt was able to snowball out of control from that moment. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here as Geralt does take the first game. But can we make a series out of this? Can we go the distance? I do want to believe. I want to believe as we're getting ready for game two, it's going to be on Oceanborn. It's going to be on Oceanborn here as we dive into that second game. And we'll see if we can force the ace match or if we start advancing on to the quarterfinals. Ready to find out. Let's go. As spawning in the bottom right hand corner of Oceanborn, we have our Blue Protoss player from the land of Poland representing Psy Storm Gaming leading the series 1 to 0. It is Geralt. And spawning in the top left hand corner we have his opponent. We have the yellow Protoss player representing Team Hyper 1. Looking to fight back, looking to make a series out of this. It is you. Focusing quite a bit of a different variation of StarCraft, who's been playing a lot of the Scion mod. Uh, there is a there is a mod that does introduce three new races, three new races to the game. So six races in total. And I know you has been competing and practicing a lot in that. Likewise, so has Geralt. Geralt has also been competing uh, in the specific Scion mod tournaments. And they are much more competitive with each other in that, again, version of StarCraft. Uh, but here in the Legacy game, here we do see Geralt still uh, with a more dominant record and... Yu is still trying to build himself up. But um, that last game wasn't a bad one. Again, things were still pretty back and forth between the players. So I want to believe that we can make a series out of this as we do go for a... <laughs> as we do go for a pylon here in the mineral line. That is brutal. Basically, Geralt, he locks into all those probes. They're locked in and they need to break free. The pylon does finish and that is quite a lot of lost mining here for you. A very annoying thing that happens from time to time. We just lock them in. We arrest the, we arrest the probes. And it's going to take quite some time to break them free. From here, Geralt, he can chill. Getting into his two-gate opener. Second pylon has been thrown down. No proxy, no cheese. We should be expanding. We should be looking to expand. You going for a Stargate opener once again. Two games in a row here. Stargate openers from you. 
Ooh, meanwhile, that is a Rogo from Geralt. Uh-oh. Uh, Geralt, he did see the Stargate. This feels like a one-way soul in. We have to keep our eyes out for a third gateway. If we see a third gateway or a proxied gateway on the map, then Geralt is going to be committing, and we will not be expanding. But there it is. Oh, we do go for the expansion. This Robo is very interesting to me because Geralt saw the Stargate. Maybe he didn't click on it, but... A Stargate should tell you that we're expanding. It should tell you that you isn't going for an all-in. If this is a misread, then it's very possible that Geralt, he may be playing a little bit too defensively. Thinking that he's being all-in. Good trades from Geralt. Oh, he does end up taking down... Uh, trading, I should say, 2-2. Two to two. Does kill two stalkers, loses two of his own. Oracle gets across the map. Immortal production has commenced. Again, Geralt, he is taking that natural. Oracle going into the main. And we're not ready for it. Oh, we are not ready whatsoever again. Geralt, I don't think he clicked on the building. I don't think he was able to click and confirm the Stargates. Aye, aye, aye. Three probes go down. But that is a kill on the Oracle. Oh, my God. That I was not expecting. The Oracle got in, killed, killed uh, three workers, but... Despite the recall, Geralt, he still shut it down. So, big misstep there by you. Bit inattentive there with that Oracle. Does throw it away, and that was not worth it for you. Things were looking good. Things were looking up when it came to getting value with that Oracle, but suddenly not so much. Suddenly not so much as Geralt is going to be pushing on the left-hand side. Is going to be moving out. Likewise, yeah, we do see him threatening a shade in towards the main. Shield batteries are ready. We have two shield batteries here for you. We have a void ray. We can defend. We should be able to hold on two bases, and this can be a sign for Geralt to just expand and take a third. You know, we can see how heavily we're turtling up. Uh, as it ups a shade into the main. Ooh, and uh, this is brutal. This is so punishing here. Two adepts, they can wreak havoc, and they get seven probe kills in the main base. We got an eighth probe as well. Not like this. So we're going to be shading back in. Oh, we got a ninth probe. Can we get a tenth? No shot. Ooh, thankfully we don't. Nine workers go down. As behind this, we have Geralt doubling down here with additional gateways. So again, Geralt had an option. He could expand and take a third. Instead, he chooses to throw down two more gateways instead. Do we commit to a two-base all-in, or does Geralt eventually take that third? Geralt, he does have both options available to him. Just building up his army. Uh, with these Immortals, with these Sentries, I feel like we should be pushing on two bases. You, meanwhile, he does rock up with a counterattack. Third base is going to be delayed. We get away on that third. Force fields get thrown down. And we can see you just posturing, trying to trigger those shields. Force fields are uh, not ideal here for Geralt. As we catch a couple of those, those units, we catch the sentry, we catch a stalker. And Void Ray is focused down. We have the better concave and Geralt. He will shut down this army. Chases down the immortal as well. Where's the prism? No, the prism does escape and does leave the immortal behind. It will go down. As you is going, sorry, Geralt's going for a big counter attack. Does have those two immortals. The problem here is that Geralt doesn't have a way to reinforce. No prism. So we expand. We take a third base. Like, there's no way to just warp in across the map. So Geralt, I don't think he's going to be committing too hard. Does bring it to the main. Does catch another immortal. Almost. Almost does get that immortal. Does get a lot of damage done there on that robot. And he can bring it down. No shot. The robo it falls. No more mortal production. 
no more prism either as it does get focused. Not like this. As we're blinking back into the main base as well, we have vision with that observer. The MVP observer GG gets called as Yu is getting pulled apart and Geralt, he takes the series 2-0. to Advancing on to the next round. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Geralt again, having a strong showing. He was coming in as a favorite player, and honestly, again, Geralt, he is a player to keep an eye on to make a deep run in this tournament. He has the potential for a very deep run, and congratulations for that win. Meanwhile, a big shout out to, of course, you. A big shout out to you for competing here, for making a series out of this. Again, he had his own moments in this game, wasn't able to. Take a game off of Geralt, but a good series nonetheless. GG. Well played. Well played. And with that, Geralt, he does advance on. And we already have another opponent lying in wait. We have another opponent ready and waiting here. We're going to be getting into Geralt versus Demi in a PvZ. Let's go. And I need to message some players. I need to message some of our lovely players here and get ready. Get ready for our next series. There we go. Okay, so Girl vs. Demi is going to be up next. Meanwhile, we have some more updates. We have quite a lot of updates, actually. Oh, my God. Exclamation mark B in the chat. If you guys want to have a look at the back of yourselves, we have Geralt versus Demi in the upper quarterfinals. We have Nick Rack versus Nick Itch. As Nick Itch did take down control 2 to 0, there's a spicy TBZ ongoing. I would have loved to have casted that series, but I did miss them earlier. Um, but best of luck to both Nick Rack and Nick Itch in that Terran versus Zerg matchup. Scrolling down a little bit further in the lower half of the bracket, we have a wave. Of PVPs. We have Nice versus Middle VK in a Taiwanese versus or well, a Taiwan versus Russia matchup in a PvP. Meanwhile, we have Art waiting for the winner of that series in the semifinals. As a reminder, both semifinals will be casted. Both semifinals will be covered, and we'll most likely be covering the lower semis first, just because Art is waiting and we don't want him to wait too long. So gonna be covering the lower semifinals first. Followed by the upper semifinals thereafter. Just as a reminder to what is going on. There we go. As we are advancing the brackets. Bam. So yeah, Geralt versus Demi is going to be coming up next. To determine who makes it onto the semifinals. And Demi looking pretty hot right now. I mean, taking down Rostock 2-1, to one, that is no easy feat. Rostock has been very active as of late. He has been improving a lot. So that is a big win for Demi. But Geralt, he is one of the favorites for the entire tournament. Can he be stopped? We're going to be going on a short break. When we return, we'll find out if Demi is the one to stop him. See you soon.
welcome back everyone welcome back i apologize for the delays but we have returned with the our first sorry our first quarterfinals match we have returned with Geralt versus Demi in a Zer, in a Zerg versus Protoss matchup let's go our quarterfinals are upon us win of this series of course goes into the semi-finals and the grand finals thereafter and if you want to support this tournament something that I've not mentioned if you want to support this weekly cranky docking event then you can do so via either patreon or Macherino exclamation mark Macherino in the chat you will gain access to the link to the Macherino page and you can support us you can fund this event directly if you so choose again no uh there's no obligation of you to do so but it is there if you do have some excess funds and you want to support these players then you can do so via Macherino otherwise we are diving into this very series and spawning in the top left hand corner of Golden Aura. We have our Polish Protoss player, the Red Protoss representing Cystorm Gaming. It is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the Indian Zurg player, the Blue Zurg representing Macharino Esports. It is Demi. Here we go. And we are going. For a proxy hatch. <laughs> let's go, Bobby. Let's go. Proxy hatch here from Demi. So, Demi was messaging me earlier. I was asking him, like, oh my god, really, like, really good job taking down Rostock. Like, I'm very impressed. Like, GG, well played. And he's like, Bobby, I'm, I'm an animal, but I'm filthy. I'm filthy. I'm, oh, what happened? Proxy hatch. Proxy hatch happened, and now he's doing it here against Geralt. Geralt going for a gate expand setup here. He is none the wiser. He comes in for a probe scout, does confirm the lack of natural base. He's going to be taking the third base location, does confirm that there is nothing there, and something is wrong. Something is wrong. He goes for the cyber core first, then goes for that expand. Going to be checking in. Yep, he has found what is wrong with this game. He has now confirmed the proxy hatch, but it's almost done. It is almost done. We respond with a forge. Big moment here for Geralt. Responding with a forge, chronoing out that zealot. Trying to react as hard as possible. Trying to set up here with some cannons, with some shield batteries. For those who are curious, in the defense for Protoss players, you have very limited production. Very limited production, very limited units available. So we need site defense. Cannons and shield batteries are required to defend. Otherwise, we just don't have the numbers to keep up with the Zerg. We would not have the numbers available. Zealot slicing away at that hatchery. Lings are in production as we speak. We see Demi even whipping out a drone. Link speed is on the way to Lings. They step in. They do get into the main base. They're going for some probe damage. Demi, can he pull this off? As the worker, they get pulled. They almost get a surround. They almost get surrounded, but Lings, they barely do slip away. Stalker uh, is going to be able to hunt them down. Lings, they do get cleaned up without doing much damage. The cannons, the shield batteries, they are finishing. They're finishing up. Let's go. As Demi, he is still just building up his Ling force here. So I'm a little bit concerned. Demi, he's actually going in a really weird direction. He's getting into a natural base. We're going for a lair after Ling speed. What is this going to be for? With a lair, we can maybe go for Joppelors and we can ferry Lings into the main and bypass the wall of cannons. That is true. That could be what we're thinking of. Drop a lords into the main. That could be a viable option to make use of all these lings. Behind this, we're droning on up as well. We're, we're stopping ling, ling production. So how will Demi make use of these lings as he does rotate over towards the right-hand side? Show us the drop a lord. Ha! Lair is done. Lair is done. Lings, they do end up oh, heading towards that natural member. There it is. Drop a lord is on the way. Geralt, he's aware of it though. He's not aware of the Drop Lord, but the potential of a Nidus or Drop Lords into the main base. It is something that Geralt has come across before. Spotter probes, Spotter Zelts as well. Geralt is in position. Geralt, he fakes out a drop? Oh my god. Wait, was that intentional? <laughs> Only one Ling in the drop, by the way. Yeah, he does get one Ling in. He's going for a Scout. Oh, fair enough. Goes to the scout. Overlord ooh, takes a lot of hits. We get a full scout of the main base, and we do get eyes on. Oh, actually, I, I believe we missed the tech. Wait, what? 
Yeah, we did barely miss the tag. Unaware of it, whether it's going to be a Robo follow up, a Stargate, a Twilight Council, we are going into Hydras. Interesting. This is what Demi meant. So, when Demi told me about what he had done against Rostock, he said Proxy Hatch into a Miyamika. That is Proxy Hatch into Ling Hydra. Ling Hydra from Demi. Very interesting. We'll see how this all comes together. As the hatchery is on the way. We're droning up. We're saturating our bases. Taking all four gases. Or three gases for now. I imagine four gases soon thereafter. This nation coming in. Does confirm the tech. Big scout from Geralt. He does get eyes on the Hydra deck. He's where the Hydra's spire gets... Wait. <laughs> what? Interesting. So after the scout, we're going for a spire. Crazy move here. It makes sense, kind of. Like, Demi's like, okay, maybe he overreacts to the Hydra's. He gets ready for an all-in, and I can get away with some mutas. The problem is, it's going to it's gonna be an all-in from the Protoss. Creep has been spread here, covering all both third base locations. We're going for a six gateway explosion behind this. That's going to be eight gates in total. Geralt is going to be expanding, but he should be pushing behind it. I don't even know if he will expand. Again, so many gateways on the way here. Six gates in the main. We have one gate at the natural, so it's going to be seven gates in total. Are we going for the bait? Never mind. So I assumed we were building up towards a two base all in, but the bait tells us that Geralt, he's going to be taking up even further, waiting for Colossus, which means this spire is going to pay off. It's going to finish, and Geralt is not pushing. We can see him recalling back as he got surrounded. Still trying to take a third base, and Demi is in control. He's containing Geralt. Mutas are on the way, and Geralt is not ready for this. Now, thankfully, he does have Blink. Remember, he has Blink Stalkers available. He can chase down and dive on top of those Stalkers. Sorry, on top of those Mutas. Demi comes in, kills a probe. Geralt. I mean, we have seven gates. We can push. I don't think he wants to, though. Again, he invested into this bay. He invested into Colossus production. Speaking of, we haven't made a single Hydra. No Hydras. The Colossus makes sense. I mean, uh, Geralt, I, I guess it, it all pieced, it's all pieced together. He can't push with his Stalkers because he believes that Ling Hydra will be waiting for him. And Stalkers, they trade terribly against Ling Hydra. So he's waiting for the Colossus first. Meanwhile, little does he know... The Mutas have arrived. And there it is. Mutas, they reveal themselves in the main base. We get four probe kills. We're going for the Stalkers. Good blink side of Geralt. Does keep his Stalkers alive. Oh, but he might be bleeding out too much. Yeah, the Mutas, they're just wreaking havoc here in the main. They get eight probe kills. They get three Stalkers. Mutas will back up. At the same time, Lings, they do hit the third. Yeah, they dive on top of the Nexus. They go for the shield battery. Mutas, they come back in to pick up a couple of pylons. And we might get a cancel on the Nexus. No, not quite. Demi doesn't commit. The 0 0 Lings, they, they struggle to deal damage. And Geralt is holding. But Demi, he has a massive economic lead. He's up to 67 drones. And Demi, there's one thing and one thing only that he loves. In StarCraft, more than anything else, and that is the Muta. He's up to 16 Mutas. Going for the pylon. Oh, we'll bleed out a couple of them. A couple of Mutas do go down. Not bad trades, though, as he picks up a lot of Stalkers. We got a better one. Okay. Bleeding out six Mutas, and he does get nine Stalkers in total. So far. Uh, not bad trades here by Demi, but I'm, I'm sure he's hoping for even better. He still maintains his economic lead. He's up to 80 drones. 80 workers. He has plus one air attack. Going for a ninja base. I don't think that's necessary, but okay. Ninja base is on the way. The Muse, they head into the third. They get a couple of probes. Back up. Rotate around. And Demi is still focusing on mass muta. As 
mixing them up as we speak. Working towards a fifth. I guess a sixth base, <laughs> as he's double expanding. I mean, he's just double expanding here. And Geralt is still just stuck at home. Sure, he has Mass Stalker and he's not dying, but... I mean, in a way he is, because he's being starved out. He's being denied the fourth base over and over again. He's bleeding out Stalkers, bleeding out Probes. And I mean, his goal here is, is to max out on a mass Muta army. And there's no Stargate, there's no Storm. I mean, I guess we just don't have the economy for it. No Archon production, just purely bling Stalker as our anti-air. And against Ling Hydra, this is going to be difficult to make work. If we can stabilize in the economy for Geralt, then maybe we can take up into Archons and Storm. That would be the ideal. Be the ideal as how many meters are we up to? 34. Around 34, soon to be 38 mutas. We dive into the third base. The stalkers are out of position, and just like that, we take down the mineral line. 12, 13 workers go down. And Demi, he's just been in the driver's seat this entire game. Geralt's playing from behind, playing catch up. Mutas, they dive into the main. 15, 17 probes go down. The Dark Shrine. Gets picked up as well. We do have a couple of DTs welding out across the map. They do head into the mineral lines. Uh oh. They head for the main base. They head for the natural, the third, and the fourth. We deny the hatchery. Sorry, we deny the nexus. And Demi, he just collapses on these mutas. He doesn't care. Oh god. He should, though. That was a rough trade. 19 drones go down. Oh, Demi losing a lot to these DTs. Dark Templar, they are wreaking havoc. Finally, they, clean, they get cleaned up. Now, thankfully, Muta did kill the Dark Shrine, so he doesn't have to worry about... Demi doesn't have to worry about those DTs anymore. But uh, that did deal quite a blow to his economy. He has to re-drone, throw down more spore crawlers. Jesus, the Mass Muta is still just getting out of hand. Oh, the prison falls. And Geralt, at this point, I don't think he can fight this. I don't think he can fight this head-on. Demi should be feeling confident. And he collapses on the Stalkers, and what are we working with? 43 Mutas to 17 Stalkers. That's just not going to work out here in favor of Geralt. Demi he just has too much. GG gets called, and Demi takes a lead in the series. GG. Oh my god, Demi. Fappy. <laughs> GG, well played, Demi. He does take game number one here, and yeah, he's honestly looking... Like, pretty informed. To be fair, a lot of this game came down to the build. Demi spicing it up with a proxy hatchery. Spiking, spicing it up with a proxy hatchery into, of course, from proxy hatch, into three base hydra, into a spire that was unscouted. And we've seen this time and time again. The reality is that... If a Spire goes unscouted, if the Muse, if they get across the map without the Protoss player being aware, it is very difficult to react in time and to minimize losses and to maintain yourself. It's very difficult. Even some of the best Protoss in the world can struggle if they don't scout the Mutas. It's, uh, it's a brutal dynamic, and we can see what happens. We can see what happens if they go unscouted and if they do a little bit too much damage early on. And we saw that Geralt just could not keep up with the Mutas of Demi. Demi got out of hand. He got out of control. And with that, he's leading the series 1-0. to zero. And where will this take us? Where will we go? Oh, boy. As we are getting ready here for game number two. Lobby has been made. And we are getting in. Meanwhile, it looks like we have our lower semifinals ready. 
We have our lower semifinals ready for us. Once we wrap up this series, we will be getting into Nice versus Art. Let's go. And hopefully we can find them. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry, there's gonna be a bit of a delay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> we are gonna be switching back over to the land of Europe. Um, so fun fact, because Demi's in India, he actually gets really good ping to Europe. Um, and then we're gonna play g game one on EU, game two on NA. But uh, looks like Geralt is uh, struggling a little bit on NA, so we're, we're switching back to EU. It's all good. It's all good. Switching back to Europa. We'll soon have our game. soon have our game we'll soon have our series here as game two is on oceanborn let's go okay so demi has been hyper aggressive uh today not just this series but in general demi has been hyper aggressive the question becomes do we go for a ling flood do we go for another all in do we go for another proxy hatch what will demi do to knock Geralt off balance i feel like in a normal standard game Geralt is favored 100 percent Geralt he's favored in a normal straight up standard game like standard opener versus standard opener that is what Geralt wants. That is not what Demi wants to get into. He wants a lead early on, and how will he get it? We'll find out. As spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Oceanborn, we have the Polish Protoss player, the Red Protoss, representing Psystorm Gaming. It is Geralt. And spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have, as a partner, we have the Indian Zerg player, the Blue Zerg, representing Macharino Esports. It is Demi. Leading the series 1-0. to zero. A scoreline that I was not expecting. And once again, the drone is moving out. Once again, we're going for a proxy hatch. I did see in the chat, someone was asking, um, are the Turtle Tussle and the Platypus Open not returning in 2024? That is a solid maybe. Um, right now, Grand Platypus Open and the Tenacious Turtle Tussle, they are on hiatus. They are on hiatus just because of the low participation. I will say viewership was good. Viewership was good for those events, but the player signups wasn't. And at the end of the day, like we're doing those, we're hosting those events for the players. And uh, again, if um, if the regions are struggling and if the signups are getting lower and lower, then there's only so much we can do. There's only so much we can do. So uh, they are on hiatus. Um, if there is a resurgence, then we will be bringing it back. And if we get involved in other esports like Stormgate or uh, Year Zero Space or other esports like that. We can always have iterations of GPO and Tenacious Total Tussle in those esports as well in case we do ever branch out. That's always going to be available. Meanwhile, the hatchery has been scouted and Geralt, he responds this time not with a forge, but with a second gateway. Hasn't expanded. So we delay the expansion. We go for a very much stronger reaction this time. Zealot does come out. Second Zealot on the way. And Geralt is going to try and shut this down before it can get going. Now this time Demi does go for a ha proxy hatch into gas into pool. Working towards Ling speed. Queens are on the way. Lings are being produced. Can Demi hold on to this hatchery? Can we pop off? Speaking of popping off, a big shout out to Drifting Silungar. Ah, gracias papi. Thank you so much Drifting in the chat for subscribing for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the content. Hope you enjoy your emotes and your replay packs. If you're a subscriber, join our Discord. Join our Discord server and you will gain access to replay packs from this event and many others. So you can enjoy that. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the content and the casting. As the hatchery goes down, uh, expansion is getting up and running. Now, Geralt, he did delay the expansion. Remember, 
this nexus is late because of the faster second gateway because of the proxy hatch and he also invested into these two zealots so far they've killed the base can they get more damage done behind this stargate opener from Geralt should be oracles so now it's on Demi to defend it's on Demi to survive and how heavily are we going to drone we have focused on Ling's speed. We have pulled out a gas. We are droning up past 21 in towards 26 drones. So we're getting into a longer macro game. Let's go. Let us go. Do you see Geralt's getting across the map with those zealots? He does delay the third base. Really good positioning here by Geralt as well. Reducing service area on those two zealots, wedging themselves in those middle patches. And Demi forced to expand at the forward third base location. This is a very exposed hatchery. I'm very surprised to see Demi expand here. We'll see if he can get away with it. Early Roach Warren. Early Roach Warren here by Demi. That is a little bit suspect. Okay, so this is all coming together here as we force a recall on these zealots. Both players are popping up. Oh my god. Okay, let's <laughs> say so, a couple of things. One. Demi, upon taking this hatchery, it is very exposed, but it also creates a launch pad to spread creep across the map. You can spread creep, creep quite quickly across the map thanks to this hatchery. Likewise, you do not throw down a Roach Horn this early on unless you believe it's going to be a Twilight Council opener. So this Roach Horn is early. It does nothing against the Oracles that will soon be upon us as the first Oracle is on the way. So this is either very safe play or very aggressive play from Demi as he could go into a Roach all-in. Gases are being taken as we speak. For now, we're just droning. Meanwhile, Geralt's also being hyper-aggressive. The Oracle does come in. Gets one drone. The Oracle isn't aggressive. The follow-up is. Geralt, he delays his third base in favor of a very fast Twilight Council. He's rushing into Glaive Adepts. So, both players are being a little bit aggressive here. Where Geralt, he's making it look like he's playing standard. Making it look like he's expanding. When really, he's going for Glaives first. This is not an all-in. He will still expand, but these glaives are designed to catch Demi off guard. But because Demi threw down such an early Roach Run, which is not he's not using, by the way, but he has it, it means he is safe against something like Glaive Adepts. So there's, there's a lot coming. There's, <laughs> there's a lot happening right now. There we go. Seven Roaches on the way. Demi, he's amassing Roaches again. It looks like he wants to push. Yep, Queens are spreading creep aggressively across the map towards Geralt. Roaches are amassing, and Adepts are going to be struggling in the defense. They do not do well against Roaches. Again, Roaches, they have been spotted. Big scout there by Geralt. There's no reason for Roaches to be out right now, which is why Geralt, I'm sure, is a little bit perplexed. Big scout throws down a robo and gasses. Geralt, he sees the Roaches. He recognizes that, of course, these Adepts will not end the game. He's getting ready for the next step. He's getting ready for the next stage, and Demi's going for the all-in. He's cutting drones at 45. He has not saturated his third, and the queens are walking across the map. But the Adepts, they run into the queens. Big catch. One queen goes down. Not a good start here for Demi. He is being forced back. And behind this, Geralt throwing down shield batteries. He confirms the all-in by seeing those queens. No reason for those queens to be walking across the map. The Adepts, they shave off links as well. And this is a disastrous start here for Demi. A disastrous start to the all-in. He throws down a lair. He's pivoting away. He still made 20 lings, though. Those 20 lings, they could have been drones. They should have been drones. This was a bit of a misstep here from Demi. Can he surround the Adepts? He does collapse on the army. Adepts, they will shade away. But the Oracles, they're going ham. They're focusing down at Ravagers as well. Yeah, Demi, he is going to pull back. He is going to pull back. Geralt, he has defended. He has defended beautifully. We have two shield batteries. We have overcharge available. Geralt, he takes no damage. And Geralt is ahead. Again, Demi, he delayed drone production for so long because of this all-in. And the all-in failed. The all-in failed. He bled out too many lings. Geralt, he's ready for anything. It was really important that Geralt, he saw the queens initially. And now Demi has to transition. And Geralt is already working on it. He's already there. The bay is on the way for Colossus production. We have the forge on the way for upgrades. Blink is being resourced as well. Geralt, he's already working towards the mid game. Demi isn't there yet. 
You have one army towards the left, another army towards the right. Geralt forcing Demi to split up his army. And I assumed it would be Colossus, but no. We take a chance. We take a risk. We're going for Disruptors. Disruptors are on the way. Phoenixes? <laughs> this I'm not so sure about, but okay. We get a stray Phoenix for some map control, I imagine. And Demi, he backs off. He drones up to 67. He gets a fourth. This is three base saturation. You can still go and go off of all ins on three bases. Drop a Lord is done. Demi going for a Ling drop towards that natural. And he's amassing more Ling Roach. There's no reason to make units right now for Demi unless we're going for a push. Revelations keeping an eye on the army. And again, Demi, he is not droning that fourth. No drones whatsoever. Demi, he wants to push. He wants to commit. And can Geralt survive that? Okay, what do we have to defend? We have one Disruptor. One Disruptor. One Immortal. We have a good amount of shield batteries and overcharge. But the lack of Robo units is concerning. Geralt, he knows that. Second Robo is on the way. With double Robo production, we can make up for our lack of Robo units. But we need time. We need time to get this production up and running. Yeah, more cannons. More shield batteries on the way. Geralt, he knows how vulnerable he is. And Demi is pushing. This is it. This is the moment that Demi is going, looking for. It's all or nothing for Demi. Either he breaks Geralt's third or he dies trying. The fourth is okay, but we're looking for more than just the fourth base. Lings, they collapse on the cannons. Good force fields here. They catch out the Ravagers. Never goes off. Three Ravagers go down. At the same time, Adepts, they harass across the map. They get seven drone kills. Lings, they do get dropped into the natural. Eight probes go down. We deal an even amount of damage. Ah, and Demi retreats. Oof. Losing more workers. Losing more workers here at the third. Not ideal. Yeah, Demi, he backs off. He realizes he cannot break the fourth, and he's going for a spire. And Demi's in a really rough position. You may be looking at the supplies, and you may think, but up, but we're, we're up in supply. The soup does lie. You know, numbers, uh, they don't... <laughs> I should say, the supply is inflated. The, flies, the supply is inflated because of the roaches. The roaches, they are deceiving in that way. You can very quickly max out with roaches, but the quality of the army is quite low. It's a very low-quality army here by Demi. And he's being outscaled by Geralt. Which is why Demi, his Hail Mary play is the Spire. This is the Hail Mary play here for Demi. It's all or nothing with it. He does have Roach Ravagers, sure, but these are 1 0 Roach Ravagers. Ro this is 1 0 Roach Ravagers. Only plus 1 range. Ling Roach tried to go for run by, but we're in position. Geralt, he does defend. And he's maxing out. He's maxing out with the superior army. Ah, Depths, they get across the map. More drones going down. We're going for 11 muters. Oh. Can we survive? Can we make it? Can we make it to the muter production? Ah. That's 12 muters are on the way. Demi. Down to 68 workers. He's down to the worker count, down to the economy. The longer this goes on, the better it is for Geralt as he's maxed out and he's working on charge plus two temple archives for storm and archons. Ooh, these bases are a little bit exposed. The mineral lines specifically are exposed. So the mutas have potential, but they run into phoenixes. Oh, we already had two phoenixes out. Blink Sorg is in position. The mutas, they do not touch the economy. Again, these mutas, they had to get damage done. They're still alive, thankfully, but the jig is up. Now Geralt knows to focus on stack defense. And there it is, cannons and shield batteries. Cannons on the way, shield batteries in the mineral lines. We need to get ready in these bases. And we have a fleet beacon alongside the Stargate. Sky Toss on the horizon for Geralt. It is on the horizon here. And again, yes, Demi, he is maxed, but but what can he do with this army? What can he accomplish with it? Oh, that is a kill. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was a kill on the Nexus. Okay, good start. A good start for Demi. That's 400 minerals down the drain. Dives on the Phoenixes. Gets one. Ooh, 
leads out a couple of muters. And your pulse crystals on the way. That is going to be Phoenix Range. And with Phoenix Range, it's so much more difficult to actually gain any kind of value with those muters. Retravager rotating around. Oh, we catch another muter. Oh, uh, we catch even more units. They do get picked off. We are heading into the natural base, though. Oh, but we're bleeding out a lot of muters here to the cannons, to the phoenixes. Yeah, we're being shut down. This is a big investment here from Demi, and it just doesn't pay whatsoever. Oof. That was 14 muters. For what? For three phoenixes? Oof. As we only killed a handful of probes. Muters are going to be shut down. Uh, two of them do survive. And here we go. Geralt, he's pushing on the left-hand side. Oh, the force fields are insane. Very nice force fields. Roaches, they get completely shut down. Geralt can keep on pushing. Blinks on forward. Novas, they get all massive connections on the army. The Novas, they go to town on those Roaches. Not like this. You can see Geralt's rotating around towards that, that fourth. Yeah, Demi just cannot engage. Everyone's saying connecting with those roaches. We are doubling down on mass muters. We have 22 muters on the way. Oh my god. That is so many muters. It's the only chance here for Demi. Doubling down and maxing out on almost pure muter here. He has 41 mutalisks. Soon to be 46. And this is it. We dive on the arm. We focus down Disruptor after Disruptor. Good pickoffs. Disruptors are going down. Every single Disruptor, actually. So, good start here by Demi. But as Geralt retreats, he has a wall of cannons, a wall of shield batteries. He has a, he has a carrier. Almost said Colossus. The carrier is out. The Muse, they ignore the army. They get into the main base. They catch a carrier as well. Big pickoff there by Demi. Oh, depowers everything in the main. The Stargates. The Storm. It all does get depowered. We dive onto another carrier. As Demi does retreat behind this, the Roaches, they hit that forward base. It's going to take a while to work through those cannons. Meanwhile, we fight the, the Stalkers. Oh my god. It looks like Demi, he is breaking through. Barely breaking through the line of Stalkers. Oh my god. These Mutas, they're doing it. Demi, is this enough? The Roach Ravager is being cleaned up. We are leaving the Mutas on A move a little bit there, so not the best DPS. But he does camp the production, gets a Phoenix, depowers everything once again. Storm will not complete. Not yet. As Demi he gets knocked down to 39, now 42 Mutas. As more do pop out. Then we're going to be pulling back. We react. We respond with three Stargates to make four Phoenixes at a time. And Geralt's going for a big counterattack, but he will lose his entire army. Does get a kill on the Nexus. Does get a kill, does get a kill on two hatcheries. Very nicely done here by Geralt. He does get some value. Geralt, he still has a better economy than Demi, but the Mass Muta, it's, it's getting out of hand. As we pick off shield batteries. Oh. Pick off one of those phoenixes as well. Expensive trades here by Demi as he does lose some of those some of those meters. Does lose some. Demi back off. Geralt, he has time to breathe. And I'm worried for Demi because we are massing Phoenixes right now. Making three Phoenixes at a time. Demi going to be in some trouble soon. Dives on the army. Slow zone does catch the Muse. We do barely get the Mothership. 
While the ship goes down, we're going deep into the bases here of Geralt. The Phoenixes are in position. How many meters do we have? We're down to 33. 33 meters down to 30. Ooh, bleeding out a lot. We get on top of the Phoenixes. Ooh, oh my god. But we do go down to 26 meters. Again, Demi has to be so careful here with his control. Lings, they do flood into another base. 14 probes go down. And we almost catch the pieces, but now we're back up to six. Back up to seven. And GG gets called. You can see those pieces just go to town on those meters. And Demi loses all of his momentum. The mass meter, just the hard counter to... Sorry, the mass phoenix, just the hard counter to the meters. GG, well played. We're going to the ace match. <laughs> we're going to the ace match. If Demi were to be able to keep going back into the main base and make sure that those stargates were never powered and were never able to produce, maybe Demi wins. Maybe Demi wins from there if he makes sure that Phoenix production is not able to get underway. But Demi backed off. Geralt threw down three Stargates, was able to get back into Phoenix production, and we saw how well that did perform against those Mutalisks. GG. GG well played again, as we saw. They are the hard counter. As long as you're paying attention, as long as you're microing your Phoenixes, with Phoenix range, you can always outrange and kite those Mutas to death. Oh boy. Breathe. Oh, I'm just <laughs> catching up. Catching up. Catching up. Thank you for the great thank you for the great content. Oh, oh you're welcome, Bappy. You're welcome. One day there'll be exclamation mark merch. Ah. Oh, that's a goal, Bappy. That's a goal. One day, one day. And it looks like we have our ace match. We have our next game. We have our next match being set up. Here we go. We're going all the way to game three. And it's going to be on Hecate. Let's go. Let us go. Let's go. As uh, it looks like our players, they need a moment here to just take, gather their uh, gather their breath, gather their energy. I don't blame them. Don't blame them whatsoever. We need to calm things down, Papi. Uh, taking a breath before we jump back into this. Meanwhile, does look like the lower semifinals. We I was gonna say earlier that um, typically we cast both semifinals. Unfortunately, our players did. Uh, Actually, uh, they were a little bit too eager, too excited, and they did play out their series ahead of time. That is a bit of a shame here. We'll try to make sure we're on top of that next time. We'll try to make sure that um, the players are aware to hold their matches for us so we, so that we uh, they can be casted. Um, fingers crossed that we're able to pull that off next time. Um, but we do have an update. We have our first finalist. Art did take down Nice 2-0, to zero, and Art, he is now waiting in the grand finals. What I will say is that thankfully we can, you know, indulge and follow our players and get into this and uh follow you know this series into the semis and into the finals thereafter so we have everything lined up for us um but again uh our, my apologies and we will try to rectify that in future sparkling tuna cups just so we can make sure that again we can showcase and feature all these lovely players as best we can we will do our best back we'll do our best as our players have returned, and we're diving into game number three. It all ends here on Hecate. Here. 
we go. Getting into the ace match and spawning in the top right hand corner of Hecate, we have our Polish Protoss player, the red Protoss representing Sci Storm Gaming, tying up the series one to one, forcing the ace match. It is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom left hand corner, we have his opponent, we have the Indian Zerg player, the blue Zerg representing Match Arena Esports, being forced into game three. Do we go for another proxy hatch three games in a row? I'm ready for it. It is Demi. And there it is. The drone is moving out. We are indeed going for another proxy hatch. We've been doing it every game so far in this series. And without fail, it's going to be the case again in game number three as well. The drone has arrived. Drone has arrived. The hatchery has been thrown down. Geralt, he comes in with a probe scout. Does confirm. Hold up. What's going on? No gases. No spawning pool. No expansion. And I imagine he might be checking the third base location first. Or does he send out a second probe to check outside the natural? Again, it's happened so often this series that I'm sure it is in the back or in the front of Geralt's mind. And he does check. He checks. He confirms. Does get eyes on the hatchery. It's going to be a two-gate opener from Geralt. This is a solid way here to punish this and to counterattack. So the way this works, it's going to be a two-gate opener into a cyber core, into a delayed expansion. With the oh, with this, we can get into double adept as a follow-up. Once the cyber core is done, we can shut down this hatchery, and with those two adepts, we can counterattack. And Demi will have a hard time defending if he's not careful. Boy, here we go. The hatchery going to be under fire already by that zealot. Second zealot on the way. Demi just transitioning back at home. Going to be droning up. It looks like Demi was hoping for an overreaction. We have reacted, yes, but a 2 gate opener is not the worst opener here for Geralt whatsoever. He's chilling. No shield battery, no forge, no cannons. He has faith. He believes that Demi won't be committing with this aggression. A couple of things do pop out. Quick moves there from Geralt. Is that is going to be a kill on the hatchery? So, with this, we're going to be getting into a more standard game. Um, obviously, Geralt, his base was delayed. Unfortunately for Geralt, he didn't open up and he didn't follow up with two adepts. He went double stalker. If he had two adepts, he could move out. He could move out with two zealots and two adepts, and he could threaten the middle lines and threaten the economy of Demi. With two stalkers instead, he's going to be stuck at home. Going to be stuck at home. It's a much more defensive follow up instead. Yeah, shield batteries on the way. Geralt is a little bit paranoid of what Demi would do next, so he stays back at home. With these Saugus, he can deny Overlord Scouts and he can hide his transition. It is going to be a Stargate follow-up from Geralt as he moves out with his two Zealots. Does move out with him. Demi going to be double expanding. He does get a surround, a, a pseudo surround on these Zealots. They will commit. He will shut them down. Nice control there from Demi. Going for a hat natural base into a third. Here, Demi is just going to be droning. He just has map control. He fans out his lings, getting eyes on any would-be expansion. And Demi is just chilling. Meanwhile, across the map, Geralt's going for an Oracle first. Stargate into an Oracle. Now, this can go one of two ways. We can either just expand. From here, we can just take a third and get into a standard longer game. Or Geralt could try to do something spicy and, I don't know, go for a fleet beacon into Sky Toss. He could go for a hidden tech like a Twilight Council into Glaive Adepts. We'll see what Geralt does want to whip out. So he gets across the map, gets a drone kill before backing off. Getting a bit of value. There it is! Second Stargate. Let's go! 
Second Stargate on the way. This could be a rush into Skytoss. If so, we'd see a Fleet Beacon. Otherwise, this could be double star Stargate Void Ray. Could be double Stargate Phoenix. That is also viable. As we camp the third, we got three drone kills. Demi is still trying to recover. Going for a lair first. Interesting. He is going for his lair. We haven't started anything yet. No fleet beacon, so we shouldn't be rushing into carriers, uh, of course, or, or tempest. I'm feeling phoenixes. That's all we get. Three, four more, six more drones. Oh my god. Six more drones. And there it is. It is going to be mass phoenix. This is a little bit more trendy as of late. This has become more trendy than mass void ray. We're going mass phoenix. This can pair nicely with charge lots. Can pair nicely with a ground army. As we still get more drone kills across the map. Overlord under fire. We do get a surround, but the oracles are here and the links are forced back. The Overlord still does get still does get picked up. And Demi is going Ling Hydra. Okay. This is a good thing for Demi. He's blindly going into Ling Hydra. This is ideal against Link Stalkers and also against Phoenixes. Doesn't know that Phoenixes are being masked, but is guessing correctly. Or just happens to be creating a good unit, good unit composition against it. With that anti-air. Again, I imagine that Demi assumed it was just going to be plus one Ling Stalkers. And as we did mention, Ling Hydra can do quite well against Stalker compositions. So very fortunate there by Demi. Hydroden on the way. Checking the vision here. Geralt, he has spotted that Hydroden. Is aware. And we're not going into charge lots. We have a Robo. This looks like Phoenix Colossus. Could be Phoenix Colossus. Okay. What what is this? A PVT? <laughs> what's what's going on? Interesting. Phoenix as they do move out, they do catch some of these overlords. Demi's still amassing his Hydras. Ooh, it is gonna be heavily supply blocked. And Hydra's getting picked up one after the other. Chance to use barely keeping that Hydra alive. Good moves out of Demi. Phoenix as they're getting low. Alright, getting low as Geralt does confirm, of course, the Hydra base composition. Demi still hasn't really droned. He still hasn't really droned up whatsoever. He's still just amassing more Hydras, more links. It looks like Demi wants to commit, but oh god, losing even more overlords is brutal. Peace is going ham, and Demi, he doesn't care. He's going all in. The Stasis oh, doesn't finish. Another Stasis is going to be going off, though, towards the left hand side. Doesn't get triggered. And Demi he does focus towards that natural. The cannons and shield batteries, they aren't done yet. They need a little bit more time. Overcharge will buy that time. Lings, they flood into the main. They get a surround on the Immortal. No. The Immortal is going to go down. But the Hydras are exposed. And the Hydras are getting picked off one after the other. They do get lifted. The rest of the reinforcements are a little bit late. But they do come in. And can Demi pull this off? Uh, he doesn't have enough Hydras. Not anymore. He's down to six. That is not enough to break Geralt. He will retreat. He's waiting for more units, waiting for reinforcements. Geralt, behind this, Colossus production has commenced. And with the arrival of the Colossus, that's going to be the end of the game. Demi's on a timer. He is on a timer right now. Bleeding out more Hydra's expensive losses here for Demi. He's barely up to eight Hydra's. And the they come in from the left. Survive somehow. Survive the links around. And GG gets called. The writing is on the wall. Demi cannot break Geralt. Not anymore. And Geralt will take the series 2-1. to one, Advancing on to the upper semi-finals. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Geralt for taking the series. My condolences to Demi. Demi came in as the underdog. He came in as a dark horse. Things were not looking so hot for Demi uh, coming into this series, but he popped off. He popped off, and there's a world out there where he could have taken it as well. Like, that was a very spicy, very dynamic matchup, and 
That was not an easy series whatsoever for Geralt. That was <laughs> that was not easy. But GG, well played. Congratulations here to Geralt as he does advance on to the semi-finals where he has an opponent ready and waiting. Let's go. Let us go. Exclamation mark B in the chat. Exclamation mark B. In the chat, if you guys want to have a look at the back of yourselves, because we have a lot of updates. We mentioned some of these updates earlier. We did mention them about how the lower semifinals was already played out. Again, originally we were supposed to cast it. Um, unfortunately, there was a bit of a lack of uh, lapse of communication there, and the players did play out their series. Um, again, we'll make sure that that uh, doesn't occur in the next edition of the Sparkling Tuna Cup, just so we can make sure we can showcase all of our lovely semifinals here for you. Regardless, Art did take down Nice 2-0. to zero. Took down Nice 2-0 to zero here, advancing onto the Grand Finals. Uh, nice, of course, he was able to bring down Mindo VK. It went all the way to the ace match, and he did make it, make it to the semifinals, but he did fall to Art. Art, of course, the Polish Protoss is lying in wait in that best of five. And who will face off against Art? We are here to find out. It's going to be Geralt versus Nikic up next. Let's go. We have our next matchup. It's going to be another PVZ. Gonna be another PVZ, and oh, looks like Nikic he has found himself a new team. He was on Platoon for a long time, but Nikic is now one of the Platinum Heroes again. Platinum Heroes, they have picked up a lot of uh, European players recently over the past month. A lot of players have since joined the Platinum Heroes, and they are just picking up as many players as they can, gobbling them up. Oh boy. And we'll see how that new team is able to boost and support Nikic in this next series. Meanwhile, if you want to support the Sparkling Tuna Cup, you can do so in a couple of different ways. You can support us on Patreon. Exclamation mark Patreon in the chat is a good way to help us fund our tournaments. And we have a breakdown. We have a breakdown <laughs> uh, of the payouts and where all the money is spent and how it does fund our tournaments. And because of the patreon we do we are able to fund the sparkling tuning cup and make it a weekly event and also have enough for a five dollar random raffle as well so yeah, we do have a th well thank you so much for the support that we do get on patreon as you can see on the screen right now just under nikich's name you can see that we have a goal for the patreon to boost the prize pool to grow the tournament because at the moment sparkling tuning cup only pays out top two it only pays out top two if we boost the prize pool, then we can grow our event and we can pay out top four. We can uh, boost the prize pool even further. We can pay admins. We can pay out top five. Sorry, we can pay out uh, top eight as well. Like we have all these kind of stretch goals for our Patreon. So if you want to help support us, if you want to su help support the Sparkling Tuning Cup, you can do so via Patreon. It is available there if you wish. Otherwise, if you want to support this individual event, if you want to support this tournament specifically, the 41st edition of Sparkling Tuna Cup, you can do so via Matcherino. Exclamation mark Matcherino in the chat. And you will get a link to the Matcherino page where you can boost this specific prize pool. Um, again, it's not to support the tournament series as a whole, but, you know, the prize pool nonetheless. So uh, if you choose to, you can on Matcherino. Otherwise... We're just getting ready here for our semi-finals. We will be going on a short break thereafter. We will be going on a short break here after the semi-finals. Um, but that break is going to be for the random raffle. For those who maybe weren't, a here, weren't here in years past, uh, the random raffle is a $5 USD prize that we are giving to a random player. Doesn't matter if they're a finalist, semi-finalist, quarter-finalist, doesn't matter where they are or how far they made it maybe they get maybe they got knocked out in the first round it's possible maybe they got knocked out in the round of 32 but they could still earn a little bit of money here for participating they can still earn it so uh yeah we will be hosting that raffle right after this series right afterwards Otherwise, 
I don't I don't have a I need a drum. Wait. I have a hold on. Hold on. Let me check something. Do I have a open soundboard? Do I have a drum set? Do I this might be a little bit loud. Where's the Discord sounds? <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> Uh, I have a, I have the snare. I have that snare, I guess. <laughs> That's awful. I do have a quack. Oh my god. I'm having, I'm having too much fun. Too much fun with this. Okay. Well, I do have a, 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 a scuffed soundboard that, uh, that I can use for the raffle. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. We'll get that going. Uh, we'll get that going uh, before the Grand Finals, but looks like we have our players ready. We're diving into game number one on Hard Lead in our next Zerg versus Protoss. And as we made it to the semifinals, oh, my apologies. I almost forgot. Predictions. Predictions in the chat. You can get your gamba on, Papi. You can place your bets on who you believe will make it to the Grand Finals. Will it be Geralt? Will it be a PvP Finals back-to-back? -back? Or will our Zerg player... Rise instead and represent the Zerg in those grand finals. Let's find out. Let's go. And spawning in the top left hand corner of Hard Lead, we have our. Red Polish Protoss player representing Psy Storm Gaming. It is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have his opponent now representing a new team, the Planum Heroes. We have the Blue Zerg from the land of Belarus. It is Nikic. And if you are in the chat, predictions are open. You can place your bets on how you want to predict and who you want to believe in who you have faith in to take this entire series and advance on to the grand finals to face off against art it is up to you to decide predictions open. you have a couple of minutes a couple of minutes someone hearing this message to place your bets so don't wait too long otherwise the predictions will be closed meanwhile nick is going for a very safe opener again 15 hatch into a 15 spawning pool you may be wondering what exactly is a 15 15 well it's an extractor trick early on, which is how we can get up to 15 out of 14 supply. It is a way to get this hatchery up before the probe arrives. Get it up and running before the probe gets here. It is very common in current meta, these past couple of years of StarCraft, for the Zerg player to be forced to expand at the third base location from the Protoss because of this probe. This probe denies the expansion and the Zerg has to expand elsewhere. And that does mean that Oracle Defense and Adept, Adept, and Adept Defense can be harder. It can be more difficult, and in more recent years, Zerg players have been playing around and embracing the 15-15 in this matchup and many others to help against this, to help against this sort of feature. It does mean that Nikish can expand. The downside here of the 15-15 is that it is less economic and your gases are later. Your gases are more delayed, link speed is delayed, map control is delayed in favor of being safe on two bases, and safe on three bases eventually. So there's a bit of a give and take. So again, a very safe opener from Nikic. Meanwhile, Geralt across the map is going for his tech of choice, is going for a Twilight Council. Let's go. It's going to be a Twilight Council opener here out of Geralt. With this, we can go into Glaive Adepts. We could go into DTs, into Dark Templar. There's a lot on the table here. What will Geralt go for as he's still being active with that probe? And Nikic is in the dark. Now, something that Nikic should notice is that Warp Gate wasn't delayed. It is still in production. So I wonder if Nikic can piece that together. Ah, there's no Stalker though, so... Because there's no Stalker, Nikic should be able to get a Scout. He should be able to float on in with that Overlord. So far, we're still mining 3 and 3. 
three gases in each gas geyser. Sorry, three probes in each gas geyser. This feels like a dark shrine opener, as long as we don't pull out. If we stay, if we do pull out, it should be Glavid Epps. But we shall see. As Nick is still droning up back at home, we do see that Link Speed is still halfway done. Getting quite late. And there it is. There's the Dark Shrine. As we did mention, again, if it was going to be Glavid Epps, we would have seen um, we would have seen our Protoss player pull out of gas ahead of time. Just to be as efficient as possible. But no, it is going to be Dark Templar. So this is a macro opener. This is a way to get across the map. It is a way uh, to get across the map to apply some pressure, to get some damage done and expand behind it. To gain map control is really what it does. If Nikish misreads this, if he cuts corners, then we could actually do even more damage. But there it is. Safety Spore Crawlers are on the way. Queens are amassing. And Nikish, he should be perfectly safe and sound. Should be in a good position. Boy, he should be surviving. <laughs> Shouldn't take too much damage. As here comes that prison. Is this live? This is live. Shout out to Stream Elements for uh, for giving an answer. <laughs> but yeah, we don't do reruns. We do do replay casts from time to time. That is true. But this is not a replay cast either. As Dark Templar on the way, Nick is going to be defending with Banelings, not with Roaches. Banelings is thrown down. Queens are in position. Ooh, no Spore Crawler here at the third base. We have a Spore at the Natural, not at the third. DTs are walling in, and we're not ready. Uh-oh, we are not ready for our DTs. They go to town here on these drones. Nick is cutting too many corners, being too greedy, not getting that Spore. Heads towards the Natural base. The Spore is done. Again, we were ready in the Natural, just not at the third. Ooh, and Nikich, he loses four drones, loses so much mining time. Uh, the Dark Templar getting even more value, going for the hatchery, going for the queens, going for a bit of everything. <laughs> they will be forced back as the Spore has arrived. It doesn't end the game, but it does do quite a lot of damage here to Nikich. As he will hold. And behind this, the Bailiness is done. We can go for a bust. Uh oh, we can go for a bust here. Nikish, there we go. Bailings are on the way. He's going for a massive counterattack. He's looking to punish Geralt. You may have crippled my economy, but I wasn't going to drone anyway. Nikish cutting workers here at 38, not making a single drone. Does have a Roach Warren on the way, but he's looking to reciprocate. He's looking to bust into the natural and get some damage done. The Bailings are walling in. They wall in, they bust through the wall. Bailings, they head for the mineral line. The Lings, they get us around. They should be getting us around on the Immortal. Oh my god, the positioning! The Archons, they clean up those Bailings. A good defense here by Geralt. The Lings are getting into the main though. Oh my god. They get into the main base. Probes are going down. Disruptor has arrived. And we will clean this up, but Geralt, he does take some damage. He does sustain some losses. Lings are gonna be they're gonna be able to pick up a couple more of these workers. Lings, they come in to reinforce. No shot. They slip into the natural once again. Very nice whole position micro here. Yeah, on the probes. Killing 15 workers. And just like that, Nikish takes an economic lead as he has been droning. Nikish has been droning this entire time. The Roach Warren is done. 11 roaches on the way. And Geralt, he has to counterattack. He has to move out. Let's go. The pressure is on. He has a one disruptor, a handful of gateway units. He has an archon, but we have a wall of queens and roaches. Nikic, he's looking quite comfortable here on his three base setup. Carol pushing up the ramp. Shows it over. This Nova has to connect. Uh, only takes down one roach. Not good enough. Not going to be good enough. As yeah, Geralt, he has to back off. He knows he cannot force the issue. He knows that there's just too much waiting for him. And Geralt has to retreat. Another Nova. Big connection on the Lings. Very nicely done here by Geralt. Turning water into wine. Making the best out of this 
rough situation. As behind this, and Nick is still just going to be droning. Working on a lair, double even chamber, double upgrades. Nick is working towards a longer game. Disruptor, ooh, is denied. Is forced back. Oh, and that is going to be six paintings on the way. No, we get caught out. No. The bailings. The Archons are barely pushed forward. Yeah, and they will shut these bailings down. Very nice catch here by Geralt. Very nice catches. Oh, the Dark Templar. The <laughs> Dark Templar, they force a cancel. Detection a little bit out of position. Spores repositioning. Oh. Oh, that's Geralt. He's still looking for value. I mean, canceling the fourth base is a very nice pickoff. And again, Geralt, he has been able to regain control of his economy. He's back up to 64 workers. He has a better economy than that of Nikic. And I am concerned here. Nikic, are we going to drone out the fourth? Or do we go for a three base all in? We have plus one attack on the way. Plus one range on the way. Bailing speed, roach speed. We're still making more roaches. It feels like Nikic wants to push. It feels like this space is only for Larva. As I say that, we are droning. Never mind. We have a couple of drones on the way. Ah, uh, but the fourth is going to be denied once again. We force another cancel. The Nova! Raises the army. Takes down a Roach. Takes down Lings. A bailing run by does one. Lin! Two Bailings! Bailing speed kicks in just in time, and we do connect. Four probes go down. Not a bad run by there from Nikic. But he still cannot expand. And Nikic, he needs that center base. He needs to expand elsewhere. Clearly, he cannot hold on to this low ground. I guarantee he does recall. Yeah, Roach is able for a big run by it. Forcing a recall. Nikic, he can now double expand if he so chose to. But remember, we spoke about how he wasn't droning. He's still at sub-66 workers. He's still at three-base saturation. Ooh, big Nova. But it looks like Nikic, he wants to commit. We have 60 more links on the way. Still no expansions. There's that double expand. Fourth and fifth at the same time. We have to double expand here to catch up. And Nikic, he's only going for run by. It looks like he's still just building himself up. Trying to max out. Failings to get caught out by the Stalkers. Can we get in? Oh. Good positioning there by Geralt. And the Bailings, they will not make it. More sag defense. <laughs> More walls. Geralt just securing himself. And uh, Geralt, he, he has been able to weather the storm. He's on four bases. Like He has a better economy. That's the thing right now. Better economy for the Protoss. Which is why I assume that Nikish will be going for an all-in. He does go for a big lane counter-attack. At the same time, can Nikish hold on to that fourth? As the links are going ham. DT counter-attack here towards the left-hand side. Drones are going down. We barely had any drones to begin with. It looks like we will kill this third. But the fourth base was also killed as well. Poor Nikish for the Zerg. And Geralt, he's not stopping. He's not slowing down. Nova goes off. Zoning back the Zerg. Another big connection. Oh, my God. Big connections here on the army. And Nikish, he's running out of steam. He's running out of units. Even without the disruptors, Geralt, he should just have too much. Nikish, he did kill a lot of workers across the map, but it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Not anymore. Geralt, he just have too many workers anyway. Too much of an army. GG gets called. And Geralt will take game number one. GG. GG, well played. What I will say, though, is that that was not the cleanest of games. <laughs> Things got very scrappy. Things got very scrappy, very down and dirty between Nikic and Geralt. They both, they just got into it. In the end, of course, Geralt was able to stabilize. Nikic was maybe bleeding out too much. More importantly, Nikic was forced into an all-in. He was just denied the fourth over and over again. He could not get, in, get it up and running. Could not establish himself. And with that, Geralt does take, has, uh, does take game one. And will we have another PvP finals? We had one last night between Geralt and Christianer. 
This time Christiana isn't here, but we have Art to take Christiana's place. That's spawning in the top left hand corner. In the top left hand corner of Oceanborn, we have our Polish Protoss player leading the series 1-0, one, one game away from advancing onto the Grand Finals. It's so close. He is so close. Can he make it? It is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the blue Zerg player representing the Platinum Heroes from the land of Belarus. It is Nikic. He needs to fight back here and now to force the ace match to give himself a chance at making it to the grand finals. As he once again goes for a 15 hatchery, once again goes for a safe opener, 15 hatch into the 15 spawning pool. Same build as game one. Now remember, Nikish did go for a Bane bust in game one, but that was a reaction. That was a reaction to the DT opener of Geralt. So will he open up aggressively again, or will it be a much more safer, standard, macro-oriented build from Nikish? Or play style. We'll see. There's the pool, followed by a delayed gas. And everything looking standard here. Everything looking normal from the side of Nikic so far. Geralt going for a getting spend, chilling back at home, getting his bases up and running. Is going to be getting them up and running and so far just a stable start to the game we'll be keeping an eye on Nigish to see if he goes for another faster bailing nest as we saw in game one likewise we'll keep an eye on Geralt for his tech of choice we have a cyber core on the way we have a pylon thrown down in the main base curious location for the pylon it does feel like a stargate placement here based on the positioning as I say that, Geralt also had a very similar pylon positioning last game for the Twilight Council as well, instead of the Stargate. So, still could be either one. I'm leaning towards Stargate, but no, there it is! Twilight Council. Twilight Council is thrown down two games in a row. Do we go Dark Templar two games in a row as well? I mean, it wasn't a bad opener from Geralt. Like, he, he killed drones, he denied mining, he did quite well for himself. The problem with doing this two games in a row is that Nikish is going to be more mentally prepared. It means that when he scouts and confirms that it isn't a Stargate, Dark Templar are going to be the first thing on his mind, and he should have a Spore. This time he should have a Spore in position. Uh, should. <laughs> Doesn't mean he will, but uh, it should be there. As Yedept has arrived, third base is delayed. Oh, we have a probe at the other third base location. Oh, that is so annoying here, and Nikic gonna have to chill on two bases a little bit longer. Another adept is on the way. Is being contained. Will eventually expand, but again, I've got the drone. <laughs> We're coming in. Geralt, he does see. And the hatchery should be thrown down as we commit to the shade. Get to the natural. Pick up some links. Nothing major. Adepts are going to be going down. We have confirmation it is a Dark Trine opener from Geralt. Even recalling that final Adept. Does escape. Does get away. And Nikish. Oh my god. That's another fast Bane Nest. We have 18 Lings on the way. Nikish is going for a bust. He's going for a Bane bust. This time a much more proactive one. Remember, in game one, it was a reactive Bane bust here against Geralt's Dark Trine. Dark Shrine opener against the DTs. This time it feels like Nikish wants to be in his face here and now. Flooding links, flooding links across the map. Getting on top of the Stalker. The Stalker will fall. We're pushing into the natural. We are so close, but we do wall off in time. Prison moves out. We're going for the Cyber Core. The Cyber Core is under fire. It should go down here to the links. And Nikish, he's not stopping Link production. Geralt walling off behind this. Does get the wall up in time. Okay, we're going to be going down. DT's on the way. Again, Dark Templar, they don't care about, the, about your Cyber Core. Yeah, Link's are forced back. 
And do we commit to the bus? I mean, we have to, right? No, we're droning. Oh. Nikki, she's going to try to drone. And DTs are walling across the map. The third base. Uh, there's a spore. There's a spore crawler, thankfully, in every single base. So Nikichi will survive. But look at, his, look at his drone count. He's down to 24 workers. He hasn't even lost anything. The reason why is because Nikich has been cutting drones this entire time. Oh, and we're going to lose even more. Four dead workers here at the natural. We dive on the spore crawler. DT into the main. DT at the third. DT at the natural. Uh, workers going down left and right. Looks like finally we get on top of one of those Dark Templar, but this is just snowballing out of control. We're busting in! The Bailey's a crash into the wall. The wall is open. Lings, they do break into the natural. Boys are being pulled, but it's not going to be enough. GG gets called. Geralt, he holds. He cripples his opponent with DTs across the map, and he defends with DTs back at home. And Geralt will advance on to the grand finals. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations to Geralt as he will make it here. He survives the all-in, survives the Bane Bust. And just like that, we have a Protoss versus Protoss Finals. Let's go. GG, well played. GG, my condolences to Nikic. He had a deep run. He made it to the semis, you know, further than any other non-Protoss. So very nicely done here by Nikic. Regardless, though, that is going to be uh, that is going to be the end of his tournament run. Here it is, a single elimination bracket, single elimination tournament. Congratulations to Geralt, and we have our finalists. Let's check it out. Let us go. GG, well played. With that, it is going to be Geralt versus Art, a PvP in the purest sense of the word. Protoss versus Protoss, Poland versus Poland, pink versus pink. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see if they pick the pink color. <laughs> but Geralt versus Arch is going to be coming up next, and we are going to be getting ready for that finals. But as we get ready for it, we have something else to get through. We do have a raffle to get through, and we will be focusing on that here and now. Here and now. For those that are curious, what the hell is going on? What, what are you on about, Papi? What are you on about? Well, bam. This is what I'm on about. We have a 5 USD participation raffle. This is a part of the Patreon. This is a uh, goal that we do have uh, reached on the Patreon to be able to help spread the love a little bit. I mentioned before that... At the moment, our tournament is only top two. And I mean, shout out to Geralt and Art. They're both in the money. They're both walking away with some prize money here tonight. But I would love to share the load a little bit here. And as a result, doesn't matter who you are. You could be Art, a finalist. You could be Hatsu, someone who got knocked out in the first round. You are equally eligible here. You have an even chance to make some money to walk away with some cash prize here in the sparkling tuna cup so it is really up to anyone it is up for anyone quickly double check something we are ready for this we are ready here for this as Let's random it up. Let's roll the dice. <laughs> Let's roll the dice here. Shout out to Kuro as well for making this lovely spreadsheet. We have our lovely tuners. <laughs> Ready for the drum roll. Uh. Let's go. <laughs> we have our drum roll. And congratulations to our random winner this week. It is going to be, bam, Roselia. Oh my god, the Korean Terran! Hold on, do I have a do I have a thing? Wait, wait, I do. GG, congratulations here to Roselia, the Korean Terran player who did get knocked out early on. Let me just quickly double check here. You can see Roselia actually wait. <laughs> Hold on. Let me move the bracket over. 
Roselia actually was knocked out in the first round. <laughs> you can see here in the round of 32, Roselia did go up against uh, Sneaky Assassin, aka you in the first round. And despite not taking a map, despite getting knocked out in the first round, Roselia has still walked, walked away with something. It's beautiful. You do love to see it. <laughs> You do love to see it. So congratulations here to Roselia. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, shout out to the runner-ups, runner which don't mean anything, but Nice was there. You can see Star Killer. You can see Rostock. You can see Nikic and Azura. Um, runoffs don't really mean anything, but that's just the order, <laughs> the order of the randomizing. And uh, yeah, Roselia will be walking away with some extra prize money there. And congratulations to Roselia. GG. So yeah, again, it shows that doesn't matter kind of where you placed, how far you went, as long as you participated. Bearing in mind, uh, as a reminder as well, um, there is a player that didn't compete here today. You can see Mia Micah. Mia Micah, there's a 99 and 0. That is a walkover. Because Mia Micah didn't compete, he was ineligible for the raffle. So that's uh, an example of a player that signed up, checked in, but you have to participate. You have to play your matches to be eligible for the random raffle. And again, if you do, doesn't matter where you are, you can still make some money here. So if you're in the chat, if you want to take part of this tournament, if you want to face off against players like Geralt, like Art, Nikic, Nice, Nicaract, Demi, Rostock, if you want to be cannon rushed by Gref, uh, for example, <laughs> if you want to bear witness to the craziness that is Mew Micah or Hon Mono, then you can sign up and you can be a part of this. It's open to all players. Doesn't matter what rank you are. Doesn't matter what league you are. This is open to all. So take part. Take part if you're interested. If you're interested. Oh, otherwise, we are getting ready for the grand finals. Do need a moment here. Do need a moment to get things ready. As we do have our lobby and we are setting up the predictions. Here we go. Uh, we're just setting up those predictions here so you can get your gamma going. You can place your bets on who you believe is going to be this week's champion. The first Sparking Tunic Cup of 2024. How will we start the year? It's going to be with a Protoss champion, as it usually is, in our online weeklies. But, again, will it be the Polish Protoss in Geralt or the Polish Protoss in Art? Going to be a hard call to make as PvPs are very dynamic and very unpredictable. So best of luck. Best of luck in your predictions here. We are loading into game one. Vitos are done. Loading in to Site Delta. And spawning in the top left-hand corner of Site Delta, we have our red Polish Protoss player. He didn't get the memo. There's no purple, but the red Polish Protoss representing Psy Storm Gaming. He made his way through Nikic. He had a rough road here to the finals, but he has made it back-to-back -back two days in a row. Can he go the distance? Can he finally win a Sparkling Tuna Cup this year? I mean, the only one, really. <laughs> it is Geralt. And spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the Polish Protoss player. The pink Polish Protoss. The alliteration is real. Representing the Platinum Heroes, it is Art. Let's go. And if you're in the chat, you have a couple of minutes upon hearing this message. You have a couple of minutes here. Uh -huh. Predictions open. To place your bets on who you think is going to be this week's champion. Predictions are open for a couple of minutes. Best of luck. As our PvP is underway. And what I refer to when I said that, you know, can Geralt finally, you know, take a championship? What I mean by that is that last night we casted 
the Logic Games. And Geralt also made, made it to the finals. And it was Geralt versus another Polish Protoss, not Art. It was Geralt versus Christiana. It was Geralt versus Christiana, and they went all the way to the Ace match. It was an in a, it was an amazing finals. I do recommend the VODs if you missed out on the Logic Games. And in the end, it went to the Ace match, and Christiana, he was our champion last night. He was our champion. Geralt barely fell short. He barely sh fell short. But can he make up for it? Can he redeem himself today? Or will Art stand in his way and claim the win himself? When it comes to the road to the finals, Art hasn't dropped a single map. He has 2 0 his way to the Grand Finals. He 2 0 Nice. He 2 0 Azura. And he 2 0 Medic Jr. as well. Art, he is looking unstoppable today. Meanwhile, Geralt didn't have an easy road. He did drop a map to Demi in the quarterfinals. So he has it has been shown that Geralt can bleed. He is merely a mortal. He's merely a man. But can he stand up to Art? Oh my god! As we're going for a robo. This looks like a very aggressive build here. Art, he goes for a Rax Expand setup, but instead of an expansion, he goes for a robo. He goes for another gateway as well. This is the setup for a one base all in. Because we have one, two, three gateways and a robo. It looks like an expansion, and I'm worried for Geralt. Geralt, he hasn't seen anything. It looks like an expansion. It looks like a Nexus. His probe was killed, and the Sorks are coming in. They need to get a read on what's going on. Geralt back at home, two gate opener, in towards an expansion. We do see Geralt, he's scouting for proxies, trying to feel out what is happening. And Geralt expands! Uh oh. Geralt, he does expand. We have a safety shield battery in the main base. He thinks it's a Stargate. Or he's ready for a proxy Stargate or a Stargate opener. Just in case. Going for a Twilight Council and Art, he's doubling down. A Prism is on the way. Stalkers are amassing and Art is going for the all-in. Oh boy. Here we go. Comes across a fake proxy pylon. Oh, so, Geralt, sorry, he comes across a real reinforcing pylon. He will shut it down. Art's getting here a little bit too late. The pylon will fall. But here come the reinforcements. Pylon does get shut down. Oh, that does supply block Art. Actually important. Meanwhile, at the same time, Geralt, he gets into the main. He shades into the main base. He sees all the gateways. He knows what's happening. And he is setting up here in the main. He knows he cannot defend his natural. Probes are going down. Art, his economy is being crippled. Big moves here from Geralt. Meanwhile, Art, he commits across the map. Geralt will have to cancel this natural. Does he cancel? Does he let it finish? He will let it finish. Meanwhile, Art, he does dive into the main. Does drop over it. Over the wall. Where's the shield battery? Where's the overcharge? Boys are being pulled. Geralt, he's in a lot of trouble. Storks are being focused down. Can he get the prism? Oh, he will not. The prism does survive, just barely. Focus down as many stalkers as we can. The prism? We got another warp in. It barely lives. Every stalker goes down and Art, he has an army. Geralt does not. There's nothing left here for Geralt. No army left. He has one stalker that does get focused down. And Art has done it. He breaks on through, gets on top of the production, depowers all the gateways, and there's nothing left here for Geralt. He's down to one sentry. Oh, the prism. The sentry does not get a kill in the prism. It survives. The stalker gets one shot off. The prism goes down, but it doesn't matter because that is the one unit that Geralt has remaining. The one stalker. Again, all the gateways are depowered. We start a step back. Good force field here. And we're losing too many probes. Far too much economic damage. 15 probes go down. They say shade in. They do shade in. And we, we can just camp the production. GG gets called. Art will take game number one. Ooh, GG. GG. Again, Art faking an economic opener. Very cheeky move. Art, because of his setup, because he killed the probe, he made it look like he was expanding. He made it look like he was going for a more economic build when really he was doing anything but. And Art, he did end up so building out of control there. Um, Geralt, it was some really good moves for him to get across the map with those adepts. <laughs> he 
she did do a lot of damage with the adepts that is true but um unfortunately <laughs> the adepts weren't good enough um in the end we didn't have a shield battery didn't have an overcharge we just didn't have enough to defend back at home we were just lacking the resources to warp in we were just lacking the the shield batteries again i do think it was a mistake for Geralt to let the expansion finish that is resources that could have been spent on additional pylons and additional shield batteries that was 400 minerals wasted on a nexus that did not help in the defense against the all-in so that was a bit of a misstep there by Geralt, and uh, yeah he was overwhelmed in the end just barely gg well played i should also say though really good control out of art juggling his units and keeping that prism alive for as long as he did honestly let's be real if that prism died earlier on maybe Geralt holds maybe he just defends then and there and he gets away with the expansion like that that's a very real possibility but alas, here we go. We're getting into game number two and spawning in the bottom right-hand corner of Goldenora. We have our Polish Protoss player. The pink Polish Protoss representing the Platinum Heroes. It is Art. And spawning in the top left-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the red Protoss player. The Polish Protoss representing Psystorm Gaming. It is Geralt. <laughs> Catching up with the chat. Uh, PvP finals. All the battles complaints in the bin. No. PvP unwinnable, Pappy. Unwinnable. <laughs> Let's go. As Geralt is going for his probe scout across the map. As we load into Golden Aura, it's going to be a two-gate opener from Geralt and a two-gate opener from Art. Again, Side Delta is a map because of the ramp you're able to fake out or even commit to a more economic opener. Outside of Side Delta and Radis' Station, we should be seeing two gate openers instead. Uh, we should be, but we're not. Art! Going for a gate into Cybercore. Oh, there it is. Cybercore gets thrown down. So a two gate opener from Geralt. Meanwhile, a gate cyber opener from, from Art, which means he can go for a much faster expansion here. Ooh. Okay. Proxy Pylon. So... Geralt, he scouts. He sees something is wrong. Something doesn't quite make sense here. Where is your second gateway? Also, your pylon is missing. What is happening? Is it a proxy? Art, he fakes out a proxy. He's trying to tell a story, trying to sell a story. And how will Geralt respond? He's scouting. You see Geralt. He's scouting. He's looking for the proxy. Looking for what the hell Art is up to. Checking with that probe. Scouting and scouring the northern side of the map. Meanwhile, Art, I believe he should be expanding. I believe. We're checking the northern corners here. Geralt, he's on the hunt. Meanwhile, Art scouts with his own worker. Does confirm the pylon placement. Uh, most of it. Does see two, doesn't see the third. Scouting probe goes down, and there's the expansion. After the probe dies, then Art throws down the expansion again. Very economic opener here out of Art. But he's trying to make it look like he's cheesing. And Geralt has no idea. Safety shield battery in the main base just in case it's a proxy Stargate. I mean, it, it does look like a proxy Stargate, to be fair. You can see Geralt, he checks the gold. He's looking for a ninja base. Coming back in, and Geralt will finally confirm that we have expanded. And now Geralt is in a really awkward position. He went for a Robo. Ah, cancels. Oh, brutal. Very delayed tech. This robot was designed to defend against an all-in. Geralt, he was convinced. He was convinced it was, it was an all-in. He has to cancel the robo. Now goes for an expansion, and now he's just behind. He's behind in bases, and he's behind in tech, because Art, back at home, actually has his natural already on the way, his robo already on the way as well, and we... as we're going for a Twilight Council. Okay. Let's go. So the way this works is with this robo opener from Art, this is a defensive robo. This is designed to defend against all ins on two bases. So in case Geralt committed to a one base all in, Art would be safe. You can see the immortal on the way. So Art is very safe here, very greedy. The downside is that Art is going to be stuck on his side of the map, and Geralt, his advantage is going to be blink. That is the one thing going Geralt's way, is blink timing. Now, as a result, he will have a more mobile army. He will be able to, because he has map control, take a faster third as well. 
He will have access to a faster third. We'll see if he goes for it. Here we go. As the mortals have arrived. They have arrived here as Art is pushing forward. Again, has revealed those immortals. Adepts, they come in, but they do get blocked away. They do get shut out of the main base. With that shield battery, quick moves here out of Art. Building up those immortals, working towards his own blink. And Art, he does have that work really does have the better economy. Geralt behind this, working towards his own robo. Now, the question becomes, does Geralt commit on two bases or do we expand? I am waiting to see... I'm waiting to see if Geralt throws down additional gateways or not. And here comes a probe, and we should be taking a faster third. So, this is a way for Geralt to come back in this game, is to expand first, and to recover economically that way. Oh, as we commit to the shade, one adept goes down, not worth it there for Geralt. Bit of a misstep. Meanwhile, Art, he should be taking his own third. It is on the way. Geralt, instead of his third base, he does prioritize another gateway. Here at the here in the main, does throw down a fourth gateway, still building up Immortals. That's going to be a four-gate setup. He has a choice to make. Two base all in, or a third base. What are we going for? <laughs> here we go. We're at a crossroads. We do deny the scouts, but the third base is thrown down. Art doesn't know, though. He's in the dark. He's moving on the right-hand side. Again, Geralt just going for a safer opener. Our depths are going to be shading in towards that natural. They do commit. Oh, they do commit. And Art, with that immortal lead, he has a hefty army. Both players have blink. As Art is going to be backing off, rotating around. Looking for another way in. Again, his army is still superior than that of his opponents with the Immortals. Catches the Adepts. Big moment there. The Prism! Uh, we caught the Adepts, but at the same time, Geraldine catches the War Prism. Big moment there for Geralt. Does shut down the Prism. He's defending his third base. Behind this, Art going for a Dark Shrine. Spicing it up even further. His third is already up and running again. Art with the better economy. Maintains his better economy as well. He backs off. He may have lost the prison, but he saves his immortals. And DTs are going to be very interesting. Now, you may be thinking, but we already have detection. We have an observer on the way. Like, Geralt should be fine. Kind of. Observers aren't always at home. So DTs can still kill workers. They can still wreak havoc, even if you have detection. But here we go. Geralt, he does. A force his way in between the natural and the third. He gets a sentry. Does pick up a sentry. Backs off. Doesn't lose anything. Not bleed out anything, not yet. That's Geralt. He dives into the main base. Picks off the Cybercore. Very nicely done. No more Stalkers. Cybercore goes down, blinks away, doesn't lose anything. Very good moves here out of Geralt. And can he catch the Immortals? Force fields get thrown down. Doesn't quite get them, though. As they zone each other away. Force fields thrown down once again. We go for the third base. And the Immortals, they are stuck. They cannot engage. Geralt out positioning Art. Engages with half the army. The Immortals are getting low. And one of them goes down. But again, a good start to the fight here for Geralt as he bleeds out his second Immortal. Oh. Expensive losses there for, for Geralt. Did have some nice moves. But expensive moves is what I will say. Art, he takes a fourth. Geralt still on three bases. Still doesn't have his own fourth. And Art still maintains his worker lead. He's got 61 probes to the 56 of his opponent. The DCs are going ham. Dark Templar in every single mineral line. Probes are falling. 11 probes fall. We spoke about this. Detection is not where it needs to be. Even with observers, 14 probes go down. We still have a, we still have a DT here at the natural as well. As it finally gets cleaned up. Three DTs for 15 probes. Well worth it. Well worth it for Art. He's got 65 workers to the 48 of Geralt. 
And just like that, the pressure is on. Geralt, what do we do? Do we take a fourth? Do we try to recover economically? Or do we just send it? Oh, God. Do we just send it as we get another DT into the main? No. Three more probes, just keeping Geralt back at home, keeping him busy. There's the fourth base on the way. And this is how we this is how we catch up. It, there are a couple of comeback mechanics. In PvP, there are a couple of different ways to come back. One is outpositioning your opponent. As we just saw, Geralt, he picked off a cyber core, picked off a couple of units. Like, if you're able to catch your opponent out of position, you can do well with Blink Stalkers. The other thing, DTs. We've seen as art has been popping off and tells who's a war prison, but the DTs have been a thorn in Geralt's side. Another way, though, that Geralt hasn't gone for until now, Disruptors. Disruptors, they're very hit and miss in both the literal and figurative sense of the word. And Disruptors, they can annihilate an army or they can whiff and you can just die. As we outposition Geralt, Geralt, he's out on the map and we push in towards the third. Ay, ay, ay. Speaking of being caught out of position, Geralt, not like this, gets caught with his pants down. The base is gonna fall. He dives in, gets an immortal. But the force fields are too good. And before Geralt can even think about or can even make a single disruptor, Art, he has arrived. He's snowballing out of control. He wrist race the mineral line. 16 probes go down. And there's just not much here to defend. There's not much left. Stalkers, they get completely shut down here as we chase them back. And that's going to be a kill in the third base. GG gets called. And Art will take game number two, extending his lead in the finals. GG, and this is an this is a terrifying art, by the way. This is <laughs> he's terrifying. Oh my god. Art, he was a rising star back in 2020 and 2021. I remember casting a lot of art back in the day. He was very active, and then art stepped away. Art, he stepped away from the game. He took a bit of a break. He was less active in 2022, less active in 2023. He came back in the second half of 2023 and he has been slowly on the rise you know regaining his skill you know getting back his placement in the region and art has not dropped a single map tonight not a single map he has gone untouched undefeated in this tournament and can he go the distance can he walk that not quite the royal road but can he go like for the for the perfect kill can he <laughs> Can he take no damage and take no losses in this tournament? He's so close. He is so close. As we're getting into game three, spawning in to Hardland. And spawning in the top left-hand corner of Hardled, we have our red Protoss player representing Psy Storm Gaming down in this series, struggling a little bit here. But we all know how good he is. We all know that he is on the level of his opponents. He can bring it out, but he needs to bring it out here and now. The pressure is on. It is Geralt. He needs your energy. He needs your support to fight back and to force the ace match. Meanwhile, spawning in the bottom right-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the pink Polish Protoss, representing the Platinum Heroes, looking dominant today in the Sparkling Tunic Cup in number 41. Can he keep this going? Can he go the distance here and go for the 3-0? It is Art. And again, when it came to that last game, there was a lot of mind games. I, I apologize if, I, if I, I didn't make that like as clear. Uh, but in that last game, there was so much mind games. Oh, actually, in this entire series, we've had non-stop mind games from Art. Art, he's been deceiving Geralt left and right. Remember, game one, Art, he made it look like he was going for a gate expand. And he went for one base all in. Art, he faked out an expansion, went for one base all in, and caught Geralt with his pants down. In game number two, Art faked a one base all in and really went for a gate expand went for something much more economic and he got away with it and Geralt believed it so much that he was being cheesed that he went for a robo went for a shield battery had to cancel the robo delay his tech delayed expansion like art sorry Geralt was just behind from the openers time after time game after game 
Arts, what do you have in store for us this time? <laughs> the mind games, the big brain plays here so far. And that's the thing about PvP as Geralt, let's go! <laughs> He does throw down a bit of a citizen's arrest, and these two probes, they're stuck. Those two workers there, they're trapped between Geralt's pylon and the minerals. And he lets it finish! Geralt, he lets it finish, delaying some mining time here in the main, being as annoying as possible. As Art it does not fake out a proxy pylon, it has been thrown down in the main base as well. So a cheeky move out of Geralt, what does this do? This delays mining time there's two probes that aren't fighting sorry the two probes that aren't mining and one probe one additional worker that is fighting as well that is not mining it's not saturating so as a result you can see here the economy go in favor of Geralt economic advantage for Geralt all because of that one pylon very nicely done behind this and Geralt's gonna be throwing down his Nexus gonna be a two gate opener what looks to be into an expansion Meanwhile, Art is going for a two-gate opener into a Stargate. And Geralt's still trying to piece this together. There's the Nexus on the way for Geralt. So Geralt, he's going to be ahead in the economy. With this Stargate opener, Art, he's going for Oracles. And his goal here is to kill some workers and to even things up as Art will have a later expansion. He will be behind here in his expansion. Stalkers... Coming back to deal with this probe, to deal with any kind of scouting. What did Geralt see? Didn't see the Stargate, but did see how late the expansion is. And again, Geralt, he's playing safe. Went for a safety shield battery in the main base. He is safe and sound against at least one orc. Will we shade in? That's a shade into the main. They focus down two probes. Ooh, getting a third probe as well. Good pickoffs there by Geralt. Meanwhile, Art's moving out with that Oracle. Again, the Art cannot out-DPS the shields or the uh, regeneration that a shield battery provides. So the shield battery will keep this base safe. And the Oracle will arrive and Geralt shouldn't sustain any damage. Shouldn't. But still could. As we rotate into the main, Stalker's in position. We do zone that Oracle away. Good moves here by Geralt. Arch will have to back off. We'll have to retreat. Gonna be saturating his natural. Oh! Gonna be saturating his natural base. You can see Geralt with a five worker lead. Just because Geralt didn't have to waste time in a, a, investing into a Stargate, into an Oracle. Geralt also goes up and got a faster Nexus. And so far, this Oracle hasn't paid for itself. So far. It's been a costly investment here by Art. Is moving out with his stalkers. Can he find some damage here? Behind this, Blink is on the way. Blink is faster for Geralt. So there's going to be a window where Geralt has Blink and Art doesn't. A small window, but a window nonetheless. Oh. As Geralt, he... Did he see? <laughs> Hard to say. Yeah, he did. A probe gets sent out. Stasis Trap is going to be triggered. Art is reinforcing back at home. Following this, he's still only on two gateways. Only two gateways here for Art. Likewise, four gates for Geralt, but he's expanding. This has become a very common trend that I've noticed because we casted a lot of Geralt today and yesterday. Is that Geralt? He does like going up to four gateways before expanding. Not going for one, not going for two base all ins, but going for four gateways just to be safe. Does play very safe overall. It does hurt Geralt a little bit. It doesn't mean that he doesn't die, but it also means that he's not as efficient as he otherwise could be. It is just a trend that I have noticed. Or that we have noticed. As Geralt, he comes in across the map. He has high ground vision with that observer. We'll say, alright, it does spot it. Whatever it does siege, you can see Art committing here to a gateway composition, working towards charge. So Blink Stalker into charge lots. Meanwhile, Geralt going Blink Stalker into immortal production. So mortals are amassing. Go 
God, Orc almost goes down. We dive on top of the army. And Arch, he does have a greater stalker force. Does catch out Geralt. Good pickoffs here by Arch. Ooh, gets three stalkers. Gets a good chunk of stalkers here across the map. Geralt, he backs off. Again, getting into his third saturation. Likewise, so was Art. The game is going to be settling from here. Now, Art goes for his own gateways. Going to be three gates, five in total. Not too bad. Sorry, four gates. Six in total. Even going up to seven. My apologies. As I didn't even notice a third gateway here. Uh, so we're just doubling down and going up to eight gates. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be 8 gauge charge. We do have a Temple Archives on the way for Archons. For Archon production. So we know the, tra the trajectory here of Art's composition. Meanwhile, Geralt, he has avoided charge entirely. Doesn't care. Doesn't care about charge. Doesn't care about Archons. Going just Stalker Immortal instead. And Epsa Shade into the third base. Probes are going down. We got five worker kills here at the third. Not too bad. Geralt maintaining his economy. Maintaining that lead once again. Alright, he will take a fourth base, but we'll see how hard he does saturate it. Prism is on the way. Charge is now done. Temp uh, Temple Archives and Twilight Council already done. As well. Te ah, Temple Archives has completed for Archon production. There it is. Archons are on the way, and R should soon be pushing. Should soon be moving out. I mean, ideally, you want to hit a timing with plus two. Ideally, which is still a ways off. Geralt getting his own fourth, working his own plus two, and charge as well. So, Geralt playing catch up here when it comes to the composition of his army. Going for something similar. But he won't have any Archons. And once again, Geralt getting caught out. Yeah, bleeding out one of those stalkers. Oh, it's going to be committing. Remember, he does have the war prism. He can reinforce. He's here looking to poke away and find value here in these trades. Pick away at the stalkers. Maybe catch an immortal. Also, the Temple Archives is done for Geralt. So he's going to have Archons of his own. They're just now morphing in. Can we get the fourth? Well, the fourth looking a bit vulnerable, but ah, Geralt, he's here. Here in position to stop Art. So he does reinforce. So once again, he catches out a couple of stalkers. These are expensive losses here for Geralt. He has to be very careful with how he does engage. Does want to bleed out stalkers. Zealots is fine, but Stalker's less so. See Geralt trying to be assertive. Good blinks out of art. Plus two about to finish up in five seconds. Just in time for this push. There is also going to be engaging. Army supplies are quite comparable. Good target firing out of art. He gets an arc on. Does snipe his first arc on. Geralt down to one. Backs off to the shield battery. Art is going to be reinforcing. Art, he's got a bit of momentum on his side. Again, there's only one Archon to worry about. And it's looking exposed. Yeah, we dive on forward. Big AoE there from that Archon, but they're breaking through. Yeah, Art, he's slowly breaking through here. Shield battery adding a lot of help here, a lot of support to the army. Cannons as well. Stay strap goes off. Does go off and Geralt, he gets caught out. And it looks like Art, does he break through? Does he barely have enough? The Immortals are going down. The Immortals, they are being targeted. And it looks like Art may barely have enough. The boys are being pulled. Stace is still not running out. And that was just a huge moment here for Art. Catching that army with the Stasis. He will lose his Immortal. But it's only Stalkers remaining here for Geralt. Only Stalkers left. And Art, he has done it. He's broken the fourth base with a better angle, with a better control there again. Really good target firing on the Archons of Geralt. 
He just picked them away. Just picked them apart. And with these reinforcements, Arch, he's going to go undefeated. Untouchable here. GG gets called. And Arch will take the series 3-0, becoming this week's our very first Sparkling Tuna Cup champion for 2024. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Art. He had an insane run. He had an insane performance here tonight. GG, or this morning even. Um, <laughs> Don't forget to join the match. Sure, you know. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Art for taking it all, for winning it all here and now. GG. And my condolences is a Geralt. Geralt, he's a great player, but PvP, it's a very, very chaotic matchup. PV, as we saw, like, time and time again, especially in Game 1 and Game 2, less so in Game 3, but in the first two games, Geralt, he was just being bamboozled. He was just being thrown for a loop. Just the mental gymnastics that was going on here between the players, the mental battles that was going on where... Arch was kind of luring his opponent in, giving him false information, just making it look like he's going all in or going for some greedy play and just, yeah, completely outmaneuvering Geralt when it comes to the strategies of game one and game two. Um, meanwhile, game three was more straightforward. Game three was a lot more straightforward, which is why it was closer. Game three was a much closer game here. Geralt was able to take an early economic lead, but I will say Art had better fights. He had better engagements. He was able to pick off Stalkers in the lead up to the big fight. He was able to pick off the initial Archon, able to bait out the Overcharge. There was a lot that Art, there's a lot of minute details when it comes to the when it came to the main army engagements that Art was able to come out on top of and was able to excel at. GG, well played. Art will take the entire event here. And again, exclamation mark B. If you guys want to have a look at the bracket and look at their runs. As Art, he was able to bring down Medic Jr. in the first round, took down Azura 2-0, took down Nice 2-0, and took down Geralt 3-0 as well. Fun fact, um, sorry, I'm not familiar with the race of Medic Jr. Okay, Medic Jr. is a Terran, uh, but more of an amateur player. But when it came to all the pro players, Art, he took down purely Protoss. He took down nothing but Protoss here in the quarterfinals, in the semifinals, in the grand finals. Clearly, this is a matchup that Art does excel in. And it's what he relied upon to win the entire tournament. GG. GG, well played. Again, if you want to support this tournament, if you want to support these players, exclamation mark, Macherino. Exclamation mark, Macherino in the chat. And you can fund this tournament, or you can help fund this tournament yourselves. You can help boost the prize pool and help pay out both Geralt and Art. Again, a big shout out to Geralt as well. He had a great run making it to these finals, and he will be walking away with some of that cash or some of that prize money as well, as we do pay out top two players. So Geralt, he does walk away with something, thankfully, uh, despite the, again, despite the rough finals that we hit, that he did have. But again, game game three was a lot closer in general, uh, was much more back and forth. It was just game one and game two that, yeah, Geralt just found himself behind early on. Just found himself behind. Live interview with the winner. True, true. I'll, I'll find. I'll hunt Art down. <laughs> I'll find. I'll find him, Papi. I'll find. Oh, oh no. <laughs> but uh, yeah. With that, congratulations. Uh, if you enjoyed the tournament, by the way, and if you want some more Spike and Tunic Up action, then outside of supporting the event on Match Arena or supporting the event on Patreon, you can see our goals here. Um, you can see our stretch goals on Patreon where we're trying to grow the event to pay out some more prize money to the finalists and try to pay out more prize money to um, the quarter finalists as well. So you can help us grow the event if you, so, if you so choose. We do currently uh, earn 211 USD a month from our Patreon. So thank you so much for all the people that are supporting our tournaments. Um, thank you so much for your support. And again, if you so wish, you can do so uh, if you head on over to our Patreon, you can support us there as well. Uh, but if you want some more Spark and Tuna Cup action, next week. Next week will be the next one. Spark and Tuna Cup for 2023 was a bi-weekly. Every fortnight. Every fortnight we would host this event. But this year in 2024, it's going to be a weekly. 
It's going to be a weekly tournament. Every single week we have you covered with some sparkling tuna cup action. It is an open tournament, and this time slot is an interesting one. It is early for Europe, but when I say early, I mean 10 a.m., so not a bad time. You can see here, plenty of Europeans arrived. It's also not a bad time for Oceania, Southeast Asia, for Korea, for the Southern Hemisphere there, uh, for the, um, again, more Oceanic Hemisphere or Oceanic portion of the world. Um, so that's why we were able to get players like Nice, like Mio Micah, like Kot, um, like Demi as well, and potentially some Koreans. Koreans have competed in this tournament in the past. We've had players like Keen, Nightmare, and Byun. They've all competed in the Sparkling Tuning Cup before. So because of that, we can see a clash of regions. We can see Europeans, but also players from Southeast Asia, rest of Asia, Korea compete as well. We very rarely get um, players from America. I know that this is not the best time for the Americas. It's okay, it's <laughs> but not the best time for the Americas, unfortunately. When I say it's okay, hold on, let's see. Time at PST. It's 4 a.m., so yeah, it's not a good time for the Americas, unfortunately, so we rarely get players from the Americas or from Latin America. It's basically the DGENs. So if uh, if you ever see, like, like Trigger has played before, if you ever see Trigger or if you ever see Vindicta, it's usually because they stayed up until like 3 a.m. to compete. And, uh, and much love, right? Much love to them and much support. Like sometimes they have the passion and the degeneracy uh, to ruin their sleep schedules and play in Sparkling Tuning Cup, but it's more of a rarity. It's more of a rare thing unfortunately but you know hopefully we can uh we can get some of those players rocking up i mean a shout out to some of the americans out there because we had star killer we had a medic junior we did have a, a cup a couple of players from the americans compete tonight so i mean hey it's <laughs> you know they're willing to come out every now and then you know control he played from korea right we have a korean terran we have roselia another korean terran who also competed right like yeah, really nice di diversity here players from all around the world so that's what that's what makes uh sparkling tuning cup a little bit more unique is that uh it is a little bit friendlier for the worldwide player base except for americas kind of smooch <laughs> um so yeah so yeah, with that i mean that's also why we had our tenacious total tussle uh that was an america's only event or america and southeast asia that was a much better time slot for the americas but uh, there was just very little interest. I mentioned before that, unfortunately, our region our region locked biweekly, which was for Latin America, and North America, wasn't really didn't really gain much traction. So, you know that that's why it's on hiatus. Where we're not bringing it back yet in 2024. Um, hopefully we bring it back at some point. It just depends on player interest. That that's what it comes down to. I spoke about this before. But uh, viewership was really good. We had a lot of really good viewership for Tenacious Turtle Tussle and for Grand Pineapple Open. Um, so it's not like we weren't getting interest viewership wise, but uh, player wise, we were like getting four players, right? Like maybe five players, six players, maybe. Like it was, just, yeah, it was, um, it was a struggle. And uh, again, like at the end of the day, we're we're not doing these, we're not hosting these events for, for necessarily viewers. We're hosting them for the players. Um, so that is why, if you're curious, that is why GPO and TTT, Tenacious Total Tussle, that's why they're on hiatus right now. And that is why, with the money that we were spending on those events, we're able to turn Sparkling Tuna Cup into a weekly. So that's that's why this event is a weekly, because this event has, you know, has attention from players and, and has their interest. So that is why we have made that change in 2024, just to be transparent. Just to be transparent and you know maybe one day we can bring back the turtle maybe one day we can bring we can bring back the platypus i would love to um but more likely than not if we do bring back the platypus it would probably be like in another esport like if we do end up casting stormgate or if we do end up casting um zero space or you know another rts and if we do get the interest to invest and start hosting our own tournaments then we would have like i don't know stormgate stormgate edition of like the grand platypus open you know or like year zero edition of like the sanctious total tussle like if if there's if there's interest there and if we're interested if we enjoy the esport as well then then that's what would be happening um yeah there you go just because we just because we we paid for the mascots we paid for the logos and we, we can't use them we can't use them anymore smooch <laughs> aye, aye, aye.
<laughs> Another big returning feature here to our to our schedule. I haven't mentioned this too much, but we have the return of Sea Duckling Open and Master Swan Open as well. You may be wondering, especially if you're a newer viewer, what is the Sea Duckling Open? What's the Master Swan Open? Sea Duckling Open is how we started. It is a bronze to diamond tournament, and we the Cranky Duckling started hosting this event as a weekly back in 2017. We've been running the event for many years. Back in 2017, we started hosting and casting the Sea Duckling Open. And we were running it consistently up until beginning of 2022. 2022, I think around then, maybe started 2023. I think 2022 was our last year. And then we did put it on hiatus just because there was some issues with the Blizzard API. And there was a lot of work and we had to focus on other things. So Sea Duckling Open was put on hiatus. But now we're bringing it back. We're bringing it back here in full swing. So look forward to it. So if you're a player out there, or if you're a viewer, and if you happen to be within the ranges of bronze, diamond, gold, platinum, silver, all those leagues, then you can compete in the Sea Duckling Open. We're bringing it back ah, to grassroots, to diamond players. Let's go, let's go. Fun fact, I am a five-time Sea Duckling. For the, for the longest time, I was uh, I had... I had the, the most championships, the most Sea Duckling Open championships back in the day, back when I was Diamond. Uh, <laughs> way back when. Um, this was back in like 2017, 2018. I have five. I got the first 5DO champion, uh, the 5DO trophy. That's what I got, the 5DO trophy back in the day. Um, and for those of you that are maybe above Diamond and who want to compete and don't want to go up against GMs, we're bringing back the Masters Swan Open. It's in the name, Masters Swan Open, for Masters players. Up to 4.9k MMR. I remember for MSO, I think I was always a Kong. I don't think I ever won an MSO when I hit Masters. Um, but uh, I remember like having some deep runs and getting so close. Uh, getting so close, Papi. I don't think I ever won an MSO though, but um, just wasn't meant to be. Just choked in the finals. Um but Master Swan Open is going to be coming back again up to 4.9k MMR if you guys are interested for Masters players. Basically, Masters 3, Masters 2. We may adjust the MMR because nowadays 4.9 is GM. Um, like the MMR ranges have changed. So we may adjust some of the MMR there. Uh, but regardless, it's mainly focused on Masters 3 and Masters 2 players. So that's what um, MSO is for. It is open to diamond, platinum, gold as well. So if, if you're a lower league, that you can still compete in MSO. Just a higher caliber of players there. So it's a, it's a little bit more it's a little bit more dangerous for you, Fabi. A little bit more dangerous. <laughs> but we are bringing those tournaments back this year in 2024. Again, there have been a lot of people asking for it. They're like, "What's been for years? We've been playing in this tournament. When, when is it coming back?" And we're like, "Oh, soon, TM." It is now soon, TM. It is now time. It's now time to bring back our amateur events. Again, going back to how we started back in 2017. Back to how we did start. So look forward to it. Look forward to it. Um, they're open to any region. So they're open to all regions. Just region locked up by MMR and by rank. So uh, just bear that in mind. Look forward to it. Do look forward to it. Otherwise, with that, we are not quite done for the day. Another special thing that we do here on the Cranky Ducklings is, if you're in the chat, you can redeem a replay cast. With your channel points, you can redeem a replay cast, and I, I will put myself down, and I will cast your, re your ladder game. I'll cast your ladder games, Poppy. I'll cast your ladder games. Um, and, yeah, we do have a couple of replays redeemed. I say a couple. We have six so far. I mean, I think we have seven, but we'll be going over six for now. We do have some replays that have been redeemed over the past couple of weeks. So we will be going into a cast. We're going to be going on a short break when we come back. Hold on, I'll show you. You, you can see him. You can see him, Bobby. Where is he? Go from here. There. Look, look under my face. Oh, there we are. Oh, duckling viewer replays. Oh. <laughs> He's so beautiful. The duck. <laughs> So uh, we're going to be going on a short break. I need some time to get some water. Just take a take a moment to rest. I'm going to set up all the overlays, set up all the replays, and we are going to be going over some of the viewer submitted replays in the chat. And we'll be having some fun. We'll be having a more chill stream. If you're only interested in pro players, sometimes we have pro players that redeem replays. 
fun fact that that has happened <laughs> many times actually players like night phoenix or players like demi players like uh hone mono like sometimes we uh, sometimes we have replays or oh, trigger trigger he's redeemed replays before um sometimes they redeem them but for the most part just some lovely viewers in the chat you know some diamond players platinum masters so not the most serious of games not the most highest level of competitiveness but uh some fun games nonetheless yeah usually if a replay is redeemed it's because it's some cheese like there's some <laughs> like there, there's some there's some nonsense but there's some nonsense going on and uh and i have to watch it <laughs> i have to i have to bear witness to the cheese and to to the to the craziness that's ensuing regardless thank you for watching thank you for watching everyone thank you for watching thank you for the support we're going to be going on a short break and when we return we'll be back with some duckling viewer replays see you soon until then hasta luego Chao, papi, chao. Hasta luego, papi. Hasta luego.
welcome back everyone welcome back to another edition of something different something special of a duckling viewer replay craft i do apologize for uh i do apologize for the extended break just had to try to sort some things out had to sift through the replays had to organize them in some way shape or form <laughs> and have been able to do so here just in time to bring you some amazing community viewer starcraft action again not the highest level of play so again we're not here to be too uh too nitpicky we're not here to uh criticize too much or anything like that we're here to just enjoy the games have some fun maybe give a little bit of feedback maybe give some some nice feedback where we can uh but again we're not we're not gonna be harping on too much we're not gonna be harping on too many mistakes or anything like that that's not what we do that's not what we are about but as we get ready for this, a big shout out to the people in the chat. A big shout out to Holy Lime 23 Thank you so much for subscribing with Twitch Prime for 13 months. Over a year of support. Gracias, baby. Gracias. Ah, hold on. At Holy. At Holy Lime. Ah, thank you so much for the support. We do appreciate it. We do appreciate the support. Gracias, baby. Gracias. As, as I do. I tried to give some love in the chat. Beautiful. Beautiful. Why are, you trying, why, are you trying everyone, why are you trying to show everyone my embarrassing ladder games? Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. We have some fun here. We have some, some fun. You know, maybe there's there's something that we point out here and there, but for the most part, we, we, we chill. Like, we chill. Love these cars. Find people at my level getting down in the dirt. Oh, let's go. Edison didn't, fa didn't fail to make a light bulb 10,000 times. He found 999 ways that didn't work. True. <laughs> Just have to think about it in a different light. Exactly, exactly. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, here we go. We do have our first set of replays. I say set of replays because Soundo, our lovely Protoss player in the chat, has redeemed three replays. Three replays have been redeemed featuring Soundo, so we're going to go through them one after the other. First up is going to be a PVT between Soundo and Frosty. It's going to be on... Radis Station. Oh, but you're an animal. <laughs> veto this map. I mean, you're a Protoss player. I guess you don't need to veto it. True, true. You don't need to veto the map, but crazy for the Terran to embrace Radis Station. We haven't cast this map in a couple of weeks, but thanks to the viewer replays, we can embrace it. On top of that, Sounder has recently been improving. Sounder for many, for a long time, was a gold player, but recently promoted to platinum. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, Sounder. Recently did, repro did promote. Recently did rank up. Vamanos. Now a newly formed platinum player. You do love to see it. And here he is in the bottom left-hand corner of Razza Station. We have our Australian Protoss. The red Protoss representing Clan Budair. It is Soundo. Here we go. And spawning in the top right-hand corner, we have a spawner. We have... Oh, wait. Here we, go. we have... The Blue Terran, the Blue Terran player, currently teamless, clanless, it is Frosty. Not too familiar with this opponent, but I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Happy to bear witness to what the hell happened. I mean, already we're on Radis' station, so already it's, it's all out the window. It's a <laughs> nonsense can ensue. For those who maybe are unaware, uh, because I wouldn't blame you for not seeing too many games on this map, Radis Station is the most vetoed map in the map pool. We're going for a forge. Oh my, we are setting up for a cannon rush. We have a forge here on the high ground. Now, the reason why this is the most vetoed map, the natural base has a ramp leading into it. No Reaper Cliff into the main. No Reaper Cliff into the natural. We have a pocket base. No Reaper Cliff here either. So a very secure three-base setup. We have a fourth base as well that only has one main attack path, which is here on the right-hand side. So just a very, de very defendable four-base setup here for any kind of player. This does mean that a Protoss, for example, can rush into Skytoss, a Terran can embrace Mech, you can be as greedy as possible. Recently at IEM, uh, Spirit did play against Solar on this map, and Spirit, he went for a 4cc before Starport. It was an insanely greedy build. It was crazy how much greed Spirit got. I think it was a 4cc before Factory, actually. Like, it was, it was crazy. It was actually crazy what he was doing, and he got away with it. Because it's Radis' station. Again, you can you can just do stuff like that. Meanwhile, Sound is kind of rushing. <laughs> Sound is kind of rushing. It is going to be a Rax expand out of Frosty. Not a CC first. The first cannon is done. We're 
leapfrogging forward question mark i don't think we needed to um we could have just gone straight for the cannon here at the natural to be honest but we are leapfrogging forward step by step here towards the main base reaper does move out reaper missed the probe and we are working our way towards the production uh oh again i feel like looking at the vision we could have started in the main to be honest or at least started the natural then into the main we could have been a little bit more proactive with this i think we were a little bit too conservative with how we were approaching the cannon rush but uh it is upon us we're going for a marauder opener okay very interesting Me meanwhile reaper he does get across the map the wall does nothing here against the reaper we do get into the main base probes are going to be going down damage is being dealt cannons are still on the way and we're not really threatening anything as we do threaten a cannon at the natural zealot on the chase this reaper so far getting one probe i believe oh now two two probes do go down cannons are finishing up and now we see now we have eyes on the cannons and we have marauders not bad actually the marauder can just chunk away at this cannon it's going to be going down in the natural lol <laughs> as boys are being pulled but we already have a cannon here in the main only one though only one cannon good target firing by soundo does focus down that marauder he will get a kill but we get a we get a surround the boys have been pulled cannon supporting from the low ground though does support from the low ground scvs are falling it's gonna be seven dead scvs so far but we will gain control of the main base Cannons and pylons are falling here. I do think that Soundo, we could have committed a little bit harder. I mean, it, like, it want to be a little bit critical. Soundo, we have 900 minerals. We could have thrown down more cannons. We could have thrown down a better setup here in the main. It is cleaned up, and Frosty is holding on to his main base. But he is down to seven. He's down to nine SCVs. Ay, ay, ay. We deny the natural, and the economic damage was brutal. Even though Soundo, I think, could have achieved a lot more and could have ended the game with this cannon rush, regardless, we are in a better position. So, in the end, a successful cannon rush could have been more successful, is what I will say, as we, don't have, we do not have high ground vision. Could have been more successful, but regardless, has dealt a lot of damage. Regardless, has put Soundo in a good position economically. But Frosty does have a natural base, and he is making two SCVs at a time. No orbital, unfortunately, but regardless, two workers at a time, Frosty can catch up. Cannons are being shot down. The Zealot has arrived, but so far, decent kiting here from Frosty. We can focus on that Zealot. Zealot will fall. Meanwhile, it looks like the Reaper fell as well, um, as it, it did come back home, if I recall correctly. And where do we go from here? Sounder, we have no warp gates. No warp gate research. We have three gateways back at home. Gases are being taken. Because the gas production is so late, I'm assuming Proxy Stargate. I, I think that's what Soundo likes to do. I think he likes the cannon rush into Stargate, if I remember correctly, uh, for Proxy Void Ray. I imagine. <laughs> Second gas guys are on the way. We're throwing down the cannons initially, but this should be for Proxy Stargate. Proxy Tempest? We'll see it all. We're stuck. Sound. <laughs> Sound, no. We get stuck on the other side. There we go. Gateway gets thrown down. But I feel like from here, with the completed Cybercore, we can take up either Proxy Stargate or Proxy Robo. Both are viable. Both are viable. As Frosty, he's setting up with three Raxes. Working towards Stim. He already has Combat Shields. Already has Concussive Shell. Interesting that we delayed Stim for so long. Shield Battery on the way. And again, what is our plan? Ooh, Twilight Council. That is not something that on the forefront of my mind. I was thinking like Robo or Stargate, 100%. But no, it's going to be a Twilight Council. DTs? Mm, I, I, DTs are okay, but we have scans is a problem. We have an eBay on the way, so we have access to turrets. Dark Templar would be an interesting choice. Could work, definitely. Especially if Frosty doesn't throw down safety turrets. And if he doesn't hold on to his... Into, onto his energy right because he lost so many workers he has to mule hard so it's possible he may not have scans available if we go dark templar no there it is charge is on the way i mean we have a thousand minerals mate we can spend it true just warp in zealots so it's gonna be one base four gate charge here from soundo oh boy let's go <laughs> As we are going to be massing up zealots here at the natural. 
There we go, going for a big warp in the Zealots. More gateways are on the way, getting up to a 6 gate setup. Honestly, Sounder, we could expand. We have the money to expand behind this, but we're going to be committing. It's all or nothing here for Sounder. Meanwhile, when it comes to the Terran player, we have a decent bio army. We have a bunker on the low ground. True. Um, but we are lacking any kind of backbone to the army. There's no tanks, for example. We're going for a reactor on the factory. We're not going to have any tanks. We may have some Widow Mines if we want to head in that direction. But it looks like Frosty wants to go into an add-on swap into Metamac production. It's hard. It's sometimes it's difficult making a call like that when casting an amateur player. But there we go. We are going for the add-on swap. So we're going for a, a drop. We're setting up for a bio drop here. Plus one is about to finish. And this means that we don't have any winter mines, no tanks, no splash damage to deal with the zealots. This is ideal for Sounder. Ooh, the bunker salvaged! Bunker does get salvaged. Zealots, they come in just in time! We head straight for the mineral line. SVs are going down. Late reaction here by Frosty. Does have stim. And the zealots, they collapse here on the marines. We stim on forward. We stim on back. We try to kite, but these zealots, they're wreaking havoc here. They go into town and they clean up every single unit on the ground again. No widow mines, no tanks, no bunker. And Frosty gets cleaned up. And Soundo, he has done it. He's broken the army. He's can be the production. GG gets called. He throws down the GG. Let's go. Scanning across the map, trying to figure out what happened. He does now realize he just was at one base charge all in. Oh, the boys are being pulled, and Soundo will take the game. <laughs> GG. GG, well played. Again, it was a pretty successful cannon rush. I do think that if we had committed a bit, I mean, we had the money to commit harder. If we had committed a little bit harder, we would have had, instead of one cannon finishing, like a wave of cannons finishing, and then Sounder would have been able to slowly push forward into the main camp of the production and end the game solely with the cannon rush. There was potential there. There was potential. But I do think it took a while to really get going and to really come into its, into its own. Um... Regardless, the follow-up, uh, again, was fortunate. Very fortunate that that Frosty happened to be salvaging his bunker, happened to be avoiding tanks and Widowmine production, only a bio-composition without any support. There's a lot that lined up. There's a, The stars aligned for Soundo to take the game on Radisson right Station. Let's go. <laughs> but also, you know, a solid follow-up as well. Um, was able to close it out in the end. GG. GG. Well played. You're an animal. You're disgusting for cannon rushing, but... At the same time, you know, Frosty didn't veto Radisson Station. <laughs> so maybe, you've, maybe you conducted a, ser a service. Maybe you're pushing Frosty to the point where he will just veto Radisson Station and we don't have to deal with, with any kind of nonsense. That maybe. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. Shout out to Frosty, by the way. GG well played. With that, that is our first ladder game in the book. So we have many more available here. Sounder, he redeemed three replays in total. And up next, we have Sando in another PVT against Edumax. Edumax. I call him Max. Here we go. It is going to be PVT on Site Delta. Here we go. PVTs do continue. Oh, and here we go. It is going to be... Again, on a side delta and spawning in the top left-hand corner of side delta, we have our Australian Protoss, our red Protoss player, a viewer in the chat. He's lurking, or he's chilling there in the chat as well. The red Protoss representing Clan Bud Air. It is Sounder. Recently promoting to Platinum. And spawning in, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the blue Terran player. We have the blue Terran. It is Edumax. Edumax? Edumax? Max. It's Max. <laughs> Let's go. And we'll see how Sounder does open up because that is a very interesting pylon placement. Very interesting. Okay, so something about PVT. We, we can we can talk about some of the basics here. Uh or some of the some of the fundamentals of the matchup. Is that typically in a PVT you would open up with your additional gateways in a couple of different locations. Um the most common one is to wall off the Reaper Cliff. You know, there is a Reaper Cliff in most maps, not on Radisson Station, but on most maps, to get into your main base. And there is benefit here to throwing down your initial pylon and walling off this cliff 
it can be difficult. There is a bit of a learning curve to walling off on every different on every single map because every map is different. Um, a shout out to Gemini. Gemini, he's a very active community member. He does post on all things Star all things Protoss, uh, which is a Reddit. It's a Reddit, a subreddit out there. And every season, he posts imager links and albums of wall off guides for every single map in the current map pool. So in the current ladder map pool. So that's something worth looking into um, just so you can uh, be aware on how to open up and how to wall off against Reapers on maps like South Delta, maps like Oceanborn, or maps out there. So uh, big shout out to Gemini. If you are an upcoming Protoss, if you want to learn how to wall off, then there are guides available for every map. Meanwhile, we do have a double gas opener out of Edumax. Uh, it's going to be going forward to Rack's follow-up. This is a... This is a bit odd. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Interesting. Are we gonna be three raxing? Um, if we are, we don't need two gases for that, is what I will say. So yeah, very interesting build. It looks like a setup for one base all in. There we go. Three third raxes on the way. It's gonna be a one base all in from our Terran player. Meanwhile, Sounder back at home. Ooh, did end up taking a bit of a loss there, but okay, did kill an SCV. Going for a forge follow up, and are we setting up a proxy? Show us the proxy Stargate. Show us the void rays. Let's go. Forge is on the way. Um, there is benefit when it comes to walling off in your mineral line as well, to be fair. Uh, as you can, of course, create some SimCity and create a trap as well and hide your tech with your secondary pylon. Meanwhile, Sounder throwing down his proxy across the map. And there it is. There's a Stargate. Proxy Void Raid. We're back to 2021. Let's go. <laughs> now, to be fair, to give Sounder a bit of credit... Proxy Void Ray has made a resurgence in this most recent patch, but the Reaper's a scouts, and Max confirms. He's going three racks mass Reaper. Wait, what? <laughs> I, sorry, I, I, I thought it was going to be, uh, I thought we were going to get into tech labs and head into like a stim or like concussive shell, but no, it's going to be three racks mass Reaper with reactors as well. Oh my God. What does this mean? Nothing shoots up. We need Marines. We need Marines, Poppy. We need, we need anything else. Um, Reapers, they will slowly work their way through these shield batteries, but a Void Ray is on the way and nothing shoots up? Uh-oh. Uh, we have a Bunker Rush across the map. Let's go. We're going for the Artosis Pylon, but there, there's a the backup Pylon on the way. Shield Battery does barely keep that Pylon alive a little bit longer. The Pylon is going to go down. The Void Ray won't come out. Stargate is depowered. We go for the second Pylon as well. Ooh, we're not target firing. We're going for the wrong Pylon. We're going for the wrong pylon. This one is not powering the Stargate. It's going to be going down, but the Void Ray finishes. Ah, missed targeting here by Max. The wrong pylon got targeted, and there we go. The Void Ray does arrive. That dead pylon could have been this one, and the Void Ray would not have come out. And maybe Max wins. Marines have arrived. Ooh, getting a lot of hull damage done. But the shield batteries, they finish. They're repowered. And this proxy is well underway. Here we go. We do have a good amount of Marines. No bunker, which is concerning. Now, what I was going to say, as the Reapers, they get across the map. Go for the mineral line. There we go. They head for the mineral line. They, oh, the, sorry. They're going for the pylon. Looking to depower these gateways. Not the most important gateway, I'll be honest, but we'll be depowering at least some of this. Again, chaos is ensuing. Bunker is on the way. I was going to say that Proxy Void Ray has made a restrictions in the in pro in pro play this patch because of the cyclone. Because the cyclone was changed, because the cyclone has significantly less range than it used to, Proxy Void Ray has been seen again by players like Hero, Classic, Nice, the Korean Protosses. They sprinkled it in. It was very trendy in December. So if you're watching back in December, you would have seen these kind of variations by pro players. Um, all across the month, but it has died off. It has died off. Terran players, they adjusted. They got better at defending. Sando going for a ninja base. As he's losing control of the main. Again, Max, he could be killing probes here, but he's going for pylons. So, Sando has an economy. Like, he has a decent economy right now. It has been pretty undisturbed. As what is it? Head into the main. We head into the main base. SCVs are going down. Late reaction here by Max. No. And the Reapers again. They're killing pylons. They're killing gateways. But they're not really doing any, any meaningful damage is the problem. As we have killed 10 SCVs. Max down to 9 workers. 
Reapers are coming back home. And Sounder, he annihilates the economy. He is in control of this game. With those three Void Rays, now a fourth Void Ray on the way. Sounder committing to his proxy, to his ninja base. Here we go. Now, when it came to those Reapers, I'm pretty sure we could hold position the Reapers and we could kill the gas mining probes. I'm pretty sure we can reach these gas mining workers. And uh, again, Max may be just not aware of that. So they're able to get up and running and we're able to maintain void rate production. Like these Reapers haven't done anything to the economy here whatsoever. Not yet. You know, once again, they're focusing down the gateway. Aye, aye, aye. And back at home, we're still on marine production. We are going for the starport for Vikings. Let's go. That is all we need. Okay, we're just going to fall. Void Ray is rotating back in. Once again, going for the mineral line. There are Marines lying in wait. They're in position. Ah, but we're going to town here. One Void Ray goes down. Good target firing by Max. Oh, but he only gets one Void Ray. And we snowball out of control. The Marines, they go down. As we can see here, Marines... They are not ideal against Void Rays, not Vanilla Marines, not without Stim. And Sounder, he cripples the economy once again. Well, big overextension though, Sounder! Not paying attention, we'll be losing another Void Ray and maybe even another. Oh, oh, so close, does barely escape. Meanwhile, Max is down to seven SCVs. Has four in the main base. There are others here, like at the production. Yeah, going back to mining. The economy is still untouched. Finally! Oh, kind of though. No. We have the whole position. Overcharge is popped. Free gas geysers. Go for the gas geysers instead. And again, Sounder, he's already got another base up and running, so he can still sustain himself. Sounder, he has a lot of money right now. Um, what he could do is throw down a fleet beacon and go into Tempest. He could throw down a second Stargate. There's a lot that we could do here to spend our money. So, Sounder, biggest criticism here when you're in this when you're getting into this position and when you notice you have a bank. Production, Papi. Additional Stargates, right? You can make three void rays at a time. You can just out produce your opponents as every void ray goes down. We've reset the void ray counts. Max, he still has a chance. He is up in army supply. He can push. If he unloads these marines, pushes out with the void with the void rays, he can shut this position down. He can camp the production 100 percent He can camp this Stargate. And the reality is that Sounder doesn't have warp gate. No warp gate, no warp ins, no reinforcements. This is his only unit. This is Sounder's only unit here. We can be a little bit more proactive as... Oh, we're going to try and work our way through that bunker. And the bunker is going to go down. Oof. Shield battery is still maintaining this void ray, by the way. We kill another Viking. And we're being forced back. And now that one void ray turning into two. We're just building up that void ray count. Again, we could... Definitely, if uh, we're throwing down, I don't, I'm not liking the gateways because we don't even have warp gates. There we go, warp gate now on the way. We uh, just, 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 just go sky toss, Bobby, you know? Just just send it. Throw down the fleet beacon, throw down two more stargates, just just ape it up. Why not? <laughs> Why not, Bobby? As we're getting up to 2k minerals. I, 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 we, we have so much money, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know, unironically. It's fine. Void Ray is going to go down. A few more additional gateways on the way. We get a gas guys will finally picked up. Not quite the other. Uh, how many gateways are we working with? We have four already. We're about to have four more. Eight gates in total. Warp gate finally about to finish up. We can finally spend our money soon. Let's go. Let's go, buddy. Let's go. We'll soon be able to spend our money. I think the thought process here for Soundo is that because Void Rays are dying, he's like, Void Rays are not the answer. And because there are Vikings, he's like, what can Vikings not do? They can't really shoot down unless they land. May as well just charge it up, right? Just go mass charge lots. I mean, there's no charge, unfortunately, so they're going to be slow lots. But you know, regardless, we'll soon be able to spend our money. Let's go. Let's 
Let us go. Yo, shout out to Sounder, letting us know that uh, recently he did promote to Diamond. Ah, let's go. Diamond, fuck. That's crazy because um, I think it was like a couple of months ago or like a couple of weeks ago, Sounder, he was still in gold. He's shooting up. He's learning. He's improving. Let's go. As the Void Rays, they do get pounced upon here by the Vikings. Once again, the Void Rays are going to be going down. Oof. But we have some slow lots. The slow lots, they're waddling in. The wall is not a wall. We can, we can just walk in. And what do we have to work with? We have four Marines. The bunker is done, though. The Zelts are filing on in. The Vikings, they land. The Vikings, they do land in time. The Zelts are going to be cleaned up. Oh, boys are being pulled. I don't think that was the most necessary thing as our high CVs are falling as well. So we lost 18 workers. We're down to 11 SCVs here for Max. Ay ay ay. Sounder taking a third. Taking another base. Working towards Immortals. There's a Twilight Council. There's Charge on the way. Yeah, we could have gotten here a little, quite a bit faster, but it's, it's fine. It's fine. As else, they walk in once again. With a better angle in that bunker. Going for the Vikings, though. They get one Viking. Not the best trade here for Sounder. Getting one Viking and, like, two SCVs. Oof. Does get the bunker. Does get a heal in the bunker. And it looks, it looks like just over time, in the Battle of Attrition, Max, he's just running out of steam, running out of money. Barely has an economy. Even if these are inefficient trades, and they are inefficient trades by Sounder... Looks like it's it's just too much anyway. Just too much to handle. Immortals have arrived. Remember, this also started with Max going three racks Reaper like with a bunker rush. Like it was crazy. <laughs> Nonsense. Oh my god. As we waddle into the main base, we go for the bunker. Immortals going ham. Vikings forced to land. And they're just getting annihilated by the immortals. Yeah, we will clean up every single Viking. Widowmine rocks up. Up. Oh, doesn't borrow in time. And the Immortals, they are bunker busters. They don't care about your bunkers. Not at all. As we stutter step forward, we came to the production. GG gets called. Our Terran has been broken. And Sounder going to be able to take another game. As he focuses down the factory as well. GG gets called. Sounder takes. Crazy. <laughs> GG. I would say the proxy void ray is a lot more sane compared to the cannon rush that we saw on Rise of the Station. It is a lot more sane. Uh, once again, though, the, the macro is, is, is something that, need, that needs to be worked on, but does work in the end. GG. GG. Uh, both players were banking actually towards the end there. Both players were struggling in their own ways. And the question becomes, what kind of nonsense are we going to be seeing in Game 3? Okay. <laughs> we, okay, we've had a Cannon Rush. We've had Void Rays. Proxy Void Ray. What are we missing? What are we missing? Like a like a 4-gate? Like a 4-gate Zealot all-in? Is that what we're missing? We'll find out. We're loading into Alcyone. Let's go. Ooh, it's going to be a PvZ. Okay, a different race this time. Different matchup. We go. As we're getting into game number three of now a PVZ. And spawning in the bottom left hand corner of Alkion, and we have our red Protoss representing Clan Potter, the Australian Protoss. It is Sound. <laughs> and spawning in the top right, we have his opponent. We have the blue Zerg player. Finally, not a PVT. It is going to be a Zerg player instead. Ooh. Representing Clan EQ, it is Riddick. I have not seen all the Chronicles of Riddick movies. Does not happen. Yo, Sounder go for expansion. Now, I'm a little bit concerned that I hope that Sounder has changed his ways. In this matchup, very often, Sounder goes for a Forge expand. He goes for a Forge expand here, which is 
very, very old school, or a gate force, or even very old school, very out of meta. Um, it's like very Wings of Liberty, like first year of Heart of the Swarm sort of thing. Um, a Forge Fox expand used to be a thing back in Heart of the Swarm. So I'm hoping that Soundo isn't going for it here uh, in this PVZ. As I say that, it is going to be a pull first. Interesting. Okay, so it's going to be a pull first opener out of Riddick against, I imagine, a gate expand from Soundo. So we'll see how aggressive we want to be. This may just be a safe opener from our Zerg player, but uh, we'll see as the drone is being sent out and we should be expanding. Yeah. So, okay, so it's going to be just a, a pull into expand, pull hatch opener into gases. Just a safe way to play. Gases have been delayed. As a result, this is going to lead into late link speed. We could decide to go into roaches. That could be on the table here for Riddick, just because of how late the gases are. That is going to be available. Oh, let's go. Gate expand into the Cybercore. No forge. Let's go. We've broken the chain. Really? That's why Sounder promoted? No, never mind. <laughs> I spoke too soon. I spoke too soon as... Uh, as the forge is on the way, Shay, I, 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 I. Yeah, this is a, this is a habit that Sounder has, and every time Sounder does that, I'm like, man, you don't need this. This is hurting you more than anything. It's slowing you down. Um, it's just a really safe way to play, I guess, because it gives you cannons early on to defend against like rushes and all ins. Um, but it is very inefficient. It is a very inefficient build here from Sounder. As Riddick is going for his third, now taking his gases. Uh, he has the option to skip Link Speed if he so chooses, so we'll see if Riddick does go for a faster Roach Warren. As Soundo is following this up with a Stargate. Again, this Stargate could have been earlier if we didn't invest into this Cannon and Forge. <laughs> like we just, we just need like an Adept here to hold to like on hold position. We're fine. We're fine, Sparky. Wolf Gate on the way. We go. As pylons are being thrown down, do have a shield battery on the way? Interesting. Are we setting up like a like a shield battery, like kind of fortification here? <laughs> are we going to throw down shield batteries and go void ray? Let's see. Stargate is up. Are we going for the void ray? We need those shield batteries, right? Yeah, there it is. Void ray is on the way. And this pylon is to support the void rays. If I'm reading this correctly. Meanwhile, Riddick hasn't thrown down any tech. Um, Riddick, no Roach Warren. He now has enough for Ling Speed. He now has the gas for it. But again, just really late gases. Wait, did he cancel? Wait, what? He canceled the base. You can see here, uh, Riddick, he canceled the third base, going for a macro hatch instead. Ling Speed is on the way. Riddick misreading this a little bit here. Maybe he thought he was being cannon rushed. I, I, I'm not so sure. But you can see that he hasn't lost anything, but he's lost minerals. So he did cancel the third. Ah, oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> so uh, a bit of a rough start here for Riddick. Meanwhile, across the map, Void Ray has arrived. We have additional Void Rays on the way. We're going for a Twilight Council. Okay. So we're not throwing down shield batteries. We're not setting up like a like a, like a station here, a healing station for the Void Rays. This looks like charge, mm, but we have a lot of gas. We're working with a lot of... This is too much gas if you really wanted to sustain charge lots just because they don't take any gas. I guess if we wanted to go charge lot mass void ray, maybe? We'll see. We shall see. Show us the charge. Silent Council is done. Void rays are still amassing. Yeah, charge is going to be on the way. So it looks like a two base charge void ray all in from Soundo. And Riddick is woefully underprepared. Um... No third base, so his economy is stifled. No third base, so his production is less than ideal. I mean, he has a macro hatch, I guess, but he doesn't really have the economy to sustain himself. Uh, he's going into four gases. Is he going roaches? If he goes Hydra, he may, he may just fall over. Um, <laughs> as a pilot is going to be shut down. There we go. Roach Warren is on the way. Two base Roach for Riddick against a two base all-in is not ideal. Um... Yeah, Riddick, he's, he's in a really rough position here. His droning is lackluster. He's not saturated at his natural. Fleet Beacon going to be on the way. I don't think we need it. I don't think Sounder needs to spice things up with Tempest or Carriers. I think, like, Void Ray Charge 
will be enough. Um, but, you know, we're here for style points. <laughs> we're here for some style points from Soundo. Going for charge lots. Void rays are moving out. So war is that natural. How many queens do we have? Six. Oh, good queen count. Good queen count here from Riddick. Now going for the lair. Ooh. Six minute lair timing. Very late here considering we're playing two base. The void ray. Yeah, we have arrived. Do we have a chance to use? We do. We barely keep that queen alive. Clutch chance to use there from Riddick. Let's go. We keep the queens alive. We focus down one of the void rays. We are holding. We do hold for the time being. Zell said breaking free. We may just choose to expand. As it is, that second Stargate. And it is going to be double Stargate Phoenix. Sorry, double Stargate Tempest. So it is going to be a Tempest Rush. We are on the way. If the Queen Count stays low, these Tempests, they can go to town. Oh, as we throw away our first, our second, and our third Void Ray. Rough losses here. The Void Rays, they have value. If we kept them alive, we could have shut down these links, could have maintained map control, we could have denied the third. We could have been containing Riddick on two bases this entire time. But, uh, yeah, we, we did throw away the Void Rays. Ah, a bit of a funada for Sounder, not gonna lie. <laughs> void Rays are thrown away, but um, we are building up towards Tempest, and so far they are unscouted. Riddick, he hasn't been able to get into the main base. He has a lair, but no Overseer scouts, so is in the dark. Has Overlord speed. Again, he should be sending an Overlord into the main. Meanwhile, Lings, they do flood in. Big moment here for Riddick. Gets into the main base and he will get eyes on the on the Fleet Beacon. Sees the Fleet, Fleet Beacon. He sees the Stargate. Sees the Tempest. He sees everything. But does he react? No. Oh, that's the question right now. The Lings, they see everything they need to. We are flooding Lings across the map. But we need a, a, a Spire. We need a Spire or a Hydrogen. Either or could work. We have no reaction. Oh, boy. I mean, we, we saw what we needed to. Like, right? Like, <laughs> I have to put this on Riddick. He saw everything he needed to. And no Queens. No extra Spores. No extra Queens. No Tech. Oh, boy. This is, uh, this is a little bit scary. Now, he has a little bit of time. Um, Soundo, he's chilling back at home. He hasn't pulled the trigger yet. Tempest, they're amassing here in the corner of the map. There it is. Hydrogen on the way. And Infestation Pit. Okay. Riddick, he is working towards some anti-air. Hydras are not ideal. The reason why is that Hydras, they get outranged and they get outpositioned. Um, Tempest, as long as you babysit the Tempest, and depending on your movement on the map, it's possible that you may not have to lose a single one against Hydras. So, I'm not fond of the Hydra choice. But you can make it work. We have seen Dark, for example, be in positions where the the Tempest move in. And if, for example, if the Tempest move in towards a third base, Dark, he backs off, he rotates around, and he does surround the Tempest from behind with his Hydras, making sure that they're lured in and making sure he just comes in at a better angle to shut them down, to catch them and make sure they can't get away. Um, so there is a way to work with Hydras against Tempest, especially if you're Tempest rushing. But it's difficult. It's difficult at night, and we'll see if Riddick can, can be up for the task. Asano is pushing in towards that main. Oh no, we're making roaches! We have 25 roaches in production, no hydras. It feels like Riddick didn't really uh didn't really take note of what he had seen. It didn't really sink in because uh the tempers are here and there's no hydras. Tempest, they have arrived. Shelling away at the queen. Yeah, we're going to be able to pick up the queens, the gas guys, the hatchery as well. Uh, now there are hydras in production, and this may just force the all in. There we go. Riddick, he's just sending it across the map. What are we walking into? A wall of cannons, shield batteries. Do we have much of a ground army? Not really. We have robos on the way. We have a handful of zealots. Riddick, he could kill the third, but he's losing everything else. We recall! We didn't need to, but we do recall back home. We're afraid of the all-in. Sound, he's afraid of the all-in. He recalls back home. Again, kiting definitely could have been made use of there. In the main. That's really, he's pushing in towards the third base. The Tempest are here to defend. 
We are here to defend. Zelsa collapse on these roaches. A good trade here for Sando. As the roaches aren't all here to defend, are they, they aren't all there to work together. Picks apart the army. And every roach is going to go down. Efficient trade here by Sando. Yeah, as he's working towards Skytos. Carriers, Void Rays on the way. Immortals being produced as well. We up to five Tempest. Let's go. <laughs> Let us go. Oh no, we have more replays being redeemed. <laughs> I saw in the chat, more replays are being redeemed. Ay, ay, ay. Not like this. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put him in the queue. We'll put, we'll put him in the queue, Bobby. We'll put him in the queue. Uh-huh. Asana gonna be taking a fourth. Uh, Zella Ramai gonna be running into the main army. Won't get much. Does get a queen. Does get a second queen. Not bad. Got that here by Soundo. Does catch the queens. We do see Riddick, though, amassing a more Hydra-based army. So he's gonna have a little bit more success with this. Um, what I will say, though, is that the upgrades are lacking. We only have plus on range. We, despite getting the infestation bit, no hive. No hive here. No vipers, no spellcasters. These Hydras, they aren't looking too imposing. Um, especially pushing into a defensive line, into Tempest. Sando, as long as we can kite, we should be okay. But he's rallying his reinforcements towards the corner of the map. The Mist Rally! No, we need the army here. We need everything here to defend. There we go. They do turn back around. Hydras, they still have a step forward. Can we get on top of the Tempest? Overcharge is popped. Immortal's going to be going down. And it looks like we will get on top of at least one Tempest. But we're bleeding out too many Hydras. We're bleeding out too much. Ah, uh, the Tempest barely survives. We clean up all the Hydras and Riddick. He just rams his face into a brick wall. Into a wall of Protoss. And he will lose everything. And yeah, now Sando can counter attack. I'll get rid of the Tuna. I'll, I'll fix that for the next game. <laughs> the Tuna, we're chilling. We're listening to beats by Dre. Sounder, he is just breaking through across the map. Snowballing out of control. There's just not enough here. Only a handful of Hydras. Only a handful of units. And the Sky Toss, it's snowballing out of control here. We can maybe focus down one more Tempest. Yeah, we got one Tempest. Oh, we're going to get a second. Two Tempest, not bad, but G. <laughs> GG. As Sando will take the game, will snowball out of control and take down Riddick. GG. GG, well played. Again, a bit of a chaotic game there. Um, again, we have to fun out at Riddick a little bit because he did scout. Like, he, his Ling Flood did do quite a lot there when it came to confirming what Sando was up to. But, uh, yeah, the reaction wasn't quite there. It looks like maybe we didn't really see what the Ling saw and uh, we weren't able to react in time. The Hydras were late, and by the time they came out, again, we had already lost so many Roaches. The army was already crippled. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations, Soundo. Like, a big shout to Soundo because, um, even though he does nothing but cheese, um, he was the gold for a long time. He was gold for years, Bappy, for years. And in recent months, he has risen the ranks from gold into platinum. And now he did say in the chat that he's Diamond 3, so... Despite the years of being stuck in gold, like he has been improving quite a bit these past uh, these past couple of months. So, do love to see it. Much love, much support in the chat. So, congratulations on on ranking up. Congratulations ah, on promoting. That's it. That's what I was looking for. Congratulations on promoting. GG. GG. <laughs> With that, we are getting ready here for our next wave of matches. So that is the end of Sounders replays and we're getting into Frost. Frost, of course, uh, she's been redeeming replays for quite some time. Every every now and then, every couple of months, we do get a batch of Frost replays. And uh, Frost has been spicing up a little bit here. Frost's main race is Terran, but it looks like we even have a ZVZ replay. Okay, let's go. <laughs> let's dive into a ZVZ between Frost and danger. Vaminos. Let's go. Uh, 
Let's go. It's catching up in the chat. Beats by sound. Yeah, 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 okay. I thought I had the mind that you know on the map. <laughs> I mean, it's for a different tournament. I forgot to get rid of it, by the way. I forgot to get rid of it. But here we go, spawning in the bottom left hand corner of Solaris. We have our red Zerg player representing Clan Donkey, the American Zerg. It is Frost. And spawning in the top right hand corner. Oh, we're going for a 13 12. Let's go. As spawning in the top right hand corner, we have for opponents, we have the blue Zerg player. It is danger. And they are in danger because Frost is off racing and going for a 13-12. Let's go. The way this works is we're rushing into gases. We're rushing into Ling speed, into a Baneliness as well. We should not be expanding uh, and we should be committing basically an all-in. Um, doesn't have to kill danger, but does have to cripple danger enough to expand behind it if we did get into a longer game. So it's going to be 13-12 here by, by Frost. Danger going for a hatch first. It's going to be a hatch first opener here from our blue Zerg player. Should be a hatch gas pool. Standard opener. If you're curious about the skill level, so the last couple of games were platinum. The last, uh, the sound matches were skill level platinum. Here, this I believe is diamond two, diamond one. Um, Frost is a masters player as a Terran. I'm not entirely sure when it comes to the Zerg ranking though. I think diamond. As here we go, Ling Speed is on the way. And Ling's are going to be flooding across the map. So again, that's also why that these are actual builds. <laughs> we level up from like trying to piece together what our players are doing in the last couple of games. Here, Hatch Gas Pool Standard Opener. 13-12 from Frost into the Bane the Nest. We're going for an all-in. Like these are actual builds. As Frost is moving out. Flooding her Ling's across the map. Danger. Still, I mean, is aware with the Overlord. Does confirm the Ling's is aware of what's going on and how do we respond now because it's a 13 12 we don't save the natural we do have to give up on it there we go we respond with the banely nest spine crawler in the main base as well two spine crawlers even in the mineral line so big reaction from danger so far so good oh ooh, three queens three sport sorry, sorry three spine crawlers um a bit of an overreaction i would say i don't think we need the third spine crawler lings are amassing this is a dangerous move we're going to be dancing with the units here of frost Waiting to use those broodlings. Yeah, Frost does engage. Oh, picking up these lings. Yeah, this was an overextension from danger. We needed those lings for the banelings. They were thrown away. Oh, and Frost gains a lot of value here. That's going to be a kill on the hatchery. The broodling, the broodlings, they chase the lings. They could have gone for the banelings. They could have gone for them. But the banelings are on the way. Now, behind this danger, morphing in his own defensive banelings. Did skip Ling speed, as we have to focus on surviving. Danger is still ahead in drones. Frost still all in. Ling comes out. Ling gets thrown away, and here we go. We're with Ling in. One Bailey connects. Two for two. Oh, big connections here. The Bailey's engine knock it into the middle line. Clean defense here from Danger, for the most part. Does hold. This is also why, again... Three Spines was a bit of an overreaction here by Danger. We didn't need this much. And Frost is expanding. Frost is trying to transition out of this. But Danger is in a good position. Danger does defend. Now the goal for Danger is to expand. Is to break free and take the natural base. Oh, as again, Danger wasn't quite able to hold on here. We do need to, hold, if we want to expand, we need Lings and Banelings. We need Lings and Banelings on the ground to expand as Frost does contain. No! Bit of miscontrol. Baneling goes down. Danger bleeds out the Baneling. And Frost contains Danger to one base. And now Frost is recovering. Still in low drone count, still droning, but is taking that natural base. We are droning up. And... The longer the danger is stuck on one base, the better it is for Frost. Here we go. Second gas on the way. It may be worth just going into... We have options. Danger may decide to go for a fast lair. We could go for fast roaches. 
The spine crawl is a fanning out. Frosty, Frosty could just bypass the spines. Goes for them though. Bold move here. Bailey's there. Well, Lynn. No, no reaction. No reaction. Big connection here. Six drones go down. We get a surround on the spine, but the Bailey's they have finished just in time, and Frost is forced back. Danger holding, but that was a big blow to the economy for Danger. Frost behind this. Joining up to 18. We have recovered economically. Link speed, of course, done. Uh, picking up these bailings. Oh, this is a big overextension by Danger. These bailings are going to go down for free. Uh, you can see these are just not good trades. Losing a bailing for one Ling, essentially. A uh, bit of miscontrol there by Frost. Oh, God. One for three. Uh, slightly better, but still not ideal. Yeah, the bailings are thrown away. Danger is expanding, but these have not been efficient trades. Not been efficient trades for danger. With the death of those bailings, Frost is link flooding. Like we, if we wanted to, we could drone. Like Frost is not in a bad position to drone, throw down a Roach Warren, and go two base Roach. Like we have excess gas. Like we can go two base Roach. Instead, Frost is going to be link flooding, trying to kill danger. Oh, runs into the bailings. Does take the bailings to the face. Finally, good connections for danger. Good connections here. As Oh no! Frost does get baited into another bailing. Danger of fighting Mac does end up losing this fight in the end though. Can we defend this base? Oh, Spinecrawl is late to reposition. We get to surround those lings. Queen does support. Danger will survive, will expand. And Frost behind this. We're still flooding links. <laughs> Again, we could have totally already had saturation at the natural and a roach warren and a wall. Like, ah, we could have gone to base roach, papi. Instead, just ling, linging it up. Let's go. Bailings walling across. Now, I'm not fond of this. Danger. Not the, not the first time this has happened. Now the second. Gets caught out. Queen gets surrounded. Bailings, they come back. Oh. Oh, my God. Almost does connect. As yes, Banelings are just waddling across the map. One Baneling for one Ling. Going to be running into a Queen, which again, the Queen can hold its own. The Banelings! Oh, as Frost does a move in. The manual detonation! Oh my god, danger! Ah, once again, Trigger Happy does manually detonate those Banelings on nothing! And Frost comes in for the surround. Reinforcements on the way. No Banelings left. No Banelings remaining for danger. And we got plenty on the way for Frost. There we go. Three Bailings in production. Frost catching a Queen. Does catch a Queen. Spinecrawler still up and running. Bailings are waddling in. We'd have to split them up though. Oh my god. Oh, not the best trade for Frost. That was what, like five Bailings for two? Bailings were thrown away. Oh, just like that. Once again, another Bailing goes down. Danger doing a great job here at trading efficiently when it comes to the Bailing Wars. Like, when it comes to the Bane, be Bane versus Bane, Danger has been trading better. And Drone is... Uh, Frost is droning. <laughs> Frost is now droning back at home. There's finally the Roach Warren. I would have liked it here as a part of the wall for some SimCity. Bailings rolling in. Fun fact... Two Bailings is all we need, and we can crash into the Morphing and Bailings of Frost. Yeah, once again, very efficient trades, but a lot survive. Not the best execution by Danger. Not the best execution. Now we can go in. <gasps> no, we get into the Mineral Alliance. Drones are going down. There's a Spine Crawler here, but there are just too many Bailings, and Frost has done it. Frost has broken the back of Danger. With the Ling Bane. We don't even need the Roach as we crash into the middle line. Every drone goes down. We're down to eight workers left. And the Lings are snowballing out of control. Bailings. Oh my god, there's so many Bailings. <laughs> Danger can clean up these Lings, but there's no economy. Not anymore. No economy remaining here for Danger. All Frost has to do is survive the Bailing counter attack. And it's pure Bane. Pure Bane here from Danger. Ah, we're welding on out. Oh my god. Uh, good connections. That was censored a little bit, but that was so many Lings running, to, running into their death. 
The best connections that Danger could hope for. But uh, it's still not enough. It's still enough. It's six drones to 22. Another Baneling goes down. Another Baneling does go down as Frost is going to be just flooding on in. There's one Baneling left. Sorry, there's three Baneling's left. Three Baneling's remaining. One on the high ground, one on the low ground, and one in the main. Good connection. Good connection here from Danger. We're down to two Banelings. Danger is rejoining. Can we recover? We shouldn't be able to, but we, but we could. <laughs> uh, ladies, they flood in for us around. We need the Baneling. Baneling not quite here. Drones, though, they're fighting, and uh, they're getting picked off. One after the other. Big connection, but we needed that earlier. As Danger does barely hold on to the low ground. But no more spine crawler. One bailing here left. Warding on in. Here come the lings. Here come the bailings. We're going for the main. Oh. Yeah, the natural base under fire. <laughs> And Frost will snowball out of control. Takes down Danger in a ZVZ. GG. GG. Oh. Again, a bit of a clown fiesta. Just non-stop. Not even like Ling Bane versus Ling Bane. It was just like, it was just nonsense, but Bailings on Bailings. Lings on Lings. Ah, oh, GG. Both players had their moments. Both players had their moments. It looked like there would be a moment there where maybe um, Danger could hold on and survive and stabilize but um again just really rough trades uh multiple times there with his own banelings as well the manual donation was brutal um yeah it was just chaotic i have to say like everything that i can say about the link bane of one player i can say about the link bane of another like it was just really <laughs> it was just really chaotic <laughs> gg well played cross survives the knife fight makes it out and with that we have another game we have another game ahead of us here. Another game from Frost. Again, Frost also did redeem three replays. It's going to be Frost versus Sifa in a TVZ. This time, Frost playing her main race. I mentioned before that I think Frost's Zerg is Diamond. Frost's Terran is Masters. Is around Masters 1. Masters 2, Masters 1 level. So pretty high up there. I want to say like 4.9. I want to say around 4.9k. Here we go. We're getting into our next game. Going to be on Site Delta. Let's go. Let us go. And in the top left-hand corner, we have one of our lovely supporters and viewers in the chat. The Red Terran player from the land of the Americas. Representing Clan Donkey, it is Frost. And spawning in the bottom right hand corner, we have her opponent. We have the blue Zerg player, currently teamless, currently clanless. It is Sifa. We go. Again, this time Frost whipping out her main race. And I'm a little bit concerned. Okay. So, when it comes to viewer redeem replays, usually it's a clown fiesta. Usually you don't redeem a replay unless something crazy happens. Some kind of nonsense ensued. Frost knows this. Knows this. And Frost named this replay Legitimate TVZ, I swear. <laughs> so, are we, lying? Is, are we telling the truth with that title of the replay? I don't know. I don't know if we're telling the truth. I don't know if we're lying. I don't know if it's true. I don't know what to expect. I'm still expecting a Clown Fiesta. It's going to be a pull first here from Sifa. It's going to be a pull first into that hatchery. Meanwhile, Frost going for a Rax Expand. So far, standard opener from Frost. A bit of a more aggressive opener from Sifa. Now, with this pull first, we can make some lings. And the goal here should be to go the long way across the map. To avoid the SCV Scout. To avoid the Reaper. And to delay the CC on the low ground. Maybe even force a cancel. With six lings, this is a pretty big commitment. This is a big this is a pretty committed pull first. SV Scout is coming in. We're going up to eight slings. Oh my god. This is very aggressive from Sifa. 
Um, I've seen pull first into just just two, just two lings, but no, we're doubling down up to eight lings here. And we're going right down the middle as well. We have no sense of <laughs> no sense of subtlety here. We do not avoid the SCV. Drone is moving out as well to expand and take a third base. This is gonna be a gasless opener from Sifa. Interesting. Okay. So it's gonna be eight lings into a gasless build. Double expanding behind this. Meanwhile, Frost is going to be defending back at home. The Reaper, of course, did stay back. Should not be surrounded. Good kiting so far. Marine has arrived. The goal here is to save that SCV. Can we save it? Oh, the SCV is going to go down. The command center is going to be delayed, but only delayed. It will not be canceled. Good cleanup here. Bit of, oh, bit of a miscontrol, but regardless, Lings get cleaned up, and Frost will hold. And this was a pretty big investment. I don't think this was fully worth it. I mean... Yes, we are taking a third base behind this, but we bleed out so many lings. And as a result, oh, we do get a second ACB. I was going to say that Sifa is behind in the drone count and behind in the economy. But we do defend. And Frost behind this going for a third CC. Okay, so very economic follow-up here to make up for the delayed command center. It is quite late, but we make up for it with a third. So Frost working towards the mid-game. Sifa likewise as well. Now, looking at the vision here, Frost... Saw the drone. I don't think Frost was able to really piece together what's going on. Because it's a gasless opener, Sifa doesn't really have much to threaten Frost. Frost could be hyper greedy. If I was casting Hon Mono, I'd be seeing a 4 CC before Starport, right? Like, there's no link speed, there's no bailings, there's no roaches, there's zero tech whatsoever. Frost can be as greedy as she wants, and Sifa can do nothing. Now, Frost doesn't know what we know. Like, we have full information. Frost has pieces of the puzzle, but not the entire, not the entire, you know, kind of landscape of what's happening. So, unfortunately, Frost is being economic, yes, but not being as greedy as they could be. Thankfully, though, we do see a Banshee opener. 3cc into Banshee. Meanwhile, Sifa is going into Roaches. This makes sense. Typically, gasless builds go into Roach production. Just because Ling Speed is so late, it's not worth it. It's not worth going into Ling Speed if it's at like the four minute mark. So we're going into Roaches, taking all four of our gases. It is going to be a commitment into Roach, Ro sorry, into Roach Ravager. Aliens get in. Oh, they will catch a Mineral Line. Drones are going to be going down. This is the alternate thing you could have done. Um, we have casted Clem recently versus, was it Dark or was it, it was against Raynor. It was Clem versus Raynor, that's it. We cast a Clem versus Raynor two weeks ago. Raynor opened up Gasless in a very similar way. Um, did, didn't open up with so many lings. But as soon as soon as Clem realized what was happening, as soon as he saw that it was Gasless, because there are only queens to defend, he went into like eight Hellions and he just broke into the into the natural and he just roasted up a mineral line. He barbecued like 18 drones. It was crazy how much damage Clem did because that's how vulnerable you are as well when you're opening up Gasless because you have no ling speed and late roaches. Or just late units in general outside of Queens. So we can see Frost get some damage done. Poke in towards the natural. We don't quite break in though. Frost has to back up. And upon seeing these Queens, upon seeing the lack of Lings, Frost should now realize it was gasless. And should realize it's going to be Roaches. Now to be fair, it's the NA ladder. So this could be something crazy like 2 base Muta. Like that is on the table. That is a viable option here for Sifa. So Frost is not fully aware of what's going on. But we should soon be moving out with these Banshees. We can see Frost is playing very safe, very defensive, keeping the Banshees back at home. But we can be active with them. And if we were active, we could pick off drones and get some more scouting information. Roaches are spotted. Big scout of the Roaches. The other big thing. How many drones do we have? Only four workers here at the four. So Frost is also continuing to confirm the low drone count. Banshees move out. Frost, he wants, she wants to try to catch these Roaches ahead of time. And it looks like she will. Big catch here. As the roaches are spotted. And we can just pick away at them. One roach goes down for free. One roach. A second roach as well. We are going to be committed. Bunkers are finishing up. Banshees should be coming back. And yeah, they are now coming back home. As the roaches, they try to force their way in. They trade okay against some of these Marines, but all these Roaches are going to be thrown away. We break in for some maybe SCV kills. And we will get a Marine. Oh, yeah, just one Marine. Yeah, lackluster Roach push there. 
Just like that, Frost is in a good position. Frost can now expand. There is creep at the third base locations. I love how annoying Sifa is being with these overlords. It's a good way to make use of them. As Sifa is working towards a Hydrogen infestation bit, infestors are on the way. Infestors alongside Roach Hydra. I'm a little bit surprised. Um, Roach Hydra makes sense. This can lead into eventually Hydra Lurker Viper. Um, we can work in that direction, but we're not quite there yet. Asiva's now taking a fourth. If I want to be a little bit critical, this fourth base is late. This fourth base is delayed here for Sifa. Could have been done earlier, considering that the third is now on the way for Frost. So the fourth is delayed. Sifa is maybe concerned about drop play, but drop play is not what Frost is working on. So it was just delayed. We actually do get across the map. They get one, they get two, they get three, three drones, but a massive fungal! The chain fungal is real. We do catch both these banshees, and we get one of them down. Very nice catch here from Sifa. Frost behind this, building up towards their bio army. She's got a couple of tanks. Marines are amassing. Armory on the way. 1-1 one, one is done. But we're still just building up. Still in a wo low worker count, unfortunately. But build up those SCVs. We don't have W. Where was the scan? There we go. <laughs> I was like, where did we scan? We did throw down the scan here on the right-hand side. We're looking for a fourth base. We should be able to deduce that the fourth is here towards the south, and that's exactly where the drop is going. That's exactly where the drop is headed. Hive now on the way. Again, this should be for lurkers. We should be working towards lurkers and vipers. We'll see if that's the case. As the drop is about to rock up, the goal here to deny the fourth. Here is deny the fourth base. Marines, they do stim on in. We do stim into the mineral line. Drones, good reaction here out of Sifo. We do pull away. One drone does go down. Can we get the hatchery? It's gonna be close. The hatchery is being targeted down. It looks like we will get a kill. Files. Ooh. They don't connect, but the good target firing out of Sifa. We killed the base at the cost of the drop. Full medevac went down. A costly trade here from Frost. Wasn't free, but Sifa already had a late fourth, and now is stuck on three bases. The Biles take down the Metamax. But Sifa economically is falling behind. And a Zerg player behind the economy against a Terran is a terrifying thought. Frost has a solid lead. Frost has a lead. Could be working towards a fourth base momentarily. Still building up their bio army. 2-2 two, two on the horizon. Combat shields as well. Second factory on the way. More gases. This means that we're not going for a three base all in. This means that Frost is working towards a 4 CC. And Sifa doesn't really have the economy to sustain lurkers yet. What's it going to be? Ultras? Mm, I'm not fond of this. Um, we're going for Adrenal, which is nice. The reason why this drone was denied the Ultra Cavern, by the way, Smurge. For the fun fact, if a unit is in, is in the way when you try to throw down a building, the building won't build. <laughs> so, uh, no Ultra Cavern, but if we do commit, I don't like it because we have range upgrades. We have plus two range. Like, Ultras, they're not going to be really well set up here um, if that's the tech that we invest in. But we need something. We need an Ultra Cavern or a Lurkadon or anything else. For now, just Roach Hydra. Sifa may not have realized that the Ultra Cavern didn't get thrown down. As we are banking up a lot of resources. That's a lot of minerals. That's a lot of gas. And even though I don't like Ultras, something is better than nothing. Was it around the 10 minute mark? I'm just trying to keep a mental note. So here we go, double drop getting into the natural base. Drones gonna be targeted down. Drones may be the queen. Ooh, as medevacs are gonna fall. Yeah, it's gonna be a one-way trip here for Frost. Uh, does get a queen, but will lose the entire drop here. But Frost, as she loses her drop, she's replacing it immediately. We're maxed out. Again, because Frost has the better economy, that's why Frost is about to hit 200 supply. Sifa still recovering, still on a low drone count, 62 workers. That is not good enough. That is under three base saturation, by the way. And there's that Ultra Cavern. One and a half minutes too late. Or one, one and a half minutes later than we would have thought we needed it. 
working on 3-3. Again, I'm still not entirely sold on the idea of Ultras, but... Which is why with the range upgrades, I assumed it was going to be into Lurker Tech. So I'm a little bit concerned, not going to lie. A little bit. We do have armor. We do have carapace upgrades, I guess. That, that's true. Ooh, as we do bow down that, that medevac. Nicely done. The other problem here is that the army is very ground-focused. So, ultras, they pair well with Ling Main because of how mobile it is. But there it is. Six ultras in production. No kindness plating. No speed. The ultras are going to be trying to fight their way through this army to get past it. To, get, to engage with Frost. Frost, meanwhile, turtling up. I do think we could have been a little bit more active, but we're working towards ghost production. Liberators should be on the horizon here for Frost. Do we have a fusion core? We do not, so no fusion core yet, but at least we have ghosts. That's something. Ideally, against ultras, you want ghost lib. You want tank ghost lib. That's, that's the ideal army composition. We're halfway there. We're, we're two-thirds of the way there with, with tank ghost. Liberators still lacking. Second starport on the way, so we are thinking about starport production. Still no fusion core. Fourth base being taken. Now we're working on plus one melee. Now we're working on plus one melee here. Kindness plating is going to finish soon. Then we can get into ultra speed. We already have six ultras. A big investment. Sifa is maxed out. But I'm concerned. Sifa does have a bit of a bank. But specifically, because Sifa has a low drone count, Sifa has a super maxed army. But it's not really. It's inflated supply because of how many roaches there are. Basically, Sifa needs to throw away these roaches and replace them with drones. If we don't, if Sifa loses one big fight, Sifa will have a very hard time remaxing. Just a really low drone count here. A really low economy and a subpar army with all these roaches. Again, roaches are supply inefficient. Ideally, you want to be trading them out and getting rid of them. Ultras are pushing in. A uh, bit of an anti-timing. 3-3 three, three isn't done. Three, three plus three carapace just finished up. But we annihilate those ultras. Oh my god. They melt. The choke point is real. Every ultra goes down. And Frost is snowballing out of control. You can see Sifa plummet in supply. As not just the ultras, but the roaches, ravagers, and hydras, they also melt here. And now that should trigger a big counterattack. Now is the time. We have 15 ultras on the way. That is a lot of ultras. They do have plus three and kindness plating. That is true. But as you can see, when engaging against a defensive turtling Terran player, ultras are not what you want. Ultras, they're ideal if the Terran pushes on creep. And that's exactly what Frost is doing. So Sifa has the opportunity to take a good fight. And you can see here we're remaxing with Ling Ultra. With Vipers as well. Now, we need to set up a surround. We need to set up from multiple angles. Otherwise, the ultras will be kited to death. And we are wide open. Sifa has potential for a good engage. And here we go. The ultras, they come in from one angle. Uh-oh. From one singular angle. We have a couple of ultras from the right-hand side. Lightning clouds are thrown down. No snipes. The ultras, they clean up the tanks. A big cleanup here from Sifa. Frost, now it's going to be her turn to plummet in supply here. No snipes. Big wide open space. Snipes only towards the end. And the fight is swinging back and forth. But again, the economy. I have, I have to bring it back to the economy. I have to bring it back to the lack of droning here from Sifa. Down to less than 60 workers. And is not replacing them. And you can see Sifa did remax on 15 ultras. True. True, but where's our bank? Not there anymore. We have gas, no minerals. And this is the ideal. Now we have the fusion core. Now we have range on the way for the liberators and we're making four libs at a time. We spoke about what is the ideal army against ultras. Ghost tank lib. That's exactly what Frost is doing. So shout out to Frost is aware of exactly what she needs against a mass ultra based army. Liberators are on the way. Ghosts are amassing. And the strength of Zerg in this position is to force a unit composition and to transition out of it with your bank. That is why 80 workers are necessary. You may be looking at this and you may be thinking, oh, I mean, we're maxed out though, right? Two on supply, no. Uh, the composition is worse for Sifa. Sifa will be losing this next fight. And 
in an ideal situation, you bleed out Roaches, you, sorry, you bleed out Ultras, and you replace them with Broodlords. You replace them with Broodlords, and the Broodlords have a much better time against, you know, a tank lib heavy composition. The base is going to be going down. Gross is repositioning. The problem is that we don't have a bank. We don't have a Greater Spire. We are not ready for a Broodlord transition. Um, we could maybe go into Ling Hydra Viper, which could be better against what Frost has. Um, that may be a viable option here. Not into Lurkers, not against not against Libs. Um, and you can see the Sifa is somewhat aware of what we need. Like, that's why we have the Spire. That's why we need a Greater Spire. But it's just late tech here. We need a second Spire for upgrades for 1-1 one, one air attack and 2-2 two, two, and eventually 3-3. Three, three. We are a ways away from Broodlords. And the quality of this army here is just getting worse and worse for Sifa as the lib count is getting higher. Now, as we're being passive, we are building up that bank, thankfully. Like, we do have a bank that is slowly building up here for Sifa. Plus three melee now on the way, plus one air attack. I'm I'm not sure if I'm fond of this. I don't know if I, if I would have preferred a greater Spire first, or maybe just a second Spire. Go Ultra, they do rock up here on left-hand side. They're getting on top of the Ghost. They're trying to. Ghost looking a little bit exposed. We dive here on top of the Planetary. Bailings roll in. Ta the tank's going ham here on these Ultras. And we will get a kill on the Planetary. Big pig off here by Sifa. We kill the base. We kill the Mineral Line. And Frost was out of position. You can see how concentrated Frost's army is here towards the north. Where we have tanks and libs. And all of this needs to be in position for the army. So, so far, see if we're doing well with these Ultras. That's the plus side. The plus side of these Ultras, we can outposition Frost, as we just saw. Rotating left and right. Now we could even see Sifa rotate back towards the north. And suddenly, this position is less fortified. We have one tank within range. This planetary looking very exposed. Sifa needs to keep going. We need to keep on going. We need to keep denying bases. In a head-on fight, I want to favor Frost. But if we avoid the fight, then maybe see if it can come out on top. The scan was important. Frost sees the rotation. Frost this time in position. We have 15 ghosts. 8 libs, 10 tanks. We are ready for the push. Meanwhile, towards the south, we have a borrowed Ling here from Sifa, making sure there is no expansion. We're pushing in. Ooh, I don't think we need to, though. We do rock on forward here into Liberation Zones, into tanks as well. We're going to collapse on the Planetary. The Planetary is going to be going down, but every single Ultra falls. This was an expensive fight for Sifa, and Sifa was, at, was maxed out, now at 116 supply. You can see Sifa plummet there as so many Ultras went down. You can see how quickly a fight goes in favor of Frost if Frost is in position. A very dominant fight there from the Terran. Did lose a base, but can we stop the counterattack? Ultra's getting sniped. Here comes the would-be Fungal. There it is. Fungal on the army, but there's no follow-up. The Fungal just doesn't do enough damage. Big scan here, and Frost is snowballing out of control. We snipe the Corruptors, and there is literally nothing left. Sifa down to 85 supply. And even though Frost, their economy, her economy is quite stifled, is quite low, doesn't matter. Not anymore. We have a death ball of a Terran army. Decent EMPs on those Queens. Snipes as well. We have four Ultras on the way. But that's all we have in production with a couple of Investors. Ah, Bailings are rolling in. The connections. Oh, miscontrol there from Frost. We run forward into the Bailings. A big misstep. And Sifa has a chance. Suddenly has a very strong chance here to survive, to clean this up. If we can connect with a good Fungal. If we can amass our army before we go in, we need the Infestors. We got a tank. We do pick up a tank. Ghost kiting back. Big snipes here on the Ultras. We get one, we get two. We're going to be getting a third Ultra as well. Ooh, the Infestors, they waddle in to their deaths. The scan takes down the final Infestor. A fumbled attack there from Sifa. Bleeds out all of their high-tech units. The Ultras, the Infestors, Lings, they flood in, but ah, they don't get anything. 
And Sifa is down to 35 drones. Frost down to 49 workers, but is landing a base. Will eventually, I'm sure, expand here. Hopefully. Give us the scan. There it is. So Frost's going to be double expanding and getting back into their economy. Sifa, we're out of money. We're out of minerals. Out of resources. We're long distance mining. We don't even need to. Sifa, we can just saturate this base. Oh, God. So just an unfortunate situation with the economy for the Zerg player. Again, nothing in the main, nothing in the natural. Two patches left at the third. We have a full fourth, but we're not mining from it. We're not mining from that fourth base. We cannot remax. We cannot rebuild. If we could, if we had this base up and running, then maybe Sifa could be could have a comparable army supply. Maybe. Maybe could could try to keep up, but it's not happening. Not happening here. GG gets called. We don't even get a final fight, and Sifa will tap out. Frost takes down Sifa in a TVZ. GG. Oh, my God. <laughs> That was a wild game. Quite back and forth as well. They they had their own moments. Again, Sifa refusing to drone. My my Zerg heart bleeds. Seeing seeing like that was a long game. And it only lasts and we only ever had like at most 63 drones. I think that was the max. Maybe 62. 62 or 63 drones. That was the most we ever had. Just a very all-in style from Sifa. Not a lot of longevity. Not a lot of uh yeah, just not a lot of longevity in that playstyle, and it did bleed out. GG. GG, well played. Congratulations here to Frost. And with that, we have one game remaining here from the batch that we got from Frost. It was three replays redeemed. <laughs> Three retail replays redeemed. As we are going to be following Frost into another game featuring a pro player, by the way. I mentioned before that Frost is Frost is Masters, uh, is around Masters 1, and Frost did come across a pro. Did come across Mio Micah. We weren't able to cast Mio Micah earlier, but we can indulge in some Mio Micah, act, Mio Micah ladder action here and now against Frost. Let's go. Let us go. Catching up in the chat. How many years will you be refugee in Poland? Escaping the, the repression of Texas. Oh, God. <laughs> Este Thorn, Este Thorn 69. I mentioned before, I'm going to be staying in Poland for a month. Staying till March. Well into March before we do return. But here we go. We're diving into another submitted replay. And in the top right-hand corner, hold on. Let's fix this, up, fix this up. Because this is a notable player. Not just player. <laughs> Let me fix this up. Bam. There we go. Spawning in the top right-hand corner, we have... In the top right hand corner of Hecate, we have the red Zerg player representing Team Gosu. It is Mio Micah. The Vietnamese Zerg. And spawning in the bottom left hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the blue Terran representing Clan Donkey, the American Terran. It is Frost. One of our lovely viewers of the chat. But up against Mio Micah. And oh, we are going to be cheesing it up. Okay, so. Again, Mia Micah, this is uh, their main account. This is not even an alt account. It did uh, Mia Micah, he loves to rename his accounts every season. Is player. That's why he's on Team Gosu. Has competed as player before. Is going for a pool first. Now, Mia Micah, it is standard for Mia Micah to go pool first in every matchup. Very safe way to play. As a result, is going to be decently set up to defend against cheeses. This is just Mia Micah's play style. Mia Micah is aggressive and crazy and wild. That is all true but also opens up very safely to get away with all of that. Meanwhile, Frost is going to be committing to two racks, no gas. Two racks marine? Yeah, yeah it's going to be, sorry, yeah, of course. It's going to be a two racks here from Frost. We should be going for a bunker rush. Looking at the positioning of the overlords, Mia Micah, 
Ooh, sends both overlords across the map. There's nothing to scout. These bunkers, they will get up and running. They will get up and running. And this is only a proxy to racks. So this is not an all-in. This is designed to get economic damage done, get ahead, and expand back at home. This You can transition quite well out of this. As long as you don't lose too much. So we're waiting for the Marines before we move out. So Lings have arrived because of the pool first. And Frost, oh, now has to deal with these Lings again because of the safe opener of me and Micah. We take down an SCV. We take down the second. Both SCVs go down. No bunkers whatsoever. This is the power of me and Micah, the power of the pool first. And with, with the death of those SCVs, no bunkers will be thrown down. Only Marines on their own. And this is significantly weaker. We already have a Queen. Queen waddles forward. Lings are amassing. Me and Micah will force this back. Back at home, Frost is expanding. We spoke about this. Two racks is not an all-in. Yeah, we're going to be floating back home. We're going to be taking the command center. And I would say that me and Micah is in a better position. Especially considering that me and Micah... This is a standard opener. Goes for a pool first anyway. Oh, is a massive lot of links though. Working towards link speed. Me and Micah, are we tempted to go for an all-in to punish Frost? That is the question. Frost going for a third CC before factory. Oh my god, so much greed! A very aggressive, sorry, a very greedy follow-up here. Going for a third CC before the factory, which means no Hellions, nothing to defend back at home. Me and Micah is going to be flooding across the map. We do come across the Marines. We get a surround. One, two, three Marines going to be falling. Yeah, every Marine is going to be chased down. Big clean up here for me and Micah, but me and Micah is supply blocked. Does barely break free. And me and Micah has to do something here because this is just too much greed. This is wild. And me and Micah, he comes in with his lings and he will scout. He sees. He sees the third CC. He's aware of how greedy Frost is being. There's nothing to defend. Boys have to be pulled. Me and Micah expanding behind this. We could have gone for a bust. If we, if we had a Bailey Nest, if we had some gas, if we had a Bailey Nest, then me and Micah could end the game because there is literally zero attack units. No Marines, no Hellions, no Reapers, nothing here. A Bane Bus would end the game. But me and Micah is droning. Me and Micah is droning up. Frost is getting away with this crazy follow-up. Again, very greedy here by Frost. So far, repairing well. Keeping these Deepers alive. Going to mech? Ooh, okay. This is scary. So, me and Micah is known for a couple of things. Uh, me and Micah is very stylistic. Very stylistic player. Me and Micah, he's known for Ling Hydra. He's, he's known for Ling Hydra. He's known for going double Evo into mass Ling as well. He's known for skipping Banelings, is what I'm getting at. He's known for skipping Banelings. And we have seen many Terran players kill me and Micah with mech. Specifically, with committed Hellion aggression in the early game. Yeah, it's going to be 1-1. One, one. So me and Micah, he's going Mass Ling. He has this style of just going pure Mass Ling here. It's crazy. It's overwhelming. But if Frost commits to Mass Blue Flame Hellion, then me and Micah won't be able to do anything. Won't be able to touch Frost. So this is a very bold move. But I'm pretty sure Frost is aware of this as well. Like, I've spoken to Frost. I think, I'm pretty sure I've been in a call with Frost, like, talking about this when, like, referring to me and Micah. I think not even Frost. I think Asher uh, told Frost about it because Asher's beaten me and Micah with Myth Mech before. Asher's done it before. We've casted it happen. Scan into the main reveals the double Evo chamber. Me and Micah double expanding. Oh, my God. Going for a fourth and a fifth. Meanwhile... We have Hellions, but also Cyclone, okay? It's going to be Battle Mech from Frost. It is going to be Battle Mech here, which I'm not as fond of, I'll be honest. Like, I, I, like specifically against me and Micah, I like the idea of, oh my god, he's going, he's taking four bases. One, two, three, and a fourth hatchery here in the middle. Me and Micah throwing down four hatcheries here. He's crazy. Uh, that's the way to spend your money, I guess. As he is just... What do we do with all these hatcheries? Larva. We, do you think Mia Micah is going to be having that many queens to inject? God, no. Mia Micah doesn't make more queens than three. He's using all this for larva. He's going to be maxing out with lings. Pure ling. We spoke about it. That's what he does. More hatcheries on the way. More hatcheries being thrown down. No bailings. No hydras. No muters. Just mass ling. Into Ultra, to be fair. I think it leads into Ultra eventually. Lair is on the way for 2-2. Wings are amassing as we speak. 
Battle mech has been confirmed. And we have to respect this. We we cannot be stubborn here. Lanes, they do dive in. They get on top of one of these Cyclones. But the Hellions, they trade so efficiently. And we need to respect this. Me and Micah, we need to throw down a Roach Warren or a Roach Warren or even a Roach Warren. <laughs> Maybe a Bailey Ness at least. But Pure Ling against Battle Mech. It's... It's, it's going to be an uphill battle. I'll be honest. It's going to be an uphill battle here for me and Micah. But again, me and Micah typically is stuck in his ways. Like, he has a unique play style, yes. But he's not the most flexible of players. Not the most flexible, just creative. And he's making 46 links. Again, just pure link from me and Micah. Which is what he's known for. Does collapse on these Hellions. Does shut them down. Crossed over extending. Again, I don't think we needed to move out before we maxed out. So, big over extension there by Frost. Mia Mike containing Frost to two bases. And so we're going for more hatcheries. We're just we're just double we're just mass expanding here. Taking both center bases, both hybrid bases. Mia Mike is still with Mass Ling. As the Lings, they do engage. They once again surround this army. The Hellbats, they morph in. Ooh, big Hellbat shots. Blue Flame is not done, though. Ooh, as the army is barely cleaned up. How many Lings have died? 100 Lings so far. But the worst trade, the wall is soon to be broken. Did you bust in? They bust in, but the Hellions clean up those Lings. Again, going to be getting into tank Hellion behind this. I like this. Okay. So it looks like Frost has realized that Cyclones are not the answer, which I, I agree with, which is why, to begin with, I wanted just pure Hellion. So we're going pure Hellion tank. Blue Flame is missing. Uh, Hurricane Thrusters was researched, but Hurricane Thrusters was a bit of a waste here and isn't being used. There it is. Blue Flame now on the way for Frost. Third base being taken. Me and Micah has a Hive. Now, with this Hive, we can get into 3 3. We can get into Adrenal, and I believe this should be leading into Ultras. Good Hellion run by him. See in the chat. Maru would win from this position in 15 minutes. I don't think so. <laughs> the history would repeat itself. Mia would win again, Bobby. Kappa, Kappa. As Lings, they collapse here on the third base. Hellbats, they're going to trade efficiently, but they get surrounded. As me and Micah, he has maxed out. He has that 200 supply. Oh my god, but he's throwing away so many Lings. The Lings, they're getting roasted. Oh my god. It's a, it's a, it's a barbecue here. We throw away 234 Lings already. Now, what I will say, though is that, honestly, me and Micah can keep doing this. He can keep doing this as long as he denies the third. This third base, as long as we can deny it over and over again, then me and Micah, we're going to be able to come out on top. As he has 2k minerals in the bank, he has every other base. Here we go, we get to surround on the Hellions. Where are the Hellbats? No, the Hellions, they get surrounded. They're going to be shut down. We bust into the natural as well. Hellbats finally being morphed in. But is it too late? Yeah, I do think it is. As we bust in, GG and Mio Micah with the swarm of mass Ling. Snowball's out of control. He does take down his nemesis, the mech. <laughs> Takes down the mech, Poppy. GG. Beautiful. GG, well played. Mio Micah with the mass Ling style. Again, I was a little bit concerned when I saw the Hellions. Again, we have seen Mio Micah lose to mech quite a bit. But we saw that really what was important is that me and Micah never allowed Frost to take a third. Never allowed a third base to be taken. On top of that, Frost was getting caught out a little bit and was never able to, able to really build up that Hellback count. If we hadn't overextended a couple of times, if we were able to prioritize Blue Flame and be a little bit more set up and pre prepared for these Ling attacks, then maybe we can make a game out of it. It's possible. It is possible. So overall, I liked the overall game plan that we were working towards at the end, but it took us a little bit to get there and... 
Yeah, GG. GG, well played. Not a bad game whatsoever. Of course, me and Micah is the king of the sea, the best player in Southeast Asia. So no shame whatsoever in going down. And a shout out to Frost for making a game out of that and for allowing us to actually cast some me and Micah today because we weren't able to in the tournament. He didn't show up. So at least we got some me and Micah action. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, Papi. Let's go. GG. Well played. With that, we have a couple more replays. We have just wrapped up six matches, and during the broadcast, we have three more redeemed. Kronos uh, alongside... Not just Kronos. Let me just double check. Checking the list. Kronos alongside Senju, alongside Demi. I believe they all redeemed replays. But I do need to download them. I do need to set them up. So I need a little bit of time to prepare myself. So we're going to be cutting this replay, uh, this replay cast in half. Going to be taking a moment here to take a break. Going to be ha, huh, catching my breath, especially after after me and Mike. He leaves me breathless, Papi. Ha. Huh? <laughs> going to download a bunch of replays, and we have another wave of your replays coming up next. See you soon.
welcome back everyone welcome back oh i hope you enjoyed hope you did enjoy that uh that lovely break that lovely brutal brutal oc as we have returned with the second half of the duckling viewer replay broadcast again we had a lot of replays we just casted six redeemed replays and we have three more, nine in total. That's a lot of replays. <laughs> That's a lot of your replays. I'm ready for it. I'm excited. Up first, we have Kronos versus Ayo. Ayo. <laughs> Kronos, of course, he is one of our mods in the chat. Not just a mod, he's a fellow Cranky Duckling. He's a fellow Cranky Duckling from the land of South Korea. He's a real Korean. He's a Korean Terran player. Um, did dabble his hand in casting for a time. Has dabbled his hand in casting. And uh, I'm just going to be doxing him. Let's go. He's a medical student. He's a med student. He has been focusing on his studies for many, many years, as you can imagine. Med school does last a long time. And uh, Kronos, every now and then, he jumps by. You know, he doesn't have that much free time anymore to play, to compete, to be a part of StarCraft. But every now and then, he drops by. And I, I always appreciate it, Kronos. I always do appreciate it. Much love, Bobby. Much love. Um... But on the flip side, he's an animal. He plays mech and he plays BC. <laughs> yeah, he does indulge in the dark arts of the Terran of the Battle Cruiser whenever he can. Uh, this is going to be a TVZ between Kronos and Ayo. Kronos, he is around the Diamond level, around Diamond 3, Diamond 2. Last I do remember. But uh, we'll see how time has changed and how we do dive into this. Game 1 going to be on Hecate. Let's go. Jumping into Hecate. And I believe, yeah, it's going to be a diamond match. And I believe Cronus in the chat, when he posted this, he said something about cheese. He said something about a quick game. So uh, let's find out what the hell we've found ourselves in. Let's go. As spawning in the bottom left-hand corner of Hecate, we have our red Zerg player. We have our contender here, our challenger. It is Ayo. And spawning in the top right hand corner, we have this We have the South Korean Terran player. He's one of our own. He's one of the cranky ducklings. Quack, Bobby Quack, from the land of South Korea. It is Kronos. Hello. Beautiful, Bobby. Beautiful. Here we go. Whew. So to, to kick things off, we are going for what looks to be a send over. It should be a Rax expand setup here from Kronos. Likewise, Ayo back at home going to be joining on up, going for his natural base, going for a hatch first. Everything is looking up by the book for the time being. By the book. Oh, we're dancing in the chat. Oh, <laughs> shout to Apop. Shout to Apoptosis. Oh. But uh, for the time being, it's going to be standard opens. Again, Kronos, he, uh, back in the day, was a lot more active, you know, competing in Sea Duckling Opens, competing in our online events. Um, and, of course, was a big part of the Korean scene, the Korean community, a big part of, for example, uh, Stats' uh, stream, Stats' Discord, all over that. Being there to support wherever he can. And again, he drops by whenever he has the free time as well. So much love, much love here to Kronos. But now, Hatch Gas Pool. So, standard opener from our Zerg player. Standard opener from our Zerg. Meanwhile, Kronos looking like a Rax expand. Everything's looking normal so far. So far, I'm surprised. I was, I was, maybe I misread. Maybe I, maybe I dreamt. Maybe I just made up the comments about it being a cheese. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I saw what I wanted to see. Or maybe not. Now, I mentioned before that Kronos was one that did love to indulge in mech and battle cruisers back in the day. Would we go for something crazy? Do we whip out a Gumiho and go to port BC? For now. Reaper moving out across the map. Reactor on the way behind this. Reactor's on the way for that marine production. We should be seeing a factory thereafter. Getting into our build, getting into our opener. Back at home. Ayo is still just droning. Getting his natural base up and running and should soon be working on that third. Alas, the drone is a little bit delayed here for Ayo. So it's going to be contained to two bases a little bit longer. Lings have arrived, and the Reaper is here to deny that third. So Ayo, yeah, he's going to be contained. Rough opener here for the Red Protoss. Sorry, for the Red Zerg. Reaper gets in. We deny the Spore. We deny the Spore. A drone goes down. Good pick off here already by Kronos. He contains the opponent to two bases. He kills a drone as well. Ayo having a slight deficit in the early game. Meanwhile, across the map, Kronos, he is getting into that factory, going for an add-on swap, I imagine, into Hellion production. Meanwhile, Ayo, he's going for two base lair. Oh my god. Uh, two base layer out of AO. This could be a couple of different things. Okay. 
it could be a Nidus all in. If we make another queen, if we stay on a minimal gases, could be a Nidus all in. If we take our gases, it could be two base muta. Two base muta would be viable here, or would be a build on the table for AU. Uh, that's the top two things on my mind. Um, the other option, we don't have link speed. Oh, okay, no link speed, unlikely to be a Nidus. Unlikely to be Nidus all in. It could be two base Roach, but we would have seen a Roach one by now. The Roach Warren would have been lined up with the Lair to start Roach speed. So no Roach Warren. Gases are now being taken. Three gases at the natural, or two gases at the natural, one in the main base. It's going to be the Spire, right? It has to be a Spire. Show us a two base meter. Eva Chamber all the way to wall off. The Lair is now done. And Ayo, he has the resources he needs. He's throwing down the tech. It is going to be an infestation pit. It is not two base meter. It's two base swarm host. This has to be Swarm Host. This is the only thing. Okay, very interesting. <laughs> the scan! Big scout here from Kronos. I mean, he confirms that there is no third base, so he scans the main base. He sees the lair, he sees the gas, and he sees the infestation bit. He sees everything he needs to confirm that it's Swarm Host. And what does he need to respond? Map control. He needs to shut down these overlords. Shut down the any kind of vision here that Ao would have. Have a mobile army be in position. Third CC's on the way. We're getting into cyclone production, into marines. Only two cyclones for now. Oh, I say that. Four cyclones. We're, we're massing cyclones. Oh my god. Non stop cyclone production. There it is. Four swarmers on the way. Nidus swarm as well. Queen is going to be shot down. Should be shut down as we get on top of the queens. The queens are falling. No transfuse available here. Bit of miscontrol out of AO. And Kronos, he's breaking into the mineral line. The boys, they have to be pulled against Cyclones. Would you get us around? One Cyclone falls here. Bit of miscontrol from Kronos. Regardless, does do some good damage. Meanwhile, back at home, show us an Idis. We have how many Swarm Hosts? Four on the way. And we do have a vision here for an Idis at the Triangular Third. Roach Warren is thrown down. We're still stuck on two bases. AO's economy is still in the gutter. But there's that Nidus. And we're continuing Swarm Host production. And Kronos doesn't see where the Nidus is. Doesn't know. Again, he did see the infestation, but he saw everything he needed to. SME moves out. Nidus does finish. Oh, and we're racing back home. We're racing back home. Locust wave towards the main base. Queens are here to support. To spread creep. To keep vision. Uh, and we do force the Locust to unload. Oh. Yeah, the Locusts, they do end up landing here in the main. They don't get any damage on the go for a tech lab. They can maybe get an add-on. Not even. The add-on survives. Combat shields on the way. And Kronos doesn't take any damage to the first wave, which is devastating. If you're going for two base swarm hosts, you need to get damage done. You need to gain value over time. You need to trade well with these swarm hosts. There it is. Nidus Swarm gets picked off. But we do have Creep. We do have Creep. We do have Vision. We can keep going for Nidus Worms. We can keep throwing down Niduses. We have 1-1 one, one on the way. A wall of Spine Crawlers. The Roach one is there as well to get into Roach production. But we should be just committing to Swarm Hosts at this point. It's, it's the only thing we have going for us. We have 8 Swarm Hosts so far. We'll see. As Creep is continuing to be spread. Kronos didn't notice that there was Creep Tumors here. We need to clean this up before it gets out of hand. As we are committing to Biocyclone. I'd like the Cyclones initially, but now we should be stopping. We, we need to stop Cyclone production. We're at <laughs> Regardless, we're moving out. Five more Swarm Hosts on the way. We get eyes on the army. Oh, we get eyes on the wall, sorry. Ooh, as of that, those Spine Calls are going ham. Oh my god. One of them will go down. We force a Locust Wave. A bit premature here from AO. Wasting the Locust Wave. Nidus does finish. And the Locust Wave was already spent. It was wasted. And there's nothing to use across the map. The Swarm Host, they're tapped out. They had their one shot. They spent it. And now here come more Cyclones. We catch the Queens. One Queen goes down. Do you get one queen? The others do heal themselves. Scan does clean up all these active tumors. We have so much more to worry about. Give us another scan. 
Madison on the left-hand side. Tumor is being spread. Kronos going for a ninja? <laughs> going for the hybrid brace. Going for the hybrid base. A little bit unnecessary. Could have just expanded linearly or taken the right-hand side. A very exposed base here from Kronos. Very cheeky move. I just want to say continue. Kronos freaking out a little bit here. Still building up his bio. What are we working with? We have Stim, we have Combat Shields, we don't have Concussive Shell. We should be building up a bio-based army, but Kronos... Uh, missing a couple of macro cycles. We do have 2k minerals, but we aren't quite spending our money. A little bit unfortunate. And here come the Locust Wave. Right into the third. Right into the mineral line. SVs are going down. Kronos, he will clean this up. Yeah, he has an EPS for it. Oh, but he bleeds out a lot of Cyclones. We need to stop Cyclones. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. There we go. As finally AO is expanding. He's been stuck on two bases for a very long time. Very important that he gets his third base up and running. But Kronos, he has a big economic lead. He's got a fourth. Still waiting for some scans, unfortunately. To clean this up. Still waiting for scans. No Raven either. As the creep is spreading towards our opponents. And Ayu, he sees everything, by the way. He sees the main army. Kronos doesn't care. He is pushing. And Kronos, he may be able to break the natural. Uh, but there are Swarmers back at home to defend. Getting into a Hydrogen. This should be for Lurkers. This should be for Lurker Tech. As the Locust Wave is going to be going off. We stim on forward. Big stim here from Kronos. He will clean up every single one of those Locusts. Bleeding out mainly those Cyclones. I mean, I guess they're good just to take damage. <laughs> they're just to soak. As we deny plus two. And we could even deny two two. Yeah, plus two armor here. About to finish up. No, it's going to be focused down. We focus down the spine crawlers and then the Evo Chamber. No! It finishes! Plus two does finish! It was so close! And does complete. Ayo trying to come in with Queens, but there's nothing to defend. Only Swarm Host, and they're on cooldown. They are on cooldown. The Queens go down. Swarm Host, they trickle into their deaths. As they just rally in. And Kronos, he's snowballing out of control. Uh, it looks like he's going to be cleaned up. He's being overwhelmed. But we're rallying in more reinforcements. More Marines. More Marauders. And GG is called here as Kronos overwhelms his opponent and punishes the two base Swarm Host. GG. <laughs> GG. Well played. Two base home Swarm Host can be so annoying to deal with. It, it is a thing that you see from time to time on the ladder. It can be so annoying to deal with. Um, but as we saw, the first Locust Wave didn't do anything. It didn't do anything. It didn't do any damage here to... Uh, it didn't do any damage to Kronos. The first wave tickled a tech lab and didn't kill it, and that's all it did. So Kronos was able to, like, mentally prepare and be ready to respond to Nidus Worms and Swarm Hosts. And, again, they just didn't really gain any value. It just wasn't worth it. Just wasn't worth it in the end for the Zerg player. Um, didn't gain the momentum that they wanted. And they were just perpetually behind from there. GG. GG, well played. Solid game there from Kronos. Well done. Well done, Babby. Well done. Does take the game. Cool. As we are getting into our next match here. Our next game that was redeemed earlier today. From someone in the chat. From a lovely supporter. It is going to be Senju versus Firelight in a PVT. Also on Hecate. Oh, what do you know? Actually, every game is on he <laughs> every game is on Hecate. I just realized. <laughs> As we have a demi match afterwards. Okay, is going to be a PVT, and I don't really know what I'm stepping into. Unlike Kronos, who did mention she's, I'm not so sure. Uh... <laughs> I'm not so sure um, what skill level we're at here. Um... Oh, sorry. Uh, what what we're going to be walking into? Is it cheese? Is it aggression? Is it a standard game? We're here to find out. We are here to find out. Spawning in the bottom left-hand corner. Bottom left-hand corner of Hecate. We have our red Protoss player representing Clan Taste the Baden. 
Taste the bacon, aka pig pan. It is Senju. Taste the bacon, fam. Oh. And spawning in the top right hand corner, we have his opponent. We have the Blue Terran. Teamless, without a clan, it is Fairlight. Not to be confused with Firefly, which is what my brain was thinking. <laughs> Oh, but here we go. I don't think we've casted a replay from Senju before. Um, we've Again, many people in the chat have redeemed their replays before. I'm not so certain we've casted Senju in the past, so I'm not really sure what their play style is. Not too sure what their tendencies are. So I'm excited to bear witness. I'm excited to embrace what Senju has to offer here in this PVT. As we're going for a gate opener, we're going to be walling off the Reaper Clip here. Was the north already better than sounder let's go <laughs> we're walling off Fabi. back at home fairlight's going for his own double gas opener so this should be for a delayed tc for a faster factory as i say that this is a bit of a lower ranked game so i don't know if builds really come into play here i don't know if i should oh my god as we overreact fairlight pulling a couple of extra scvs here did overreact a little bit send you striking fear into the heart of the terran it's a probe, I understand. I mean, hey, it can cannon rush. It's terrifying. <laughs> it can cannon rush, it can tase your SCVs, it can deny your expansions and force you to take unnatural bases. Pro uh, probes are a terrifying thing, so I can, I can get behind the overreaction a little bit. <laughs> uh, as we are going for a very fast tech lab. Ooh, one base all in. This feels like a one base all in here. Um, Fairlight uh, is building up resources for an expansion, but no, he's moving out with the SCV. Getting ready for an add-on swap, fast tank production? Uh, not quite. What is the purpose of this tech lab? I assumed we would go, okay. So I assumed we would be going for an add-on swap into a tank, into like a one base tank all in, like a tank drop or something. Um, but no, we're headed in a different direction. We make a Marine, do we add on swap? We do! Okay, okay, okay. I'm sane. <gasps> Proxy racks across the map! Oh my god! Okay, so we're going for the Adam Swap. We're going for the tank production. I imagine gonna be rallying vanilla marines across the map. Hon Mono even has like a one base all in variation, very similar to this as well. Ooh, is supply block does have to cool down those that cool down that supply, but the tank is on the way. Meanwhile, back at home, we're going for a Rax X. Sorry, we're going for a gate expand. Senju hasn't seen much. Did see the double gas, hasn't seen much, but is thankfully going for a robot opener. Okay, so for those that aren't, for those that don't know, for those that are curious, robot openers are very safe, very safe. With this, you can get into fast immortal production and into fast colossus production. The downside of a robot based opener is that you lack map control. Typically, you do lack a lot of um, map presence and you can't really harass across the map. But with this, we can get, we can get into earlier immortals and be really safe. Now, based on the rea on the rally, this could just be an observer first or even a prism first. We'll see what Senju makes, but if he does catch wind of what's happening, we need an Immortal. We do need the Immortal ASAP. As there we go, it's not going to be a medevac, it's going to be rallying Liberators across the map. The tank is coming. Tank, Lib, and Marine. What do we have? An Observer. Ooh, it's going to be an Observer first. Once we realize what's happening, again, we need Shield Batteries, we need Overcharge, we need an Immortal. We have the tools to defend. Going double robo. Oh my, that's crazy. <laughs> double robo Colossus production. This is wild. This is maybe too greedy. Maybe a little bit too greedy here by Senju. But there we go. He does see the tank. We need an immortal here and now. We may even need to cancel the robo, the bay. Cancel the bay. Get resources back. Produce the immortal. Maybe even cancel the second robo. Yeah, I I'd be all for canceling these buildings just so we can warp in and build some units. There it is, Immortals on the way. We need some shield batteries and one shield battery here at the low ground. Tanks are doubling up. And here we go. Tank has arrived. We're slowly leapfrogging forward here. Onto the natural. Natural is heavily under fire. We have to buy time. We'll dive on top of the tank. Oh, we're within range of the Liberator. The, the Stalkers, they go down. We annihilate the army and Fairlight. He's breaking the natural base. Pylon goes down. Again, it is a one base all in. Technically, we could have we could have afforded to give up on this base, but we're going for a Colossus. Immortal into Colossus production. This is so greedy. Can we get away with it? No, gases are being denied. 
We are mining in the main base, but no mining at the natural. Liberator sieging on forward immortal. Good positioning. We do avoid the liberation zone, but oh, we take some free shots. Bit of miscontrol there with the immortals. Free shots off. And the base is under fire. We do repower the shield battery. Yeah, boys are being evacuated. This is okay. Like, we can lose the natural. It's fine. It's okay. We're going for a Stargate. <laughs> I mean, with like three immortals and a couple of stalkers, we could clean this up. But uh, we're going for a Stargate, an alternate solution here for some Sky Toss, for some Void Rays. Not much shoots up. Void Rays will defend. But this is a late Void Ray. If we wanted Void Rays, like we cancel the Robo, cancel the Robotics Bay, and go for a Stargate then. We would already have a Void Ray by now. We would already have it. The natural has fallen. Leak forking forward. Senju confirms there is no expansion. Just making sure. And Fairlight, he's pushing forward a little bit closer here. The tank does overextend. Big pick up. Do we have a. Okay, no. I was like, do we have extended double lands? Marines go down the tank as well. We're running out of steam, running out of units. Again. So, in this kind of situation, we need to be fluid and work with our tech. The fact that, like, we have... We invest into a second robot and we're not using it, right? We invest into a bay that we're not using. Now we're going into a Stargate. Like, it's 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 a little bit too chaotic. And we're spending so much money on tech here, not on army. And as a result, like, Fairlight is achieving quite a lot with this. He should be expanding. There it is. Expansion's on the way. Second Liberator has arrived. And we are rallying across the map with a Viking. Uh, leaving our t leaving one of our tanks back at home. But this is becoming terrifying. Like, thankfully, there is no anti-air. Well, there's one vo there's one Viking that the Void Ray has to be concerned about. So the power of the one Void Ray. Can we clean everything up? Let's go. Ooh. Void Ray wasting DPS here on the Sieged Up Lib. Ooh, it does take a lot of damage. We are breaking out. We force the Unsiege. Of the Liberator, I mean. So far. Good control. Extra weapons would be good. Liberation Zone is being set up here, covering the production. Viking overextends. Viking gonna be going down. We can collapse on this. We can F2A. Oh. Void Ray going across the map. Oh my god, he's crazy. He's going across the map. He's pulling the boys. We collapse on this position. We pull the boys. Uh, Colossus is going to go down. Immortal as well. Immortal should fall. Ooh, as we barely break through. Oh my god, it does get targeted. But it looks like we will clean this up just barely. Uh, not even. We're down to one stalker. We're down to zero stalkers. Another immortal has arrived. We focus down those Vikings. Void Ray going ham across the map. Another tank has made it. A very, a very scrappy situation here. A very scrappy game state. Not gonna lie. Ah. Uh, aye, aye, aye. And here we go. We are pushing out. We're breaking free. We'll focus this down. Again, we do have Fairlight eventually expanding, and now he's soon to be taking an economic lead. The pressure is now on Senju. Either we do one of two things. We expand, and we play from behind, or we all-in. And it's looking like an all-in. We're amassing immortals here on one base. Oh, there it is. Okay, we, we are expanding. Ne never mind. We're expanding. We're settling down. We're settling into a longer game. Okay, both players are establishing their their expansions, their natural bases. Again, Fairlight with a two base setup here with two orbitals. He should be able to take a lead, but I just realized this is not an orbital. It's a regular base. We need an orbital. We need mules. And we're not making it. We're not making an orbital right now. We're keeping it as a regular CC. Just making SCVs. Send you a double expand. I like this. I like the double expand. He has map control, and this is a good way to catch back up. We're catching back up into this. Settling into immortal production, into additional gateways. Again, he still has map control with these void rays. 
has one void ray, I should say. And all that we really need to do here for Senju is park a couple of units, like park a Zealot at each third and park a Zealot right outside the natural, just so we can see a move out. Because it's possible that Fairlight could pull the boys and go all in and could kill Senju. Like, that's possible. I mean, with these immortals, unlikely, but it would be nice to get a bit of scouting information here and just have some vision on the map. Um, do we still have the Observer? We do. The Observer uh, is parked outside the natural, at least. We do have eyes on most things. Don't have eyes on the third, though. But just to get rid of what's going on. Senjo, meanwhile, working towards charge. Should be chronoing up probes as hard as we can. And we are lacking some upgrades. I mean, we have a forge. Right now, because of our low worker counts, we shouldn't really be hyper fixated on upgrades. Getting them when we can, but really focusing on just probing up as hard as possible. Here's that move out. And again, I don't think Senju saw it. Yeah, again, it's only only the one observer here for Senju. So he doesn't see the move out. One Zealot is all we did need. And now the army may catch Senju off guard. What are we working with? We have four tanks. We have a good amount of libs and Vikings. Vikings are the most useful of units. We do collapse here on the first tank. It is barely going to go down. We pulled the boys. Oof. Probes are going to be falling. Probes are going to be falling here as we are leapfrogging forward. Again, ideally against this kind of army, Blink Stalkers would have been beautiful. Like if, if we had gotten Blink, I mean, Charge still has its place. I mean, both really is what we want. As the Liberators do slowly push forward here. Void Ray getting into the main base, looking to wreak havoc. And we dive on the army. We do dive on top of the tanks, but oh, this is a brutal dive here for the Immortals. They will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Marines, but they're going down here to the tanks. They're going down to the Libs as well. A very expensive loss there for Senju. Ay ay ay. Comes in now with the charges we needed them earlier. But the liberation, the freedom is here, and we have control of the natural. Freedom has arrived. Charge will say kill, they deal with the tanks. But the libs, they just go to town here at the natural base. Oh, here come the DTs. True. Do we have an orbital? Yes, we do. We do have an orbital. We have plenty of scan energy. We don't go for the scan, though. The Void Ray going ham. How many kills? Six kills on the Void Ray. Denying mining in the main. And it looks like these stalkers will be able to clean up these liberators eventually. As they do get out of liberation zones. Vikings are amassing. DTs are welding out. There is a missile turret. There's a turret in position. In the natural. Oof. But we can get on top of the tank. Yeah, the scan does nothing. The tank goes down. Oh, can we get the Cyclone? We can! Just barely the Invisible Man, it's popping off! They're popping off, they're annihilating the mineral line here. So many SCVs going down. We try to escape the turret, but again, the turret does give plenty of vision. Yeah, we can chase down those ETs. Oh, just barely. And Senju, what's important here, even though he, has, he lost control of the natural, he has a third. Fully operational. Fully up and running third base. He has Immortals that are being rebuilt. We have a decent gateway count as well. Uh, how many gateways? Four gateways. It's okay. Four gateways. It's okay. <laughs> we could do with more gateways to sustain our production. To sustain our economy, sorry. We do need a bit of a better production here available with more gates. And Blink would just make things so much easier when dealing with all these liberation zones. The, all these liberators. What I was meant to say. DTs they well in. Get into the natural. They take down the cyclone. They take down the ring. They force a land of those Vikings. Meanwhile, DTs they waddle into the main base as well. And the invisible man. We're, we're carrying a lot here in this game. We're doing so much to the economy of Fairlight. Cannot keep up. Goes for the scan. And he will kill one DT, but the other does survive. No, we miss! No, the second scan. Does miss the Dark Templar. So we're going to be able to avoid those Liberators, slip in towards the natural, or just pick up more CVs.
And even though we're missing some warping cycle cycles here back at home, it's okay. Like we're we're doing enough damage with these Dark Templar. We're keeping Fairlight down, warping in more DTs. As we can see that we're just banking up resources because they just don't have the production to, to spend money as we make it. But we still have a standing army here. That's all that matters right now. Not the highest stalker count, which is concerning. Um, only two stalkers against two libs. So again, the liberators are still going to be a pain to deal with. They are going to be a pain. As DTs, they waddle on in. They focus down the turrets. They focus down more workers. The SCVs, they're falling one after the other. Not like this. We're down to 11 workers here for Fairlight. Trying to big it all together. Trying to close it out. Scans the main base, but here at the natural, the Immortals are going ham and they're snowballing out of control. Senju, he has an army. That's more than I can say for Fairlight. Sure, there's a Liberator and there's only one Stalker. Ah, but it barely gets out of range. The Stalker, the one Stalker going ham. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> As we take down the natural, contain our opponents in one base, they're down to six workers. That's all they have left. Oh no! The stalker fell. So the liberators are going to be able to hold on to the natural. Um, they're going to be able to hold on. Fairlight with a third base, trying to get up and running. Fueled by a bit of copium here, Fairlight is, as he barely has the economy. But because of the libs, he's going to be able to hold. Again, our answer to that is going to be Void Rays. As we're waiting for the Void Ray to get across the map. And then we can bust into the main. Ooh, as we are running out of money in the main base as well. Again, what's important is that we, still on a, we are still on a two-base economy. We still have a better economy than that of Fairlight. Now we're just waiting for that anti-air. Getting back into our gases, taking another base. At this point, we can double expand. Like, we have so much freedom here. Oh, the Lib on Sieges! No shot, Liberator does on Siege. The Immortals, they bust in. No. Where did the Lib go? Uh, they're going across now to harass. They're killing probes, don't get me wrong. Liberators, they are getting damage done. But the Immortals, there's nothing to stop them. They can't be the production. Liberator racing back home, but it's too little too late. We're going for the last base. Oh, one of the last bases. CC goes down. Boys are being pulled. Senju, we've done it, back. We've done it. Uh, we force the main to live. Are we gonna? Are we gonna force Senju to hunt down the last CC? No shot. No, sure. I mean, we still have our two libs, so we're, we're playing, Fab. We're playing with the libs. We're doing what we can. <laughs> not cool. Uh, not cool, man. Uh, the ETs, sorry. <laughs> it was a one base all in. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Oh, uh, my poor. Oh, smoke. Not like this. I mean, to be fair, Fairlight had a big opportunity earlier. When it came to the one base all in, it was achieving a lot of damage. It was doing quite well. The transition was lackluster, is what I will say. Like, the execution of the one base all in was pretty good for Fairlight. But again, the follow up, the expand, the macro, that's where we did falter quite a bit for Fairlight. So we did falter. He was in a good position. At certain points in this game. Was in a good position. GG here and Senju, he will take the game. Will, again, slug his way through it. <laughs> Work his way through that game and will take it in the end. GG. GG. Let's go. Sometimes a reaper wall isn't important. Sounder, you're coping. <laughs>
Uh, este sounder, este sounder. GG, the GG well played. I appreciate it, Senju. Again, I don't think we've casted many of Senju's games before, so I do appreciate it here. Gracias, papi, gracias. Um, very well done. Again, really good to be able to keep a cool, calm, and collected head. I think that's what I should focus on more than anything, is the fact that despite being up against a one base all-in, despite losing so much early on, remember, you lost, control, you lost control of your natural, you bled out your army, you did lose your base as well, but you still had the wherewithal to, you know, Keep a cool, calm, collected head to get into a Stargate, get into Void Rays, get into your Colossus, and survive. Survive and bounce back. That's what's important. Regardless of how you did it, um, did do it nonetheless. GG. GG. Well played. Of course, the Dark Templar were a nice way to seal the deal. I'll be honest, even without DT Harass, I feel like you would have been in a good position regardless. Like, even in a normal, ma normal macro game setup, you found yourself in a really good position. So, GG. And with that... We find ourselves with one final game. One final redeemed replay here from Demi. Now, there is a bit of context. There's a little bit of context behind this. So, Demi competed in our tournament earlier in the Sparkling Tuna Cup. This was a couple of hours ago at this point. Uh, he did compete, and he played a game off stream. He played a game against Rostock in the tournament, and he got very excited, and he wanted to show me. <laughs> did want to show me what happened so i'm ready for it let's go it's gonna be a zvp this time a viewer replay redeemed by a gm by a pro player and i i know what i'm getting into i know that a clown fiesta is about to ensue let's go let's witness this together let us witness this together as we're getting into our final viewer replay the last one, Papi, the last one. And spawning in the bottom left hand corner of Hecate, we have our Ukrainian Protoss player, the red Protoss representing CSO Esports. It is Rostock. And spawning in the top right hand corner, we have his opponent, we have the Indian Zerg player, the blue Zerg representing Macharino Esports. It is Demi. And if you were here earlier for the Sparkling Tuna Cup, you would have seen Demi versus Geralt. You would have seen Demi versus Geralt in the quarterfinals, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, in the quarterfinals, you would have seen their series. And you would know that every game in that series, Demi proxy hatched. And we're seeing it here against Rostock as well. It is going to be a proxy hatch outside the natural base from Demi. A very aggressive build here. Trying to force a reaction and try to gain a big advantage early on. The hatchery has been thrown down and Rostock is unaware. He's in the dark. For the time being. Now, Probe Scout is going to be getting across the map. We do get eyes on... I mean, there shouldn't be a hatchery at this point anyway. We do dip into the main. We do confirm the droning. We get eyes on the gases. A little bit suspect. We see, we see the gas. We see the would-be spawning pool. Very aggressive build from what we're seeing Rostock confirming there is no natural base, and now alarm bells should be ringing. Something is wrong. Something is wrong here. He's going for a gate expand nonetheless. He's crazy. Now he confirms. He does check. He does see. He will not cancel the Nexus. Gate expand into Cybercore. Bold move here by, by Rostock. And upon seeing this, we should be getting a Zealot. Uh, Rostock, there we go. Zelda's being chronoed as we speak. We are working on it. Should be walling off as, full walling off as well. And Demi is not going for an all-in. He should be expanding behind this. Uh, should be, but there's no hatchery yet. Waiting for that spawning pool to finish. Waiting for the links to come out. Links are on the way. Queens as well. Zealot is going to be chipping away at this, this base, but we have to be very careful not to be surrounded. As we are Ling Flooding. Yeah, Demi, he's not expanding. Just straight up Ling Flooding across the map. Ay, ay, ay. Rostock. Uh, shield batteries on the way. The wall is not a wall. It's wide open, and Demi slips into the main base. Uh, I am getting concerned here for Rostock. Again, we don't even throw down the second pylon down here. Uh oh. Going for a Twilight Council, not going for the second gateway. This is so greedy. This is such a greedy response here from Rostock. Does wall off though. He does wall up. 
Heading towards, I imagine, Blink or Charge. Demi rushing into a lair already. Two base lair. The hell's going on? <laughs> Two base lair from Demi. Link speed still on the horizon. Rosso with a massive economic lead. He's ahead in the economy. Does have it up. As he's shading across the map. Bold move here by Russell. He's going to he's gonna to try to cripple the economy of Demi. Demi's expanding. He's droning. And up say shade into the main. Yeah, workers they have to be pulled away. Link speed kicks in. Link speed does kick in. We dive on top of those adapts. Oof. And they will barely escape, but they should be hunted down by the links. Yeah, there's no escaping here. Meanwhile, what was the layer for? Dropper Lords. We're dropping into the main. <laughs> Demi going to be sending his things across the map. Dropping into the main base. Behind this, he should be taking gases. And I'm feeling... I'm feeling some Miyamika here. I'm pretty sure that's what we're going to be seeing. What does that mean? Oh, you'll find out. <laughs> we do have a full wall off at the natural. But Lings, they bypass the wall. They get into the main. And they slip in. Rostock, he did see the fast lair. Uh, he saw the fast lair. He could have had an idea what was happening, but five probes go down. We go for the Artosis pylon. The pylon! Uh, not like this. It's gonna go down. Warpin finishes. One of them does. And we keep those, those gateways depowered. We got six probes in total. And creep has been spreading back from the proxy towards the main base this entire time towards the main bases of demi and what's what's annoying about this is that the creep denies a third it denies the third base from being taken rostock cannot expand without detection and observers on the way observers on the way it's gonna be two base hydra <laughs> what else do we do with the lair we take gases we throw down the hydra den this is the miyamika that i spoke about so two base hydra from demi and he's up against glaive at eps Laves on the way from Rostock. Interesting. It's going to be an interesting dynamic. So, Glavideps can actually trade well against Ling Hydra in high enough numbers. That's the thing, though. They have to be in those high numbers. So, can we amass Adepts? As we're going to be focusing on clearing up all this creep. We're on the hatchery. We come across some active tumors so we can finally expand... How many gateways are we on? We're on four gateways, so this is not a two-base all-in, but these gateways are depowered. I mean, technically, we're on six. Six is pretty committed. Six is pretty committed here from Rostock. Oh, boy. That's going to be a lot of adepts. That's going to be a lot of adepts from Rostock. Third base is on the way. And how much Ling Hydra is Demi going to have? Hydras are important as they are the backbone of the army, but Lings, they need to be there to help support, to help buffer, to help surround and lock down the Adepts. Because Demi is supply blocked. We are waiting for those Overlords to pop out. Dark Shrine on the way. Rosso going to be pushing, going to be committing. Good move so far. He is spotted by the Changeling. Demi sees, he knows, he's getting in position. Does what the army. Demi still on a low Hydra count. Six more Hydras on the way. We're doubling the Hydra count. As we do push in. Don't quite commit to the shade. Rostock has to be very comfortable to be surrounded. Things they, they pounce. Demi pounces on the army. Gets us around. Locks down the Adepts. And the Hydras are going ham. Yeah, they focus down every single Adept. Or as many as they can. Six of them do make it in. Six steps, they barely make it into the main base. They will get a queen. They get the queen, they get a couple of drones. They even cancel the shade. I say barely do make it out. Behind this Rostock, he's going for the Dark Shrine. He's going for a robotic spade for Colossus production. Here we 
you go. Right, damn it, he does get across the map with his Ling Hydra. Our uh, Lings are being annihilated and we have too many depths. This is what we spoke about. If the Ling count is not high enough, these Hydras, they are so vulnerable to adapt. They cannot fight head on. Expensive losses there by Demi. He has to pull back. Yeah, as you can see, he does have to retreat. So, pretty good moment for Rostock. Very good fight for him, at least most recently. Demi still in a low drone count on 36 drones. Barely an economy. Now going into Lurkers? Oh my, he's crazy. Demi, what's going on? <laughs> He's lost his mind. Two base lurker. That is a new one. That is not something that Miyamika does. Demi adding his own twist. Meanwhile, Colossus production underway to shut down the Ling Hydra. Again, Glaive Adept plus Colossus. Pretty good composition against what Demi has. And how many Adepts? 21. 21 Adepts here. Almost one to one with how many Lings there are. Do threaten a shade towards the natural. Hatchery going to be going down. So close to do recall. The prism goes down. Ooh, big pick off. Prism does fall. Demi still down on 37 workers. He's completely all in. He's flooding lings and he's gonna morph as many of these hydras as he can into lurkers. And there it is. As many as we can, which is three. Three lurkers on the way. Let's go. Rocks being knocked down. Just so reinforcements are getting across the map that much faster. And can we get on top of that Colossus? Again, if it was only Ling Hydra, I would favor Rostock. But now with Lurkers in the mix, it's a little bit more up in the air. It is more up in the air. As Demi, he does push in between the bases. Never goes off. Big connection. Big connection on the army. Observer is coming back home. It's not with the army. Lurkers are going ham. And the Lings, they flood in. The wall is not a wall. Lings, they get into the, into the natural. Good Nova. Good connection on the Lings. I just doing what they can. Just baiting the army into spines. Into those Lurker shots. There we go. Oh, killing another Lurker. But 20 probes have gone down. The Lings, they just annihilate the natural. They head into the main base as well. Demi snowballing out of control. Just cutting Rostock off from his own bases. Getting 29 probe kills. We're getting killed in the cyber core as well. And Demi, he may have just pulled it off. I mean, he's still up against the Colossus, so it's not going to be easy. Big connection here on the Lurkers. Both of them go down. We can see Demi trying to force the issue. Trying to push in. Oh god, the Hydras, they're melting though. They're breaking through. The Colossus swipes. They're doing well for themselves. But is it too much? Nova! The splits! Decent connection on the Hydras. We're down to three Hydras left. We snipe the Observer. Big moment there. The Observer gets sniped. No detection. Another Observer is on the way. It's on the way, Poppy. It's on the way. And with that, we're going to be able to shut these Lurkers down one after the other. But Rostock, he lost every probe in the main base in the natural earlier. He went down to 29 probes. He's rebuilding. He's remaxing. He's trying to get his saturation back up and running. He's got a fourth base. He's on four Nexus. But he's down in Workers. But Rostock, he does survive. Demi across the map. Rushing into more Lurkers. Uh, he's not droning. He's still not droning, by the way. Just main arting his, his third Massing more lings. Ay, ay, ay. And can we break this? I mean, the problem for Rostock is that he's stuck just rebuilding workers. Like, that's all his money is invested into rebuilding workers right now. So his army hasn't gotten larger. It stayed the same. Still two disruptors, still one colossus. Meanwhile, Demi, his army supply is getting further and further ahead. It is getting further and further ahead here, and I mean, again, you can see it in the supplies. You can see it in the production. Like Rostock, he hasn't made a single unit like since the since the defense. And it looks like we pounce on top of the fourth base. Sorry, on top of the third. 
That's going to be a kill on the Nexus. Oh no, never mind. The army comes in. Where's the detection? Oh no. Where is the detection? Nervous go off. They get one lurker. That could have been three. The observer is not here. There's no detection whatsoever. The lurkers, they go ham. We get a kill on the Nexus. And those two lurkers are the MVPs. GG gets called. And Demi, he somehow pulls it off. Refusing to drone the 37, the 37 drone all in the entire game. GG. Demi takes it. Oh my god. <laughs> and now I know what Demi meant. So, fun fact, uh, Demi, he messaged me uh, during the tournament after, uh, after his match. He said, Papi, I've been filthy. He's like, what? He's like, I didn't deserve to win. <laughs> no observer, no detection. Demi... He was down in bases, down in workers, down in so many aspects there. But the power of the Lunker, the power of the invisible unit there, getting so much free damage on so, in so many of those fights. And again, towards the end, it's just no detection available. There could have been potential Novas, but again, we saw that Rostock, he was just hyper fixated on resaturating less on building up his army. I'm sure he assumed that Demi was Macaring, but he wasn't. He was not mackering. He was just still completely all in. And with that, GG. Congratulations. Congratulations here to Demi. As he did end up taking the series against Rostock. Oh. Did end up taking it. And with that... Well played. Well played, everyone. Well played. And a big shout out to all the people, all the viewers in the chat, all the lovely people out there that did redeem some replay casts. It was uh, Senju, Kronos, Demi, Frost, and Soundo. Thank you so much. It did mean that this broadcast was over six hours, and I do have to go and eat. <laughs> I had breakfast, casted, and now it's time for dinner, Bobby. Now it's time for dinner here. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was over a six-hour broadcast, which I was kind of prepared for. Um, thank you so much everyone for watching. Thank you so much everyone for tuning in. I am starving. It is time to go and get some goddamn food inside us. Let's go, Bobby. Let's go. <laughs> but I hope you all enjoy yourselves. Again, this is something that we do every now and then. Like, basically, every couple of weeks, we accumulate replays. We accumulate viewer replays, and we're able to, uh, we're able to embrace them whenever possible. When uh, basically, like, yeah, every couple of weeks, we just consolidate them, we accumulate them, and then bam, we have a big viewer replay cast. So, yeah, if you enjoyed this, we'll be back for the next one. We'll be back for the next one, most likely in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks, maybe a month. It'll be amazing. It will be beautiful. So, but yeah, do look forward to it. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for the support. We're going to be heading off for the night. And we'll be back tomorrow. Let me just quickly double check the calendar. I believe we're back tomorrow with a full day of casting with ESL Open Cup. Oh, with ESL Open Cup Asia into ESL Open Cup Europe. So we have a full day of casting tomorrow. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Full day of ESL Open Cups. Um, so yeah, we'll see you then. We will see you then. Enjoy yourselves. Take care. It's going to be in how many hours time? Let's quickly check TL. We're going to be back in 17 hours, I believe. 17 hours time is going to be ESL Makeup Asia. So less than 24 hours. In 17 hours, we'll see you here on the Cranky Duck Things. Be there. Be there, Bobby. <laughs> Otherwise, enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your week. Enjoy your lovely days. Until then, hasta luego. Ciao, papi, ciao. Hasta luego. I hope you all enjoyed the broadcast. Follow us Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Discord, uh, Patreon in the chat, uh, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> See you next time. Bye.